Good morning, Gophers. Welcome to GopherCon 2021. I am here in the amazing Microsoft Learn TV studios with my co-hosts, Aaron Schlesinger Hello. and Johnny Borsico. We will try to keep the dad jokes to a minimum, but we can't make any promises. No promises. <laughs> We can pretty much promise that there will be <laughs> a, a lot of yeah. corny jokes. Uh, we wish we could have been in person. We tried to make it happen. Unfortunately, things didn't work out. We upgraded from my office and we gained some more co-hosts. So that's pretty a positive. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah. Uh, first off, thanks to all of our sponsors. Yeah, um, just want to shout out a couple of them. Uh, I want to thank Microsoft. Um, Capital One and Salesforce, uh, they were instrumental in helping support us uh, getting the show online on really short notice. Uh, so do make sure to visit uh, the virtual meeting spaces. You can see them on the agenda uh, on gophercon.com. They do require you to sign up, so make sure to do that. Uh, and there's also a link to our Discord. So do make sure to go chat with our sponsors in their channels on Discord as well. Yeah, and the, the VMS is the virtual meeting spaces. Some of, the, some of them are doing uh, fun little trivia games. Some of them are doing uh, open office hours to talk to them about the things that they're working on. Yeah. Um, Great so technical content in there, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. there's some, some technical sessions. Indeed. So listen, we are streaming on multiple platforms, but that also means that there's a chat and conversation and engagement going on on all of these platforms. We would like to centralize that, however, on Discord. So if you want to uh, perhaps uh, heckle the MCs, uh, especially Aaron for not getting the memo about the attire color yeah. and all that yeah. stuff, that um, uh, that's, the place, that's the place to do that. <laughs> um, uh, the speakers uh, and, and sponsors, obviously, are going to be uh, hanging out in there. So every time you see a talk, um, you want to engage them on Discord, that's the place to do it. You want to chat about the topic, whatever, whatever uh, suits you, jump in there and, uh, and uh, get in touch with people, make new friends, uh, and this is, uh, this is what it, it's about, us all about when we're doing these things virtually. So the, we also have a, a return to Gopher Town. Um, the, that's something I didn't engage in last year, and it's, it's really, really wicked. So you, you, you have this little avatar, you walk around, and you bump into other people, and all of a sudden a, a video stream of them pops up. And it's, it's the weirdest thing in the world yeah, to really me. Cool. You can like <laughs> sit down at a table and play chess with somebody. Yeah, it's, like, it's like, yeah. like great innovation. Um, um, I'm, I'm sure they use Go uh, for some of the back-end systems. If not, they really should be. Yeah, um, if they don't, uh, if they don't, need yeah, to, we're gonna have so we got emails. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna have words. Yeah, there will be there will be exchanges. Um, but links to all of these uh, uh, um, places um, are available on the GopherCon.com homepage. So you know, there's a section for all the things you should know as a Gopher attending GopherCon uh, virtually this year. You'll get the links um, to all of these places uh, all in one place. So. A special thanks to the speakers. All the speakers you're going to see uh, today, those, um, uh, the majority of them are live in the studio with us, and, and we thank them for, for making the trip, for, for coming out here and, and, and being part of this uh, amazing journey of ours. Um, and uh, we also have some pre-recorded ones as well uh, for those who couldn't, uh, couldn't make it on site. But we, we do appreciate our speakers. They are, they are a huge part of our community. And uh, the, every time they make the effort to, to come up with content, um, sort of endure all the anxiety and stress that, that sort of uh, predates uh, you know, having to basically face, face all of you and deliver that content, um, we, we do appreciate them for that. And we give them a big shout out. Huge shout out. Yeah. And there is a there's a special channel on Discord, right? There's a peanut gallery. Oh uh, yes, is that yeah, that's so the peanut gallery. Yeah. La last year on Discord, we created a channel called Peanut Gallery. That is where you can go to heckle all of us. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes, we'll be looking at it while we're here, and we'll interact with you. And sometimes when we're outside the studio, so if you want to heckle the MCs, you can do that. We'll invite the speakers to come heckle us from behind the camera too. Mm -hmm. So. Especially me, uh, tell us what you think about the color scheme over here versus the, the lighter <laughs> colors over there. Feel free. Yeah. I'm pretty confident in my choice. Yeah. yeah, so we also have some additional contributed content from outside. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we've got Mark Bates, uh, who put together the lightning talks this year. We've got a really, really great year of uh, lightning talks that are going to be coming up. Is it later today, I believe? Uh, I think so. Yes, I, yeah. I've got to look at the schedule. Yeah, I, I think it is. Um, 
We'll look. We'll, we'll yeah. confirm. But yeah. yeah, Mark does a fantastic job every year of putting together lightning talks. If you've not spoken uh, publicly before, it's also a really great opportunity to try that out. They're short, you know, uh, most places will do five to seven minutes mm -hmm. um, to talk about a hobby, a personal project, or thing you're doing at work. So it's a nice way to kind of dip your toes into public speaking if you haven't done that before. Highly encouraged. Definitely. Unfortunately, we're filled up for this year, but. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's always next year, of course, too. Uh, if you are, even if you are experienced with uh, public speaking, it's a great way to try out a new idea or you know test out the waters, so to speak, uh, for your new idea. So that's that's great too. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Go Time. So the Go Time team is back this year. Uh, the Go Time podcast is back this year. Uh, they're going to be contributing some content as well. Uh, one of the coolest things I'm excited about from Go from Go Time is a Family Feud style game. Uh, this is where uh, is it members of the Go team kind of uh, essentially compete, they survey right? they'll, they'll survey um, a broad audience. In yeah. this case, it's you, the Go community, about a bunch of questions. You'll provide answers, and then they have to guess what the popular answer was, <laughs> correct or not correct. It's great fun. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. We so, did we did an episode of that uh, actually, um, um, very much like like this one. Yeah, um, it was quite humorous because yeah, all of us are dying. Like, how, yeah. why is that like, the most popular? <laughs> we're like, I mean, we're, obviously, you know, we're, we're, we've we've been doing go for a while, like, and, and, and we can tell the answers from from those who are still sort of learning. Going like, well, that's not a keyword, so we're being very very specific about what's the, what what. Then and you can like, also see who's trolling. Too. You can see exactly. You know, my favorite language is COBOL. I'm like, what really? <laughs> And so um, in order to make this game more fun, we encourage you to actually go complete the survey. The more people who answer the questions, the more entertaining this is going to be. You choose your own adventure, whether you want to troll with the answers, whether you want to give technically correct answers. Uh, you can do that at gotime.fm slash gs, for short for go for say, which is what they're calling the game. Mm -hmm. So we encourage all of you to go participate in that survey. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that is going to be great fun. I think, you know, we've got, what, almost 4,000 people watching the live stream? We have so. over 5,000 people who have wow. subscribed. I got And so we are, mm. we've probably acquired more people on YouTube yeah. organically as well. Yeah, yeah you got, you got to update yeah. your number just like a shirt. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> very true. Fair <laughs> enough, yeah. Peanut, peanut gallery, let me have it. Let's see. Let's hear it. Yeah. <laughs> Now we're going to have to buy you a matching shirt for That's tomorrow. Right, right, yeah, yeah, you'll, you'll see me tomorrow with a tie-dye <laughs> or something. Yeah. <laughs> The apparently Learn TV, they, they, didn't, they didn't hand us uh, a wardrobe crew or makeup <laughs> crew. <laughs> yeah, right. We just, we just showed up with what we had. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I mean, so we've got a lot of exciting content planned over the next three days. I know some of this starts early for some of you, so we, we really appreciate you joining us early. Um, there will be a rebroadcast later today uh, where you'll be able to see everything, including the MC sessions kind of replayed. So if you need to step away, we kind of recognize that. In addition to that, all of the, the uh, primary content, I should say, the VMS content isn't recorded, but all of the primary content is recorded, it'll end up on our YouTube channel with everything else um, over the next couple of days. So uh, don't feel bad if you have to miss anything. Yeah. You'll just miss our lovely faces. Yep, our lovely faces. And, and our Brady ba yep. <laughs> and our dad jokes too, yeah. And the dad jokes. Um, OK, so yeah, so um, coming up next. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're really excited for all the great sessions here that are coming up. Um, we have a very generic talk coming up, I would say. What mm. would you say? It, I'm, I mean, technically, it's a talk about generics. Yeah. Not yeah. from generic people, though. No. Because these are, yeah. Certainly not. not yeah. <laughs> yeah. So who do we have coming up? So yeah, so coming up next, uh, we have two members of the GO team. We have Robert Griesmer and Ian Lance Taylor, who are going to be talking to us about generics, which I know all of you are excited about. There's been a lot of momentum yeah. there. So they're here to give us an update, and I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, me too. So uh, take it away, Robert and Ian. Thanks very much for the introduction. Uh, hello, everybody. Good morning. Um, we had a really hard time with the title this time. Uh, we had to change it a couple of times, but we stuck with generics. We've all been waiting for this moment uh, for some time now. Uh, with excitement or perhaps with trepidation. Uh, but that moment has come. 
Generics will officially be part of the language starting with Go 118, released for schedule sometime next February. Um, we have talked about generics that passed Go for cons. Uh, last year we presented a detailed design. We had a working prototype implementation. Um, we had finalized the syntax. We had figured out how to rep uh, represent constraints as interfaces. And um, we had a working type inference. <clears throat> but there were a few things that we were not entirely happy with. In the meantime, I think we have figured out these last issues. Uh, I'm personally very happy with where we arrived. Uh, we have a design that is pretty clean. It is 100% backward compatible with existing programs. And it has some room to grow. And most importantly, there is uh, still a feel of this is Go. So what exactly is new? If you look at the uh, step, back, step back a little bit and look from a 30,000 uh, feet point of view, there's really just three things. And those three things are uh, obviously type parameters for functions and types. These are the visible signs of genericity. And then there's a new different view of interfaces. Uh, they are now not just able to define sets of methods, but also sets of types. And finally, uh, type inference, which hopefully should smoothen out the, the generic code a little bit and make it a little bit more lightweight. I'm going to cover briefly each of these topics to give you kind of a flavor of the things to come. So let's start with type parameters. A type parameter gives you the ability to parameterize a function or a type with types. Uh, a type parameter list looks very much like an ordinary parameter list. Uh, except that we use square brackets instead of parentheses. I'm going to show you a couple of examples to, uh, tell you, to show you how this works out in practice. So this is your generic min function uh, that we've, you've seen probably many times, probably written a gazillion of times, and hopefully we don't have to write it anymore in the future. Uh, we can make this function generic by replacing our float64 type with a type parameter, in this case t. And uh, because we have a new uh, type t here, we also have to declare it. And that happens in this type parameter list, uh, which is marked here in red. When we want to use this min function for int arguments, we have to call it, of course, with our int arguments. But we also have to provide the respective type, uh, which is int in this case. Providing this type argument to the function is called instantiation. That's a fairly important uh, part in generic programming. Instantiation happens in two steps. First, all the provided type arguments are substituted for the respective type parameters. And then in a second step, after substitution has happened, the compiler checks that each type argument implements its respective constraint. And what that exactly means, I'll go uh, into it a little bit later. But uh, if instantiation fails, or I should say if, if that uh, second step fails, then instantiation fails. And in this case, your program is not going to be valid. So going back to our original example, we can instantiate this generic min function just by itself without actually calling it uh, like, like this. We provide a float64 type argument to min. And then we get a non-generic min function, which is essentially our original mean function. And we can then call it like any ordinary function. And just how to, uh, to see how this looks for types, because we can parameterize uh, types, of course, as well. Here's an example of a generic binary tree. And uh, here the, the data type is generic. Uh, we use the type parameter t again. And we can now create an instance of a string tree, for instance, by instantiating this generic tree with the string type. We can also have methods on generic types. I'm not going to go into details here. So let's talk a little bit about the kind of types that a type parameter can be instantiated with. Let's talk about typesets. So an ordinary parameter list has a type for each parameter. So in this case, we have the type is float64. And this type actually tells us what kind of values are valid as arguments for x and y. Um, so 
this float64 type is a set of values. Now in type parameter lists, each type parameter also has a type. And this type is kind of a meta type, and it tells us what kind of types are valid for this type parameter. So this, this meta type actually defines sets of types, and we call this a type constraint. Now in our generic mean function, uh, the type constraint is imported from the constraints package. This is a new package in our standard library. And here the ordered constraint describes the set of all types with values uh, that can be ordered in some, in some ways. And in, in our case, they can be compared with the less than operator. And the constraint ensures that only types with orderable values can be passed as arguments to this type parameter. And it also tells the min function that within its body, uh, operators of types that are of this type parameter T can be, sorry, operands of that type parameter T can be used with the less than operator. In Go, constraints must be interfaces. Uh, interfaces define methods, and so uh, it's obvious that we will be able to define type constraints that require certain methods to be present. But constraints ordered is an interface too, and the less than operator is not a method. So how does that work? So until recently, in the Go spec, an interface defined a set of methods. If we have an interface with methods A, B, C, um, then we say that the interface defined has a method set with the, set, with the methods A, B, and C, and every type that implements those methods actually implements that interface. Uh, but there's a different view. We could look at um, the set of types that implement those methods and then say that the interface actually defines that set of type. Now each type that is an element of this type set implements that interface. And it's pretty obvious that these two views are essentially identical. I mean, for each set of methods, we can imagine this uh, typically infinite set of types. And now we're just saying the interface defines that infinite set of types. And uh, if we want to check if a type implements the interface, we just check whether that type is an element of that set of types. <laughs> but this view uh, as a typeset has some advantages because we can now control it in new and, and different ways. For instance, we can add types explicitly to the set. And in order to make this happen, we have extended uh, the syntax for interfaces exactly uh, to, to be able to add additional types. Uh, for instance, here we have an example of an interface with three types, int, string, and bool. And this interface defines the set of exactly those three types. Or another way of saying this is that these three types implement this interface. Now, if we're going to go back to our uh, previous example, remember the constraints.ordered interface? This is the declaration of that uh, interface. Here, this declaration states that ordered is the set of all integer, floating point, and string types. The vertical bar expresses a union of these types, or in this case, type sets. And uh, integer and float are interfaces that define type sets themselves that are similarly defined in the same package. Note that there are no methods on this interface. Usually, we do not care about a specific type. Like, we don't want to have a set that just contains the int or string type. We care usually about all the string types and all the int types. And that is what this new token tilde is for. Um, tilde string, in this case, denotes the set of types that consists of all types whose underlying type is string, or you know, all string types. So of course, with uh, Go118, we'll still want to be able to specify methods. And so we'll still be able to do that, of course, in interfaces, and we can embed uh, other interfaces as usual, but we will also be able to embed arbitrary types and unions of this form and tilde type elements. 
Now used as a constraint, the typeset defined by a constraint interface defines exactly the type arguments that are permissible as arguments for the respective type parameter. And within a generic function, for operands of type parameter type, only the operations that are permitted for all the types in the respective typeset uh, are operated on those are permitted on those operands. Interfaces used as constraints may be given names such as constraints.ordered, or they may be used directly in line inside the type parameter list. For instance, here we have a, a type parameter list that declares two type parameters S and E, which might be written like this. So here S is uh, defining is, is a, a type parameter that requires a slice type, an arbitrary slice type whose element type is not further constrained. This is a fairly common scenario. And because it is so common, we've introduced some syntactic sugar that allows us to leave away, or actually we've removed some syntactic sugar, I should say, uh, that allows us to leave away the interface curly, um, curly braces around it. And we can just write the second line um, as I've shown here. And finally, because the empty interface appears quite often in type parameter lists, and for, for that matter in Go code, we introduced a new pre-declared identifier, any, that is an alias for the empty interface. And so this, uh, any identifier can be used anywhere instead of the empty interface. <laughs> Interfaces uh, that define typesets are a powerful new construct, uh, and they really make constraints work in Go. But for now, such interfaces may only be used inside type parameter lists in constraint position. Uh, but it's not hard to see how such interfaces might be useful in general for arbitrary variables, and maybe that is something uh, that we will do in the future, and I think there is an issue for that. So finally, the last but not least new mechanism, uh, it's type inference. I'm only going to touch very briefly on this. Going back to our original example, with uh, type parameters comes the need to pass type arguments, which can make for rather verbose code. And frequently, though frequently these type arguments, they can actually be deduced from the uh, from the ordinary uh, parameters that are arguments that are passed uh, in a function call. So here we uh, have our generic mean function again. We pass two arguments A and P of type float 64. And by comparing those types against the parameter types, here there's only one, T. So by comparing T against float 64, we can infer that the type for T actually must be float 64. This is what the compiler does, and if it can do that successfully, then we can simply leave away the type argument, which leads to a function call for min that looks like any ordinary function call, uh, no type parameters or anything. Now, the exact details of type inference are pretty complicated, but using it is not. Type inference either succeeds or it fails. If it succeeds, type parameters can be left away, and all is good. The generic function call looks like any ordinary function call. If it fails, then the compiler will complain, and we simply provide those type arguments. Now, we have tried to strike a balance between the complexity and in inference power for type inference, and we probably haven't gotten it quite right. And so there's some room to fine tune and refine over time. The effect will be that more programs won't need type arguments. But the important point is that programs that don't need type arguments today, they won't need type arguments tomorrow. That's really it. Three major new things in Go, type parameters for functions and types, a more powerful form of um, interface types to express constraints, and type inference to smoothen out programming generic code. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand it over now to Ian Lance Taylor, who will go a little bit more in detail with type inference and how to use uh, generics in Go. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Robert. Thanks for that 
great uh, description of generics as they're going to come into GO-118. So I'm going to start by describing a particular kind of type inference, which we call constraint type inference. So I'm going to start with an example. Suppose we want to scale a slice of integers, returning a new slice in which each element has been multiplied by some value. We don't care what the exact type of integers uh, are in the slice, so it's easy to write a generic function for this, similar to the ones that Robert showed earlier. But there is a problem with this particular definition, which I will explain as we go along. Now, continuing the example, suppose we have a multidimensional point type, where each point is simply a list of integers, giving the coordinates of the point. Naturally, our type has methods. For the purposes of this example, the details aren't really important. Sometimes we want to scale a point. Since a point is just a slice of integers, we can just use the scale function that we wrote earlier. Unfortunately, this doesn't work. We get a compilation error, which you can see on the screen here. What went wrong? The problem is that the scale function returns a value of type slice of e, where e is the element type of the argument slice. When we call scale with a value of type point, whose underlying type is slice of int 32, we get back a value of type slice of int 32, not a value of type point. And of course, value of type slice int 32 does not have any methods. So this all follows from the way that generics work, but for an example like this, it's not what we want. In order to fix this, we have to change the scale function. The changes are highlighted in red here. We've introduced a new type parameter, s, that's the type of the argument. We've constrained that type parameter s so that the underlying type of its argument must be a slice of some element type e. So the first argument to the function, the first regular argument, is now type s rather than slice of e, and the result type is also now slice of s, is now just plain s. Since e is constrained to be an integer, the effect is the same as before. The first argument has to be a slice of some integer type. The only change to the body of the function is that now we pass s rather than slice of e when we call the make function. This new function acts the same as before if we call it with a plain slice. But if we call it with the type point, we now get back a value of type point, and that's exactly what we want. But it's fair to ask, and here we're going to get into the inference part of the talk, why is it okay to write the call to scale without passing explicit type arguments, as shown in the comment there? The new scale function has two type parameters, s and e. In a call to scale that, where we don't specify any type arguments, function argument type inference that Robert described lets the compiler infer that the type argument for s is point, as Robert, you know, showed us. But the function also has a type parameter e, and we need to have a type argument for that type parameter. The process by which the compiler can infer that the type argument for e is the element type of the slice is what we call constraint type inference. The exact definition of constraint type inference can be found in the language spec, or rather it can soon be found there. It's not quite ready yet, but soon. There is a description in the generics proposal, which you can find in the link at the top of the slide. Those are the complete formal definitions, though. Today I'm going to describe it somewhat less formally, in a way that I hope is easy to understand. Constraint type inference deduces type arguments from type parameter constraints, hence the name. It's used when one type parameter has a constraint defined in terms of another type parameter. When the type argument of one of those type parameters is known, the constraint is used to infer the type argument of the other one. The simplest and by far the most common case of constraint type inference uses a constraint of the form tilde type for some type, in where the, that type is written using other type parameters. We can see this in the scale example. S, the type parameter S, has the form tilde followed by a type written in terms of other type parameters, in this case, the type parameter E. Since S is written in terms of E, if we know the type argument for S, we can infer the type argument for E. S must be a slice type, and E is the element type of that slice. So let's put it all together. In the call to scale, P is a point whose underlying type is slice in 32. Function argument type inference uses the argument lowercase s to infer that the type argument for uppercase s is point. That matches the tilde slice e. Remember that tilde slice e means that the uh, type argument can be anything whose underlying type is a slice of some element type. In this example, the untyped constant 2 doesn't tell us anything using function argument type inference. 
So the compiler then applies constraint type inference. Since S we know is point, and point's underlying type is slice of in 32, E is inferred to be in 32. The compiler does have to then verify that in 32 satisfies E's constraint, which it does, since in 32 is an integer type. Now, all the type arguments have been successfully inferred, so the function can be instantiated and called with no explicit type arguments required at the call site. That was just an introduction to constraint type inference and why and how you may want to use it. As I said before, for full details, see the generic proposal or the soon to come updates to the language spec. For the final part of our joint talk, I'm not going to discuss what generics are or how to use them, but rather when to use generics and when not to use them. To be clear, this portion of the talk will provide general guidelines, not hard and fast rules. Use your own judgment. But if you aren't sure, I suggest that you use the, guideline, the guidelines I'm going to discuss now. Let's start with a general guideline for programming in Go. Write Go programs by writing code, not by defining types. When it comes to generics, if you start writing your program by defining new type parameter constraints, you're probably on the wrong path. Start by writing functions. It's easy to add type parameters later when it's clear that they'll be useful. That said, let's look at cases where they are useful. One case where type parameters can be useful is when writing functions that operate on the special types that are defined by the language, slices, maps, channels. If a function has parameters with those types and the function code doesn't make any particular assumptions about the element types, then it may be useful to use a type parameter. For example, a function that returns a slice of all the keys in a map of any type, any map type. The code wouldn't assume anything about the map key type. That makes it a good candidate for using type parameters. The alternative to using type parameters for this kind of function is typically to use reflection, but that's a more awkward programming model. It's not statically type checked, and it's often slower as well. Another case where type parameters can be useful is for general purpose data structures. By a general purpose data structure, I mean a data structure like a slice or a map, but one that's not already built into the language. For example, a linked list or a binary tree. Today, programs that need such data structures write them with a specific element type or else they use an interface type. Replacing a specific element type with a type parameter can produce a more general data structure that can be used in other parts of the program or perhaps by other programs. Replacing an interface type with a type parameter can often permit the data to be stored more efficiently. In some cases, using a type parameter instead of an interface type can mean code can avoid type assertions and can instead be fully type checked at compile time. For example, here's what a binary tree data structure might look like using type parameters. Each leaf node in the tree contains a value of the type parameter t. When the tree is instantiated with a particular type argument, values of that type argument will be stored directly in the leaf nodes. They will not be stored as interface types. Here we can see a method on the generic binary tree. Don't worry about the details or the formatting I used to fit the code onto the slide. The point is that this is a reasonable use of type parameters because the tree data structure and even the code in this method is largely independent of the element type t. The data structure does need to know how to compare values of the element type t and in this method it uses a passed in comparison function to do that. You can see that on the fourth line in the call to bt.comp. Other than that, type parameter doesn't really matter at all. That binary tree example illustrates another general guideline. When you need something like a comparison function, prefer to use a function rather than a method. We could have defined the tree type such that the element type is required to have a compare or a less method. This would be done by writing a constraint that requires a compare or less method. You know, using the kind of constraint as interface writing that Robert described earlier. And it would mean that any type argument used to instantiate the tree would need to have that method. But that would mean that anybody who wants to use tree with a simple data type, like int, would have to define their own int type and write their own compare method. If we define tree to take a function, as we did in the example code we just saw, then it's easy to pass the desired comparison function. And if the element type happens to already have a compare method, we can simply pass a method expression like element type dot compare as the comparison function. To put it another way, it's much simpler to turn a method into a function 
than it is to add a method to a type. So for general purpose data types, prefer a function rather than writing a constraint that requires a method. Another case where type parameters can be useful is when different types need to implement some common method and the implementation for the different types all looks the same. For example, consider the standard library's sort.interface. It requires that a type implement three methods, len, swap, and less. This example shows slicefun, a generic type that implements sort.interface for any slice type. For any slice type, the len and swap methods are exactly the same. The less method requires a comparison, which is the fun part of the name slicefun. As with the earlier tree example, we will pass in a function when we create a slicefun. And this code shows how slicefun is used to sort any slice using a comparison function. Here we use type parameters to implement the sort.interface methods for any slice type. Using type parameters is appropriate for this kind of example because the methods look exactly the same for all slice types. At this point I should mention that Go 119, not 118, but 119 will probably have a generic function to sort a slice using a comparison function. And that generic function will probably not be implemented using sort.interface. But the general point is still true, even if this specific example will most likely not be useful in the future. It's reasonable to use type parameters when you need to implement methods that look the same for all the relevant types. Now let's talk about the other side of the equation. When should we not use generics? When are type parameters not a good idea? Well, Go has interface types. Interface types permit a kind of generic programming. For example, the widely used io.reader interface provides a general mechanism for reading data from any value that contains information, such as a file, or that produces information, such as a random number generator. If all you need to do with the value of some type is call a method on that value, use an interface type, not a type parameter. io.reader is easy to read, it's efficient, it's effective. There's no need to use a type parameter to read data from a value by calling the read method. For example, some people might be tempted to change the first function, first function signature here that just uses an interface type into the second version that uses a type parameter. Don't do this. Omitting the type parameter makes the function easier to write, easier to read, and it turns out the execution time will most likely be exactly the same for both versions. Going back to the choice between type parameters and interface types, when there is a common method that is used by different types, consider how that method is implemented. Earlier we said, that if the implementation of the method is the same for all types, go ahead and use a type parameter. Inversely, if the implementation is different for each type, use different methods. Don't use a type parameter. For example, the implementation of read from a file is nothing like the implementation of read from a random number generator. That means that we write two different read methods, and neither method should use a type parameter. Although I haven't talked about it too much today, Go also has reflection. Reflection permits a kind of generic programming, in that it permits you to write code that works with any type. If some operation has to support even types that don't have methods, so that you can't use an interface type, and if the operation is different for each type, so type parameters aren't that helpful, use reflection. An example of this is the encoding JSON package in the standard library. We don't want to require every type that we encode to support a Marshall JSON method, so we can't use interface types. But encoding an integer type is really nothing like encoding a struct type, so we shouldn't use type parameters. Instead, the package uses a reflection. The code's too complicated to show here today, but take a look at the package if you're interested. In closing, this discussion of when to use generics can be reduced to one simple guideline. If you find yourself writing the exact same code multiple times, where the only difference between the copies is that the code uses different types, consider whether you can use a type parameter. Another way to say this is that you should avoid type parameters until you notice you're about to write the exact same code multiple times. Thanks for listening. I hope you've learned something today. I hope you'll all be able to use generics in Go. I hope you will all use generics in Go when the 118 release comes out. I hope you use them wisely and well. Thanks. And now, we'll hand it back to Eric, Johnny, and Aaron. Keep the excitement going here at GopherCon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert and Ian. I can't tell you how excited I am for, uh, what, next February? 
Um, uh, yeah, this is going to be, uh, I'm going to cuddle up to some generics, you know, um, during uh, the winter, you know, snow falling <laughs> um, by sitting by the fire, getting to, uh, you know, you know how to use the type constraints and things. Um, yeah, this is, this is exciting stuff. And, and I'll I, be abusing them. <laughs> <laughs> finally, uh, to use them yes, as, yeah, all of us, we shall all, all be abusing generics in the beginning as we tend to do. Yeah. But uh, uh, yeah, I mean, did you, did you find anything particularly interesting that you didn't already know was coming, Aaron? I, uh, the, the tilde operator, I, I had read yep, about it yep. and fully grasped it, I yep, think. Yep, you know? yep, yeah, indeed, indeed. And, and, uh, and I really appreciate the uh, guidance um, towards the end there that uh, Ian gave this year of when to uh, use generics, or uh, rather when you should consider using them, and really other ways you should avoid using them. I think as, as we embrace generics and start to understand how to actually use it, um, um, sort of in an idiomatic way, uh, um, it's, it's, it's going to become clear what the patterns are, what the best practices are. Um, but in the meantime, I think we have to give ourselves a little room to experiment and to kind of make mistakes. So I should forgive myself for writing. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, you'll, you'll be, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, right, you'll be all right. Fully, <laughs> I feel a little better now. Fully functional <laughs> FP library. <laughs> and go and forgive yourself after. Forgive you yourself, that's awesome, yeah. awesome. Uh, and so in our peanut gallery, we've, yeah. we've had some commentary about mm. uh, the, the look and feel of the studio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the peanut gallery was what, probably livelier than any of us expected. So right. thank you all for participating there. Um, we had great commentary about the talk, uh, intelligent conversation. My favorite part, I think, was uh, there was a comment that the studio looks like a nightclub. I yeah, think. and so yeah. I mean, it may have been, it may have been purposeful, right? Like, I mean, there's no after party, so we're gonna have right. to dual yeah. purpose this space. Exactly. So I that mean, means you're gonna get set, stand up and start dancing. We or? tried to get a disco ball. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that no, wasn't in the budget. <laughs> we have a we have a break dancer. <laughs> or do you break? Maybe you can. Do when it. I was in yeah. high school, yeah. not anymore. Okay, Broken not femur, anymore. pretty put, okay. pretty much put an end to that one. All right, we'll get some, we'll get a, a break dancer to come so in. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, thank you, thank you all again for participating there. Please do continue. Uh, that's some great conversation, uh, and you can see, you know, myself, Eric, and Johnny. We participate also while while the talks are going on, um, and we're we're totally excited for that too. So yeah, indeed. we've got some additional like fantastic talks coming up. Yeah. Um, in addition to the the main content that you'll see, uh, if you go to the agenda page. Some of the, we talked about it kind of in the opening. There'll be some virtual meeting spaces. There's a couple of them coming up. Um, Cockroach DB has a VMS coming up. Um, Microsoft has one on GitHub Actions. And then Buff is doing an open office hours mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. So yeah. make sure to check those things out. Those are the only thing you have to register for. Just the, the platform itself will require you to kind of register to get into those VMSs um, mm -hmm. outside of that you know, uh, participate as you are on, on all of the platforms we're streaming to right now. Yeah. And speaking of sponsors, uh, I think we have one with us now. Yes, yeah, so we have uh, Stephen Houston here with us uh, from Bread to talk to us a little bit about how they're using yeah. uh, Go for payments. Yeah, and this is an interesting space, I think. It's something that we may not have seen too much of yet. Now, so when you mean payments, are we talking like cryptocurrency or just regular good old dollars and cents no, and good, things? No, just good old dollars. Find out. No, no, yeah, let's go yeah. find out, huh? <laughs> See if we can get them on. Yeah. All right, Stephen, can you hear us? Happy, uh, happy go for con. Yeah, likewise to you too. So yeah, Johnny. If we I mean, that's we having a Travolta disco ball off. Did I hear that right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We yeah. You didn't ship it. That was part of the deal for the sponsorship, man. There, were, <laughs> there's two days left. You could overnight it to us. <laughs> yeah, I'm this, just. This oh, is man. possible. Yeah. We'll, have, we'll have to look at that. Uh, maybe, maybe we can use some of our bread payments products to to make that happen. Yeah. <laughs> Or somebody could hack the lights. I mean, okay, yeah, gophers, <laughs> get on that. <laughs> Let's do it. So yeah, so are you? So you're using Go in part of the payment workflow? Yeah, in fact, uh, Bread pretty much uses it, uh, exclusively Go in the back end. Um, we're by now pay later, so we 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 do have loan options uh, and, and things like that. Um, so for managing like loan schedules and and you know when payments are due and balance histories and transactions uh, and all of that, uh, it's done using services uh, written in Go. Um, 
generally uh, GRPC uh, communication going on there between services. Um, we have front end that's that's uh, JavaScript, and so uh, we'll do some REST and things like that uh, with with the front end. Um, we integrate with some third parties. Uh, in some cases, maybe uh, GraphQL that we do using Go, um, and and uh, it's a it's a pretty neat setup, and and we're having we're having a lot of uh, success with it, and um, you know pretty much the the whole flow of how that works uh, is is built on Go. Now, who'd you have to bribe or threaten to be able to use Go inside the financial? <laughs> industry <laughs> you know that would have to be a question for someone else because uh i just i just wrote the code no um I, I you know i think it's i think it's a good choice and and uh you know we're having we're having good success with it so when i think of payments i think of a lot of regulation a lot of requirements uh you know for security and so forth so can you walk us through maybe some of the um, special, a little bit more special considerations you might have had to make when you're building these systems? Yeah, so it, we have a lot of, lot of uh, different teams at Bread that are, that are kind of built to handle that. And we have a great legal team and compliance team. Um, you know, our, our team of, of product managers are just excellent. Um, and they, they, meet, uh, they meet requirements, they, they handle the compliance, they pass that down to us. Um, we implement it generally, uh, if we're gonna make any changes you know, the, to, to that scope or anything, we obviously have a process of running it through, um, through our different uh, teams to make sure that, that we're meeting uh, all necessary uh, steps. It, it's definitely a challenge, um, you know, you, you can't just, uh, you can't just try to resolve things or, or, or fix things, uh, you know, on your own without, uh, you know, worrying about, like you said, all that, uh, all that compliance. Yeah, for sure. I, I've had, I don't know about are you guys. I've had to run up against compliance every once in a while over I, the past couple of years. I worked and, in healthcare for yeah. a while. That was not fun. Yeah, and you know, you hear it. it. Sometimes it's not so bad when you actually have to do it, but then you, you hear it and you're like, oh this is going to take me a year or something to implement. So. That's the least favorite part of every engineer's job, to be part of the, all the sort of uh, the running around you have to do to, uh, to, to check all those boxes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Leave me alone. Let me write code. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's, like I said, we have, a, we have great PMs at Brad that, that really do the, the majority of, of the running around for. I can't say enough good things about them. Nice. Nice. Sweet. That's awesome. Well, I mean, it's been great talking with you, Stephen. Um, we've we got a, a run up of content here, so we're we're pretty excited about. We wish we had more time to talk with you, but it's been great hearing about how Bread is leveraging Go inside the financial space, and I hope to see more uh, kind of sectors that we wouldn't have traditionally see these things in. Yeah, you know, this is novel, uh, at least for me. You know, I haven't seen a lot of Go in the financial sector yet, so it's great that they're pushing these boundaries. And yeah. I mean, Love to see it in more. I'd love to see it in healthcare too. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. If they can do compliance and in, in, uh, finance, you know, why not in healthcare too? You heard it here first, first. Aaron says use Go in your uh, on compliance. Um, you just smooth. You know, just ease your way. Easy. You'll be smooth as butter. You just yeah. you know, just you know. Yeah, there's a yeah. Go for compliance .com. That's my <laughs> site. Everyone, sign up. Let's do this. <laughs> sign up for my like newsletter. He will happily help you with it. For yeah. Five hundred dollars an hour. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, so speaking of new content, uh, our next content is coming up. Um, we have got Felix. Uh, I apologize in advance, Felix, if I get this wrong. I think it's Giesendorfer, maybe. Oh, that sounds. Yeah, so, that sounds right. It, it's. I mean, anyone can say it sounds right. So I appreciate that. Oh, uh, you know, I got your back. For, thank you, I Johnny. You thank you. Yeah. So Felix uh, is a staff engineer at Datadog. And he is going to talk to us uh, about profiling and observability from scratch. Uh, so just a tiny little bit about Felix before we go to uh, his talk. Um, this session is for folks who are interested in reducing costs and latency or, or debugging those really tough problems, especially in distributed systems, you know, your memory leaks, your network problems, your communication problems, that kind of stuff. Uh, and I, you know, this is something that we run up against probably all three of us maybe every day even, you know, when we work on our distributed systems and our jobs. So, you know, I'm, I'm super excited to see this content from Felix. 
uh, coming up right now. Shall we go to the talk? We shall. We All shall. right, we'll take it away, Felix. Hey, everybody. Somebody commented about the GoPro slime bucket. The title of my presentation today is Go Profiling and Observability from Scratch. The target audience for this presentation are intermediate gophers who are interested in reducing resource consumption, improving latency, or mitigating incidents afflicting their Go applications. The agenda for doing this is to start by introducing a simple model for scheduling and memory management, which is important to understand Go performance. And then we'll talk about profiling, including all the various profilers. And for the first time, we'll also look at the overhead of the various profilers built into Go. This is the biggest part of the presentation. Additionally, to give you a full picture of Go observability, we'll also talk a little bit about tracing, metrics, and third-party tools that you can use. About myself, my name is Felix Geisendorfer, and I'm currently a staff engineer at Datadog, working on continuous Go profiling as a product. Before that, I spent six and a half years at Apple, working on factory traceability stuff using PostgreSQL and Go. In my spare time, I like to play beach volleyball and to contribute to open source. If you're interested in the latter, you can check out my readme on GitHub to find which projects I've been working on. All right, let's talk about scheduling and memory management. Go's primary job is to multiplex and abstract hardware resources, such as CPU, memory, and networking. In fact, this is very similar to what an operating system does. And if you uh, look further down the stack, you'll see that these patterns of memory management and scheduling exist everywhere. For example, your SSD has a built-in garbage collector. So it's really important to learn these patterns once, no matter at which layer of the stack, because they will be useful for any future endeavors you might have uh, as they repeat themselves in the landscape of computing. Um, the following model is very simplified, and it might be a um, repetition for some of the more experienced gophers here. But I hope that the more simplified picture I'm going to present today is going to be more useful for intermediate folks who may not be thinking about what the runtime and schedule or memory management system of Go usually have to accomplish. Uh, to introduce this, I'll use a simple example of an HTTP GET request. Uh, so we're requesting an URL here, and then we're printing out the status code. From the scheduler's perspective, what might happen is that the scheduler initially schedules our Go routine, called G1 here, onto a CPU core uh, in order to prepare the HTTP request. Then the Go routine has to wait for the network uh, on the response, which means the scheduler can take this Go routine off the CPU and do something else. In this case, there's nothing else to do, so the CPU core remains idle, just waiting on the network. And finally, once the network response comes back, the scheduler can put the G1 Go routine back onto the CPU to run the printf code to print out our status code. Reality is, of course, a little bit more complex than this, but I think this gives you a good idea of what the scheduler is doing. Another way to look at this is to think about the scheduler uh, putting Go routines into one of three states. They're either executing, waiting, or runnable. In our example, G1 starts in the executing state uh, while preparing the HTTP request. Then while waiting for the network, it gets put into the waiting state. And then uh, once the network response comes back, it gets added to the runnable state, which means uh, the scheduler is now looking for CPU core to schedule it. And finally, the Go routine uh, gets scheduled onto the CPU core again uh, to run the form printf statement. Uh, the bigger picture for scheduling then looks like this. Um, you usually have a bunch of Go routines that are executing on various CPU cores. In this case, you could actually tell that there's 50% CPU utilization right now. Then certain events such as sleeping, I.O., channels, or mutexes uh, can transition a Go routine from the executing into the waiting state. And Go, uh, Go programs usually have a lot of Go routines in the waiting state. The scheduler is designed to handle hundreds of thousands of Go routines in that state, so that list can get quite large. Uh, those Go routines usually eventually get evoked again by their sleep finishing or the I.O. completing or the channel mutex operations being done, and those Go routines become runnable. A well-running Go program usually shouldn't have many Go routines in the runnable state. In this case, we don't see any of them here, because if you get a lot of Go routines here, it actually means that you have more work to do than your CPU cores can handle. And uh, finally, if you have runnable Go routines and the CPU core comes, becomes available, they get scheduled again. So uh, yeah, this was a very simplified picture. In reality, it's more complicated as Go schedules Go routines uh, on operating system threads, which are then running onto the CPUs. 
Um, the schedule is also deeply integrated with networking channels and mutexes to accomplish the things you've seen before. And as I mentioned, it's very scalable. Now let's talk about memory management. Um, what you see here is a big picture of a program, Go program's memory divided into several stacks for G1, G2, T, G3, and a heap. Uh, usually you have many of these small stacks, one per Go routine, and they started uh, a small size of four kilobytes. And you have also a big area of memory called the heap, which is used for shared data and other stuff. So let's talk about the stack first and get an intuition for what the memory management costs are on the stack. Here we have a simple program that is uh, making an addition of two numbers and then printing out the results. When this program starts, the um, Go routine uh, that is running has to allocate some space for the sum variable on the stack. So uh, it puts it on this little area of memory here. And then the stack pointer uh, that you can see on the right uh, is pointing to the next free space on the stack in case we want to allocate more stuff on the stack. Uh, also highlighted here is the area uh, for the main stack frame, which includes all the memory used by the current function on the stack. Then the add operation uh, is executed here, uh, which needs two more variables to be pushed on the stack, uh, A and B, which have the numbers 23 and 20, uh, 42 here, uh, which means we allocate a new stack frame and the stack pointer gets advanced further down again. And finally, we uh, print our sum, but before that happens, uh, the uh, add function has to return. And as the add function returns, we have to sort of clear out that space on the stack that was used for it. And that is simply done by moving the stack pointer back up to where it was before. So it's a very cheap, easy operation to free stuff on the stack. In fact, we don't even have to overwrite the data that we allocated for the add function. Um, yeah, and then the print can happen. Now let's talk about heap allocations. Uh, here you have a big picture of the uh, heap, this time with a few objects allocated on it. And uh, what I want to point out here is that the heap usually has two types of objects. There are the reachable ones. Uh, one of them is highlighted here in green. And what makes them reachable is that you can follow some pointers from a stack through potentially some other objects all the way to that reachable allocation here. And then you've got unreachable allocations like this one, where nobody points to it and, or it's pointing to nobody. And uh, also this one, which has a pointer to something else, but it's not pointed to uh, by anybody. So both of these allocations we just saw are garbage and can be cleaned up. And that's the job of the garbage collector, which has to periodically come in and clean up those unused objects. Um, as you might imagine, compared to uh, heap allocation, stack allocation is very cheap um, because with heap allocation, you first have to find a spot for the memory to be placed on the heap which is a subject uh, in its own right. But then the GC also has to do a lot of work to actually locate the unreachable objects and figure out that it's safe to remove them because it has to do all this craft traversal that we've just been doing by hand. And for this reason, heap allocation and GC can often make up 20% or more of the CPU time of your Go program. So the general advice is to reduce, which means to either uh, avoid heap allocations completely or to turn them into stack allocations. Reuse, which means figuring out a way to not throw allocated stuff like structs and buffers away, but to reuse them for another time. And recycling, which is basically just saying sometimes it's okay. You don't have to get rid of all GC work. Once you've done enough optimizations, some GC work is okay. Let's the GC recycle the objects for you. Um, one thing I would like to point out here that because it's maybe a little unintuitive is that reducing heap allocations uh, can speed up unrelated code as a second order effect. And this is because the uh, garbage collector has to iterate through all the stuff on the heap, which basically trashes all your caches, uh, which basically uh, makes things a lot slower um, just after a garbage collection because those caches have to be repopulated with the stuff that your Go routines were actually trying to do. So optimizing memory allocations can be a very worthwhile endeavor in general. Now let's talk about profiling. Um, the CPU profiler in Go is, as you might imagine, responsible for figuring out how much time your Go routines are spending on the CPU. In the example we had in the beginning, that is the time that we've highlighted here. The simplest way to explain how that works is you could imagine the pink gopher playing the role of the CPU profiler and the blue gopher being the program you're trying to profile. 
And the pink gopher is like, hey, what you're doing? And the blue gopher answers X. And then again, hey, what you're doing? Y, hey, what you're doing? X. And the pink gopher just keeps a table uh, where it keeps count of how many times the blue gopher has given the same answer to this question, uh, which then basically gives a frequency table of events, which can be used to figure out what the blue gopher was doing during the period of profiling. A little bit more accurately described, the um, CPU profiler captures the on-CPU time of your code by interrupting your process for every 10 milliseconds of CPU time that it was uh, spending, uh, and then takes a stack trace uh, to put into a frequency table of stack traces, like we've seen here uh, in the profile data section. Uh, one thing to point out here, the sample count and the CPU uh, nanoseconds are completely redundant, and uh, the latter is derived from the former. Um, you can configure the sample rate using runtime set CPU profile rate, uh, but my recommendation is to not touch this, especially in a production setting, A, because 100 hertz is usually good enough, and B, because there's actually some problems, especially up to and including Go 1.17. So if you're interested in a few more details on how this works under the hood, um, the CPU profiler uh, installs a signal handler, uh, as you can see here. And this signal handler is uh, being invoked by the operating system uh, using a um, yeah, system call called set itimer, uh, where the go runtime tells the operating system it wants to be notified every 10 milliseconds of CPU time that are passing by sending a SIGPROF signal to this signal handler. Um, when the signal handler receives the signal, all the go routines and all the operating system threads in your go program are stopped and uh, the signal handler passes on the information to the sigprof function. And the sigprof function is actually pretty long and complex, but the gist of it is uh, highlighted here. Uh, it's taking a stack trace, and then the stack trace gets added to the CPU profile. So uh, that's pretty great, but uh, there's even better things coming for Go 1.18, because set itimer uh, actually has some issues. Uh, in particular, it fails to deliver more than 250 signals per second, and this can bias profiles to systematically underestimate CPU spikes. Uh, see the GitHub issue mentioned here. And the good news is that in Go 1.18, uh, Rhys Hiltner has contributed a patch uh, that will fix this um, by using the, uh, a different system call called Timer Create. And not only will this probably fix the uh, 250 signal limitation, it should also get rid of some threat bias when it comes to the signal delivery. So Go.118 uh, should really be a nice improvement for CPU profiling in Go. Now let's talk about the block profiler. The block profiler captures off-CPU time uh, while waiting on channels and mutexes, uh, but it does not capture off-CPU time waiting on sleep, I.O., system calls, GC, and a bunch of other stuff. Um, so really be aware that it's only channels and mutexes that are being captured here. Uh, the profile data is basically showing you uh, cumulative contentions and delays per stack trace. And you can configure the sample rate uh, by using runtime set block profile rate. Uh, my recommendation for production applications is to use the value 10,000. Um, here's a little example of how that works in practice. Um, let's say you have a little program that creates a channel and launches two Go routines. Uh, when the Go routine one executes the uh, first line of code here, which is passing the number one into the channel, uh, it has to wait because nobody is reading from this Go routine. Uh, because Go routine number two that can do the reading is currently calling time.sleep for one second. Then when Go routine two finishes its sleep and receives from the channel, that unblocks Go routine one. And in this moment is when the uh, block profiler kicks in and basically captures a uh, stack trace of this event, uh, of the Chen send operation, and uh, also the duration that the channel was blocked here, which in this case is one second. And then the program can continue. The uh, block profiler can also do this for mutexes and it looks very similar. Uh, here, G1 is locking a mutex and then going to sleep, while G2 is trying to acquire the same mutex, which it can't do because it's being blocked by G1. So it has to wait for G1 to call unlock, which then in G2 causes the lock operation to proceed. And again, this exact spot here on the right-hand side is when the block profiler comes in to capture a stack trace 
and the wait duration. And then the program continues. Which brings us to the next profiler, because this is a little confusing. There's also a mutex profiler. Um, and this one also captures the off CPU time that Go programs spend waiting on mutexes, but not channels. And the profile data looks exactly the same as the block profile. And it also has a uh, little knob for controlling the sampling rate. Uh, in this case, my recommendation would be a rate of 10, which would mean 10% of all the events. Um, why is this mutex profile even a thing if the block profile already does mutex contentions? Um, because superficially, yeah, block seems like a superset of mutex. Uh, in reality, it's not, because the mutex profile shows you what code is doing the blocking, while the block profile is showing you what code is getting blocked. And both perspectives can be useful, so you should enable both of these profilers. Um, to give, if this was confusing, here's a better example. Um, basically, the mutex profiler uh, is different from the block profiler because, um, again, here's the block profiler capturing a mutex contention. As you can see, the stack trace gets captured for the lock operation in G2 that was getting blocked. And for the mutex profiler, which we're showing now, you can see that the stack trace is captured on the left-hand side for the unlock operation that caused the uh, goroutine sheet 2 to become unblocked. So again, two perspectives of the same events that are happening, both can be valuable. This finishes our little tour of Go profilers that are focused on capturing time. And I want to use this opportunity to uh, talk about time a little bit more uh, as it relates to user time. So here you have a user that is waiting for 100 milliseconds on a request. And in this particular case, uh, the request is actually being executed by three different Go routines that are running concurrently, uh, which essentially means that uh, this request is spending 300 milliseconds of Go routine time, which is the time that is cumulatively passing for all our Go routines. And this time could then also be divided in some of this Go routine time being executed on CPU and some of it off CPU. What you can see here is that it can lead to interesting things such as 150 milliseconds of CPU time um, being spent to serve this request, even though the user only experienced 100 milliseconds of time. So this explains why sometimes you can send, see more time spent on a CPU profile than the uh, execution duration of your request or program is. Uh, another angle to look at this is to uh, picture all these different times that your Go routines can be spending on this little diagram here. Uh, Go routine time is basically the cumulative time of all the Go routines. If you would capture the start time and end time of each Go routine and added up all those durations, that would be Go routine time. Then you have CPU time, uh, which is the time that those Go routines were running on CPU. Um, again, this can be larger circle than the real time circle, uh, depending on uh, the level of parallelism in your application. Uh, then you have the mutex and block profile, with the block profile being a superset of the mutex time, but again with different stack traces, so they're both uh, separately useful. Then you have uh, what I like to call untracked off CPU wait time, which includes several things such as I/O, system calls, or sleep, or scheduler backlog, etc., um, where profiling really has kind of a blind spot and cannot really capture this time, and we'll need other techniques that we'll discuss later. And then you've got real time, which is basically a subset of Go routine time that generally intersects with CPU, mutex, and block time, um, which all of this can be a little confusing, but uh, hopefully this gives you a better idea of what profiling can show you and what also it can show you and where you need different tools. Um, let's move on to memory profiling, uh, which is uh, different from time profiling. The memory profiler in Go um, produces profile data that shows you the cumulative allocations and memory that's still in use for each stack trace. So every part of your program that's allocating, you will see how much data was allocated at a particular function or line in your program. And then you will also see how much of those allocations are currently still alive on the heap. Um, the memory profiler doesn't do that for every allocation. Instead of sampling uh, every 512 kilobytes of malloc using a Poisson sampling algorithm. And uh, the uh, memory profiler also keeps track of when the objects are freed, uh, especially only for those sampled objects. Um, and that is used to later calculate the in-use fields that you see above. The memory profiler also has a sample rate control knob, which is called runtime mem profile rate. 
But my recommendation is to leave this untouched, especially in production, because it's a pretty good default. Um, if you want to see this from another perspective, let's assume we have a simple main function that allocates a user struct and then prints out the uh, value of it. Um, and what happens here is the moment that this line executes, uh, essentially the memory profiler can capture a stack trace uh, along with the information on the size of this allocation. And the reason this works is because the compiler internally uh, converts this uh, yeah, allocation here into a function call to runtime new object. And that is where then eventually the memory profiler uh, gets to execute the stack trace capturing uh, logic that I just mentioned. And then eventually the program can continue running. Uh, the last profile that we're going to talk about today is the GoRoutine profile. Uh, the GoRoutine profile captures essentially uh, GoRoutine counts per stack trace and can tell you how many GoRoutines you have in total and what was the last known uh, function and line that those GoRoutines were essentially executing. Uh, one word of warning here, the GoRoutine uh, profile is a stop the world profile that has to temporarily stop all your GoRoutines um, and the amount of time that this stop the world phase lasts is directly proportional to the number of GoRoutines used by your application. So if you have a very high number of GoRoutines, uh, this can become a issue for uh, your tail latencies. Uh, unfortunately, there's not a lot of good workarounds right now because the GoRoutine profile does not offer any sampling mechanism. So you always have to iterate over all of them and get all the stack traces. Uh, but still, there's a few very good use cases for this. For example, detecting GoRoutine leaks, or you can also use this to diagnose why a Go program might be hanging uh, because uh, there's a debug2 output that can show you uh, which GoRoutines are waiting for longer than one minute, um, which can be super useful in some situation. Uh, notably, the PLOCK profiler cannot tell you this uh, because it will only emit events after some PLOCKing event has finished. So some still ongoing PLOCKing event, you can only diagnose with the GoRoutine profile, essentially. Um, next up is tracing. Um, which we'll talk about briefly because it really complements profiling in ways that are super useful and you should at least use at least some amount of tracing in your applications. Uh, at least that's what I think. Um, the main idea of tracing is if we go back to our Hello World program here or Hello HTTP, um, what we basically end up doing to trace it is to, to capture a start time of this operation and then we print out how long this operation took. And this is a form of tracing where we're basically capturing some interesting information from our application performance wise uh, along with a time duration uh, that, that it took. Um, and again, what's cool here is we can capture the entire duration that this operation lasted, including the idle time uh, on the network that we are somewhat applying to when we use just profilers. Of course, there's a little caveat here. Uh, oftentimes, a Go runtime will utilize channels uh, to do networking. So sometimes this shows up on a PLOCK profile as well, but uh, you can never be quite sure if that will be the case, depending on how the libraries that are using are implemented. Um, there's various forms of tracing, but what I think they all have in common is uh, the recording of timestamped events. Um, the distinction with logging can be a little bit muddy, so it depends on context what people tend to call tracing or not. Uh, where it becomes very clear is distributed tracing, uh, which is basically the idea of tracing requests and uh, latency information like we've just shown, but doing it through an entire system of multiple applications by essentially passing request IDs from one system to the next, so you can connect all these uh, sub-requests of a user request together and understand how long they're taking. Um, I highly recommend this to understand performance from a system perspective. Um, then there is runtime tracing, uh, and Go has a built-in tracer that does this, uh, which basically emits a lot of events about runtime internals. And this one is also really cool because it can uh, shine light on profiling blind spots such as I.O., sleep, GC, scheduler, backlog, etc., uh, that are difficult to understand with profiling. And uh, Another form of tracing that currently doesn't exist in uh, uh, Go is tracing profilers, which would basically trace every function call and capture how long it takes to execute. Um, yeah, this doesn't exist yet, but I'm working on a prototype for something uh, which I might release at some point because I think it could be an interesting addition. It's probably not going to be for production usage, but uh, some people might be interested regardless. Um, a little bit more details on the runtime tracer because it's so useful. 
Uh, it basically captures scheduler events, GC events, contention events, syscalls, etc. So it actually also has some overlap with what the um, uh, clock profiler does, for example, when it comes to contentions. Um, and if you want to have a full list of everything that this thing can capture, uh, go to source runtime trace.go. Uh, this is also my favorite file in, in the whole Go source tree because it can show you a list of the most important things that the Go runtime is doing, and you can jump from there to the locations where those things are happening. So it's a really good uh, index to Go internals. Um, one thing to note about the runtime tracer is that it's a very high overhead uh, way of instrumenting your Go applications uh, because it produces a lot of data and you can filter what data you want. So be a little careful in production with this or actually be a lot careful with this. Uh, we'll look at this in uh, more detail in a moment. Uh, but again, it's a fantastic way to track down latency when nothing else seems to have the answer. So you should you should have this tool in, in your pocket when, when you need it. Uh, also worth noting, of course, is that it comes with a really nice UI that can uh, show you uh, your timelines from a thread perspective, i.e. how did Go routines get scheduled on operating system threads, uh, but it can also show you uh, the same view uh, how Go routines uh, are executing by themselves. So you get a timeline for each Go routine. You can click through various ways in the UI to get to the different views. Um, Next up, let's talk a little bit about something that I don't hear discussed very often, which is uh, profiling and trace tracing a Faustian bargain. Um, essentially, profiling and tracing uh, can gain you a great uh, amount of performance knowledge, but just like in Goethe's Faust, the, our Mephisto gopher is a little coy about the price. The Go documentation for profiling generally states that most profilers are okay for production usage, but doesn't go into any quantification of this. Um, so today, for the first time, at least to my knowledge, I'll try to uh, share some research uh, on what the overhead is for the various Go profilers. Um, the way that this was set up is to essentially run different workloads in a loop for one minute uh, with and without various profilers enabled to then measure the average latency for that workload. Um, I've repeated each of those experiments for five times and performed all of this on an AWS instance uh, the total duration for this benchmark was uh, around six hours. Um, very important, this is very hard stuff. Uh, it's very difficult to get this right. This is just an early sneak peek of this research. Uh, the environment used is bad, the statistics are not great, the workloads are pretty naive. So do not trust this too much, but I thought it was still interesting enough already to share a little bit of what I found so far. Um, so here's one workload that I started with, which is basically simulating a typical web application workload of running a SQL query in response to an HTTP request, perhaps. Um, so here we see a SQL query uh, being executed against a PostgreSQL instance. And uh, this SQL query basically just uh, asks the database to sleep for 10 milliseconds because we don't actually want to put load on the database. Um, because it was running on the same host, but even if it wasn't, uh, we don't want the database performance to uh, be more prominent on our results than the actual performance of our Go program. So this is a reasonable compromise for now. So what I found doing this was that uh, essentially you see very little overhead for any of the profilers, even including the tracer, um, when you run this in production. So um, just going through this table a little bit, you basically have uh, the first column is the profiler, and the second uh, column is concurrency. So I've ran each um, of these profilers with a concurrency of one or eight Go routines executing the same workload. And then I basically measured the change in average latency for this workload. Um, so yeah, as you can see, not much overhead here, especially for the normal profilers. Only when you uh, enable the tracer or the tracer plus all the profilers, do you see a tiny little bit of overhead, but I wouldn't read too much into this. Then uh, the next workload I looked at is an HTTP Hello World workload, which basically is the most important benchmark in the world, according to some people, uh, of just figuring out how fast can you serve HTTP requests that essentially do nothing. Uh, I would say this is quite an artificial workload, but it's the most fun one people tend to go for. So here's some results for that. Uh, good news again, CPU, MEM, and Mutex profiler, no overhead. A little bit of significant overhead for the block profiler, but uh, again, uh, I was using a block profile rate of 10,000. This might go down a little bit if we choose an even higher rate, 
Um, I don't think this is very representative of a production workload, so I wouldn't say that this should worry you about the block profiler. Uh, what we then also see is that the uh, uh, tracer, as well as the tracer plus all profilers, starts to show a lot more overhead, especially with a concurrency of one. For some reason, <laughs> the overhead is less when it's a concurrency of eight, which is interesting. Uh, we'll look at this a little bit in a second. Um, which we'll do by looking at the next workload, which is a JSON parsing workload. So this is basically parsing a small JSON document and then actually marshalling it back into uh, a byte slice, uh, which again is very artificial workload, but it's a fun one to look at. So here's the results for that. And those are <laughs> a little interesting to say the least. Um, first of all, uh, we don't actually get any overhead in the sense that our program runs slower. Uh, our program only runs faster uh, if we throw profilers at it. So in particular, the CPU profiler makes this workload 13% faster um, and the tracer can make it up to 40% faster. Obviously, this is very worrisome for the quality of this research. So I decided to uh, take a closer look of what's going on here. Um, in particular, um, I was uh, looking at the three uh, different configurations of either having uh, no profilers enabled, as you can see here, or uh, having the CPU profiler enabled or having the tracer enabled. So let's look at this data for a second. Um, what we can see here is basically the x-axis is the uh, time uh, of the benchmark running. Uh, each little square is one execution of this benchmark. And then the y-axis is the latency of one particular iteration of that workload. And what we notice here is that our benchmark is getting faster over time. So the longer we run this workload, the faster our program is executing. That obviously is a problem because clearly something is either warming up here or interfering with our workload in a way that uh, basically makes these results hard to uh, compare uh, to begin with uh, because the samples we are collecting here are not statistically uh, independent from each other anymore. So that's always a little troublesome, um, but it's even worse. When we look at the next one, which is the CPU profiler, uh, what we can see is uh, the same kind of pattern in general, but uh, we start to see this little band of outliers down here where towards the end of our program's execution, we get some very, very fast iterations, uh, which is, yeah, again, a little new phenomenon that we haven't seen yet uh, with no profiling. And then when we see the tracer, where we saw up to 40% gains of um, uh, performance improvement, uh, the pattern becomes even more stark where we see two bands where uh, request latencies or, or workload iteration latencies are starting to cluster here, one sort of in the middle and one uh, at the very bottom. And uh, what I think is happening here uh, is that basically uh, we're seeing some amount of uh, turbo boosting or otherwise frequency scaling that the CPU is doing on this machine. Uh, which is uh, causing some of our requests to accelerate. What's not quite clear to me if this is really Turbo Boost is then why does our workload with no profiling uh, ha uh, not show the same pattern? Because we're already putting eight Go routines on heavy CPU duty work here. So you would expect uh, Turbo Boost or whatever additional performance the CPU can squeeze out to kick in. Uh, I'm not really entirely sure yet what's going on there. So definitely more research is needed. Uh, the one thing you should definitely take away from this slide is don't trust anybody's benchmarks and data unless they show you pictures like this, because only when you look at the patterns in the data can you tell anything about the quality of the research, um, which is still very hard to do, but this really makes it easier to, to see if you're looking at bad data or not. Um, I don't think this invalidates everything I'm talking about here, but it should show you that you have to apply great caution uh, and, and not jump to too strong conclusions from this. Um, Another workload here to validate our methodology perhaps is to uh, look at channels. So here we have a uh, message passing situation where we send 10,000 messages from GoRoutine A to GoRoutine B, um, and that's our workload. And uh, for this workload, uh, we actually get to show the uh, block profiler and the tracer to show, give us huge amounts of overhead. And the reason for that is pretty clear. We're basically doing a lot of uh, channel uh, contention events that are causing the block profiler to kick in um, and the tracer is just going nuts because there's a ton of go routine scheduling and contention events that the tracer all has to admit. So that's that's just a lot of work for both the block profiler and the tracer. Um, and this is probably the most pathological kind of workload that I can think of. 
This shouldn't tell you that all hope is lost for using these tools, but it should tell you if your workload is very pathological in the way that what I've just shown you, you should be much more careful with these tools than maybe for a normal application like the uh, SQL queries that I've first shown. So um, a little bit more error analysis of all the things that are that could have gone wrong here or definitely did go wrong. Um, yeah, dynamic frequency scaling is definitely one candidate that I'll investigate more. Noisy neighbors is another. This is a cloud environment, which is not the best place to do this research. Um, there's human error. So I could have just uh, done some bad things during the setup and execution of all of this, um, which I will have to continue double checking. Um, but hopefully by the time you watch this, either new results have already come out or new results will be on the way. So uh, the quality of this will go up over time and I'll probably publish it somewhere online. Um, but what I'm willing to say already is that I think for the CPU, memory, mutex, and for the most part block profile, um, I think unless you have a very crazy workload uh, that is really skewed to make those profilers look bad, I think these are pretty safe profilers for production and you can turn them on on most applications uh, in a way that you probably can't measure the overhead uh, on your programs by just looking at request latencies. Some programs will be different. Um, the number, the utilization of your CPU cores and stuff will also play a role thanks to Little's law, but uh, I still think that the most of these profiles are pretty good. The tracer you should definitely be careful with. Now let's talk about metrics. Uh, we'll only do this briefly, but I want to highlight a few things. First of all, Go 1.16 and later has a new package called runtime.metrics, which is a new place to get all your runtime metrics from. And I, in particular, want to highlight some of my favorites here, which is the uh, GC pauses and schedule latencies. Uh, both of these are histograms, which is something you couldn't get before Go 1.16. Uh, the first one shows you the stop the world pause latency histogram for uh, the garbage collector which in recent versions of Go generally shouldn't be a problem anymore, but hey, you can check it anyway. Maybe uh, you find some new issues with it. Um, and then the latter is, the second one is the schedule latency, which basically tells you how much time your Go routines are spending in a runnable state, um, which is allowing you to look at one of those profiling blind spots uh, that, that is difficult to get at. Um, the last one I've highlighted here is one that is, uh, near and dear to my heart because it can tell you something about profiler overhead, which is the profiling buckets bytes. Um, and that basically tells you how much memory the profiler uh, for the block mutex and uh, memory profile is allocating off the heap. So this does not show up in your heap usage uh, in order to keep those profile statistics for those profiles around. Generally speaking, this is very small, usually a couple megabytes. But there are some pathological applications that will have maybe 100 megabytes in here. So this is a fun one to keep an eye on as well. Um, my recommendation is to generally try to find a way to capture all the metrics that come out of the runtime metrics package because they're really great and useful. Um, now let's talk about third-party tools to round out the picture of things you can use to observe Go applications. There's Linux Perf, which can capture uh, CPU profiles. Uh, this works very well thanks to frame pointers and dwarf information emitted by the Go compiler. Um, currently, this can definitely be a little superior to Go CPU profiler uh, up until Go 1.18 due to the um, limitations I've mentioned earlier. Um, and of course, Linux Perf can also do much more uh, and produce all kinds of other interesting profiles and traces. So uh, if you want to go really deep on something, it's definitely worth checking out in addition to the built-in profilers. BPF trace is uh, one of the cool new tools in the eBPF uh, universe. Um, one of my favorite ways you can use it is to do dynamic tracing of any Go uh, function at runtime. So this little program shown here says, put a U probe on my program called example, that's the name of the binary, uh, on the function main.foo. Please note that this is a private function, which are, would otherwise might be more difficult to observe or hack into. Um, and then when this function gets called, the BPF program here uh, prints out main.foo was called. Um, yeah, BPF trace, if you're familiar with dtrace, it's basically the same thing. They're both inspired by Arc and they're uh, really powerful tools to build custom little scripts to observe applications uh, with relatively low overhead. So you can often use this stuff in production. But a big warning here is if you ever see the uh, keyword uredprobe mentioned in one of those scripts, 
uh, do not let it go near your Go programs because this will generally crash Go programs due to the way that you read probes are implemented and the fact that the Go routine um, is uh, using uh, dynamic stack resizing of Go routines. So, so be very careful here. Um, Delph is also worth mentioning. It's a debugger for Go. Um, one cool thing is you can script it using a scripting language called Starlog. Most people probably haven't played with that, but I've done it and I think it's very cool. And they're also working on eBPF integration. Uh, there's already some experimental tracing functionality available today, which is why I'm mentioning it in the context of Go observability, because I think there's potentially ways that Delph will become an observability tool that you might be able to use in production in the future. Uh, today, it's probably still mostly a debugger that you should prefer for development environments. Um, and last but not least, a little project of mine called FGProf, uh, which is a wall clock profiler uh, that is implemented by collecting Go routine profiles uh, 100 times per second. And it's really that simple. It's also only like 100 lines of code. Um, and that can also show you various things that the Go profilers cannot show you uh, because it gets to look at all the Go routines regardless of what state they're currently in. Um, the only problem with FGProf or the main problem is that uh, it causes these stops the world pauses because it's built on the Go routine profile. So you should not use it in production. Um, but perhaps it's useful for development and test environments, uh, especially if you want to uh, spot uninstrumented I.O. latencies or time.sleep, et cetera. And who knows, maybe in the future, uh, Upstream will be interested in proposals for allowing Go routine uh, profiles to be taken in a sampling fashion, which would put an upper bound on the stop the world pauses. So uh, tools like FGProf could become uh, production tools as well. All right, that basically brings us to the end, but we have time for a quick recap. The recap is uh, on the scheduling and, uh, sorry, scheduling and execution side of observability. Uh, you've got the profilers, especially the CPU, clock, mutex, and Go routine profiler. You've got tracing, uh, especially runtime execution, tracing, and distributed tracing. Then you've got metrics, such as scheduler latency and Go routine count. And one thing we didn't talk about, because it's, well, not clear if people would call it observability, but you can get information at compile time, uh, for example, about function inlining by passing the dash M flag to the GC flex option of the Go build tool. Um, similar for memory management, you've got the memory profiler. Um, tracing can be used to uh, get information about GC events. Uh, you've got various metrics such as GC counters, pause times, heap statistics, even stack statistics. Many people don't look at the total size of their Go routine stacks, which can also add up if you have a lot of Go routines. And again, there's a little bit of compile time information you can get uh, on the escape analysis performed by the compiler, uh, again, available via the dash M flag. So um, the summary of all of this is that essentially the Go runtime offers great observability out of the box. And most of these tools play really nice with production workloads, in my opinion, even though that research will continue. And uh, there's also a lot of great third party tools and custom uh, instrumentations that you can use to close any gaps. This is the end, but not quite the end. Um, I will uh, continue writing stuff online. I've got this thing called Busy Developer's Guide to Go Profiling, Tracing, and Observability that you might find interesting. I'll continue with the benchmarking. I'm looking forward to releasing more standalone tools, such as the Tracing Profiler. And I'm also always interested in contributing patches upstream. Uh, currently got one in the works, but I'm always looking to find more stuff to, to help out with. So um, this is the end finally. And uh, thank you so much for uh, listening to me. Thank you so much for the organizers and uh, enjoy the rest of GopherCon 2021. Goodbye. Hi, everyone. Welcome to GopherCon 2021. My name is David Justice. And on behalf of Microsoft, I would like to welcome all the gophers out there to this great conference. This is a conference that's near and dear to my heart and one that I've been attending since 2015. Um, and thankfully at Microsoft, uh, I'm grateful to be able to build this thing. Uh, if you don't know what this is, this is a cluster API. It's a, a Kubernetes SIG cluster lifecycle project uh, that is for declaring infrastructure in Kubernetes, and then it builds it out for you. Um, it's all written in Go, just as much of Kubernetes is, and uh, I'm, I'm really proud to work on it. 
Um, I'm also super proud of what this conference has meant to my family. Um, my wife, Dea, loves to make uh, gopher art <laughs> for uh, my whiteboards, and my son has uh, enjoyed coming to the conference as well. Uh, it's a really amazing community, and I am so glad to be part of it with you. Uh, I hope you enjoy this conference, and on behalf of Microsoft, I want to say thank you, and I look forward to meeting all of you, uh, even if it's virtually. Uh, so thank you so much. I can't wait to see you. All righty. We are back, the trusty MCs. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I just want to thank you, Felix, so much for that content. Um, and David, also, it's awesome to see what you're working on. Awesome to see um, what you're doing in the community, too. That uh, artwork. Is, yeah, yeah that artwork. Pretty yeah. sick. In, indeed, yeah. We, we love that artwork. So th thank Dea for us as well. Um, so a little housekeeping note. Uh, this was mentioned in the peanut gallery uh, as well. So just a reminder uh, for everybody, the speakers each have their own channel in Discord. So they're going to be in there. Most of them are going to be in there at least right after their talk. Uh, to answer questions, have discussions on the content, really what have you. So do feel free to go take advantage of that and have, have those discussions with them. Yeah, and some of them, uh, if it's uh, one of the recorded talks, the, the couple that we have, they may actually be in there to answer questions during the talk. So definitely check those out when, that, when that's happening. Yeah. Yeah, and then one other thing. Uh, I was told by uh, folks smarter than me <laughs> that the pronunciation of Felix's last name is Geisendurfer. Uh, Felix, uh, if you're watching, uh, hit me in Discord. Give me a grade, a letter grade, how I did there. Uh, <laughs> I would, would love to. F. Uh, F. Or an L. Uh, what about a G for German? Can I get one of those, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, again, thank you so much, Felix, for that content. That was like really super interesting to hear about uh, this topic from someone who's been in the trenches and doing that and doing that stuff. So yeah, I hear um, we have a plaque. Is mm. that right? Mm. We do not have a plaque. Oh, okay. And that's kind of the aspirational. It's kind <laughs> of the problem. That's the problem. Right. Okay. So been hanging out here in the studio, and uh, Microsoft has one of these 100K plaques mm. for a Microsoft developer. And I'm a little mm -hmm. jealous. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I think GopherCon needs one. Yeah, I saw you so, eyeing that earlier. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. for Christmas, I want one of these. And I'm just going to need like 75,000 of you. Of your closest? Yeah, to go subscribe. Oh, of your closest bots. Yeah, and, uh, yeah we're not going to encourage you to build a bot. But if you were. We're not saying so to build a bot. I hear Go can do this very efficiently. Yeah, I mean, we've got Go routines. We're not saying to use them to build a bot. We're but if you were going to, there's you know there's no better tech. That either. Yeah, exa exactly. Yeah, yeah. We're not going to encourage you, but mm -hmm. we may turn a blind eye if there happened to be a bot. Yeah, and if you're watching this on the YouTube stream and it goes black, <laughs> you know what happened. Hop on over to the Learn TV channel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, but 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 seriously, you know that support would be great uh, if we get that plaque one day. Well, if you get that plaque one day, you know that that would be. We'll really have a disco ball in the studio to yeah. celebrate. Oh yeah, this that. thing this thing reflects some light. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so all right, yeah. So who do we have up next, Johnny? So whenever I think of banks and banking systems, the first thing that comes to mind is mainframes. Like in hospitals, banks, I'm like mainframes. Uh, like what comes to mind for you when you, when I say bank? What do you think? Yeah. Money. Yeah. Just money. money. After money, <laughs> After money. Yeah. Well, I mean, money depending on who you are, right? Right, right, yeah, right. yeah exactly. Enterprise exactly. Java beans. Uh, <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> oh, no, no, flashbacks, flashbacks. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, though, there, there is some innovation going on in that space, you know, um, especially with Go, right? Novel uses of Go on the mainframe. And, uh, you know, who better um, to, to talk to us today about, about that than Kaylin Gibraltar-Tara. Um, sorry, I butchered your name. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, and, and, and she's a tech lead at uh, Capital One, where and that, so that's a bank for those who don't know. And, and surprise, surprise, they have mainframes. Who'd have thunk it? Who'd have thunk it? Um, yeah, so. Th do they have Go? But, well, thanks to Kayleen, they do. Um, yeah. And yeah, and she's definitely going to talk to us about um, basically what she's been doing with that stuff on those mainframes. Take it away, Kaylin. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much. So I'm excited to be here. Uh, I've been around Go since about like 2015 and always was really excited about like there's so much potential here. This is such a great language. I am a little biased. I came from a C++ background. So eventually I learned 
Go was written for people like me, but it really resonated. And uh, I've been at Capital One for almost nine years. And the very first project that I joined was a mainframe project where I was mostly doing those Java Bean applications that Aaron was bringing up, but we were even connecting those to COBOL, and that was the that was the first asset that I came in on. And since then, have seen the company try different strategies for how do you work with mainframes, how can we modernize them, and want to share both how that works and like understanding how a large legacy type system operates, and then covering how you can use Go and the language uh, both from the technical standpoints and also the principles that are guiding it to build at that scale at your company. So this is a bit of an outline. To give a warning, if you thought you know you came to this Go conference and we were just going to talk about Go code, unfortunately, I'm going to be asking all of you to like really dig into like what is a mainframe, what are legacy systems, and like how do you hopefully learn some of these strategies? Because if you have not worked with modernizing legacy systems very often, uh, a lot of the obvious answers that you will try <laughs> fail, uh, and I can I want to share that experience to hopefully help you. And then for those that uh, after you've kind of tried and you've potentially failed, what's going to work and how do you how do you use it to build large teams that are going to tackle this problem ideally in Go. All right, so to kick it off, I'm going to assume not everybody really knows exactly what a mainframe is. If you do, if you've worked in mainframes, especially if you've written COBOL, I like absolutely want to talk to you, so please reach out in Discord. Uh, I'd love to share some experiences. But mainframes uh, were created 77 years ago. So that's when the first one launched, the Harvard Mark I. It was created by this guy Howard. This is the original kind of squad that led the launch of this massive mainframe. And I've added here a picture that almost encapsulates the entire size of the mainframe. It's in fact 55 feet wide, so like much larger than my New York apartment, probably two of them side by side. Uh, but what this mainframe was for, as you can see at the very first section, this has a 30 down by 24 across set of switches. And there's actually two of them, so you've got 60. But those are all going to be used for tracking the values inside your mainframe. And what you can do is you can do up to 72 numbers. They can be 23 digits long, and you can do a bunch of math. So I've included some of the metrics, how fast you can do these math equations. And at the time, this was just absolutely mind-blowing. The uh, Howard, the guy who created this, was all over saying, this is it. We've solved this problem. There's going to be 24 entire mainframes used in the entire world, 24 or 27, something like that. He's like, that's it. We're going to do all of our math problems and you know, solve the world's problems. The second picture I want to show that I really like is this is a picture of the punch codes that they would put in to this mainframe system. And there were two things when I was like pulling up just some images around mainframes that stood out for this picture. So the first was I could really picture us at like conference talks today uh, if we did not write with human words and instead wrote in punch codes. I can totally picture the like slides and wave analysis of writing our code. And I think that would actually be a really fun exercise to do at some point in time. But second, something that's very um, not necessarily well known is there's the story of Grace Hopper and the mainframe team finding a bug in their system. And it was one of those, like, they couldn't figure out why it wasn't running. And eventually, they actually physically looked in that 55-foot mainframe and found a moth sitting inside. So from then on, whenever they had issues with their code, even if it was, in fact, their punched code, they would say, it's a bug. It's like, it's not me. With these pieces of paper, that were punched. Uh, eventually, you know, you're doing your calculations and you're running through all of them, and it doesn't take you long to say like, I w I'm gonna, I want to run this again. I want to run this with different values, but I want it to be the same set of instructions. And so, what they ended up doing was they taped the paper back to itself, creating a loop that would run. And that's literally why we call it for loops today. That's why you reference, oh, you're going to run this code again in this loop interface. And it's, it's because we taped this paper back on itself. And so I just found that kind of fun and interesting to see how that terminology is absolutely what we still use today. But uh, the mainframes of right now are definitely not that like 55 foot monstrosity. So. First of all, like 70%, I don't think everybody realizes just 70% of Fortune 500 companies are using mainframes. 90% of credit card transactions. I don't think this data is too old, a few years old. Just incredible volume of business uh, transactions go through mainframes. 
on the right, I've got this picture of like an IBM modern mainframe. They've got their like nice, looks more modern. It has the blue stripes. What's interesting and important to kind of know about these mainframe systems is I, there's 40 terabytes of memory on here. So what's compelling about mainframes is when you're building something in like the cloud, if you're using, I, I glanced at AWS sizes and in memory, the, the largest I saw is about half a terabyte. So when you're comparing half a terabyte of data to 40, you could have a very, very different conversation about how you're going to save your data and how you're going to make sure you have a consistent read. And if you can just dump like that, 40 terabytes is much larger than the entire volume of transactions that we are generally monitoring. Um, you can just put it all in memory, and that's going to obviously make it so quick, so fast. So there's that speed that comes with mainframes that's really, really hard to beat. And then the final bullet that I just brought up, because uh, it's actually a really fantastic read, is that they have a fun fact where it, it definitely can survive at least an 8.0 earthquake on the Richter scale. And the reason they know that is because they absolutely created a like very serious test where they went rigorously through and like tested out these earthquakes with these mainframes. So you know it'll sit around forever. So this is a modern mainframe. Most companies are using something in between. Now I pulled on this slide. We know banking, people, you know, banking and governments tends to be where people think of mainframes. That's where they tend to bring it up. It's definitely everywhere in that uh, in these domains, but I added in a bunch of other ones, kind of just like threw in some names. I scanned like that link at the bottom. You can just pull it up, and there's a huge list of companies that IBM is tracking that use mainframes, and it's across all these industries. So there's also healthcare and insurance. There's probably some surprise around like most airlines are still using mainframes and are actually pretty passionate about I think in the mainframe world <laughs> they like really know what they're doing and have strong opinions but you can see it all over the place even I added the New York Times uh, news more quickly than other industries but it, it's just everywhere so this is uh, to help essentially explain how mainframes are used today where they came from and all of that information now, nine years ago, that's when I was introduced to mainframe development. And I joined a team uh, where we were tasked with, we've got multiple mainframes, and we want to merge two of them. That's a common strategy if you're working with legacy systems and you've got your data inside of them. You don't want to have tons and tons of different backends because things will get confusing. You've got to maintain all of them. So a natural um, request is to take all of these things and merge them. So how this kind of looks and how this came about, because I don't think many people would think this all through, is if you started a company in the 70s and 80s, you used a mainframe. Every single, it was the only option. You had a mainframe. And you had all these smaller companies, whether they were banks, insurance, whatever, uh, all backed by one mainframe. And then over time, you'll see companies merge. And so then they're left with this conglomerate of a bunch of different backends. And they are like, well, I don't, I don't want all these backends. <laughs> so the natural reaction is to say, just like, let's just start merging them. And that makes a lot of sense, in theory. Uh, I heard the project idea. I was like, yeah, sure, that, that sounds right. That's what we should do. I want to break from this like idea of this assumption that you're just going to merge these mainframes easily and talk a little bit more about like what actually is a mainframe. So I just added this GIF for two reasons. One, the guy is kind of fun. Uh, but two, if you look, so this whole stereotype of like hacking that you see in TV of the black screen with the green text comes from mainframes. But also the picture here, if you can see it, is not the most unrealistic. It's not actually showing you a mainframe, but it does really show a similar UI. Because this one, I just looked around at random pictures of mainframes. And this one I found, and I, this is something I worked with. Um, so you pull, you pull up a system and you're going to see this menu. It's going to have different options, but you're going to see this like, okay, select 0, 1, 2, 3, et cetera, et cetera. This makes a lot of sense. You're like, no problem. Just going to, it's a terminal interface, not a big deal. Um, I kind of looked around and the second picture just kind of gives an example of when you're going through, it's not so much a clean flow of uh, like steps you're going to run through. It's actually pretty complex. Of you need to remember all of the characters you put through because eventually you're going to get to this like journal entry was what they've described it. I've seen that before. And you're going to want to update it. Maybe you want to change the balance. This isn't a testing environment, but you're going to update. You're going to want to refresh. You're going to want to run a batch, something like that. 
And I remember when I joined this team early on, it was a bunch of like very seasoned mainframe engineers and me, uh, like right out of college, and they were like, we don't know, we don't, like really nice to meet you, <laughs> uh, but have some fun with COBOL. And I started, I was primarily on the Java app, but we would run this batch. So every day you got to get the data over to the mainframe and back, even for testing. And eventually I kind of worked my way through so that I could run that by myself. And I figured all that out. Really proud. They were totally praising me. It was like, this is wonderful. You know, <laughs> we didn't expect this of you. They had much lower expectations of somebody coming in cold. And after a couple of weeks of this, maybe a month or two, I can still remember, you know those memories that are burned, like you know exactly where you were when this happened? This is one of those memories where one of the mainframe engineers walks up, real cheery, such a nice guy, and he's like, I think today you should write some COBOL. And like it was like every I froze like that whole meme of the woman with the math equations above her head. I just I'm sitting there like wait, and I'm trying to work my way backwards from like a, a real mistake that I made, and I, I quickly get there. But I in that moment was like, what do you mean I should write COBOL? <laughs> I was like, what what have I been doing? And now I don't say anything out loud, but I, I was able to trace like oh I'm just using a UI. That's very obvious. But the complexity of when you are working through trying to figure out what you want to update just through this UI actually feels so similar to programming that I didn't even realize. Like I wasn't actually doing anything. I was just using the system. So I play it cool. I pretend like I did not think I was already writing COBOL. And this is just a random sample. They actually show me how to access the COBOL code for this mainframe system. And I kind of look through it, and I'm like, actually, OK, like this seems all right. Um, it's a little bit dark. I don't know what you can see or not see. But you can see it's similar looking to assembly. But um, you can see there's variables. So you can kind of reason about it. You're like, OK. And the task that they gave me was we just we need to update this field value uh, from this type to another type. Sure, no big deal, because we're doing a data migration. So it was this we need to update to another. So. I should have known something was up because the other mainframe engineers were all like peeking their heads over like, oh, this is interesting. We're going to have her actually go do something. And they kind of give me that task and I work through it and I'm reading. And, um, you know, I really underestimated how long in a terminal you can be scrolling because there's not much of like a UI to tell you how long the files are. But eventually I'm like, okay, I see, I see where this field structure is and I, I kind of see how you update it. So I would go update it here. Um, and it was at that point that I realized it was like a total joke to give that task to me because they were then like, yeah, that, no, you can't do that. You can't do that. You definitely cannot. Because if you update it here, you're only updating this parent value. And in fact, there's all these other values of these like children representations of that field that you need to make sure are correct. And if you miss any of them, your data migration is going to fail. So they were actually attempting to teach me <laughs> why their job was hard and why they were frustrated. And it mostly worked. And then I was like, well, well, now I know what COBOL is, apparently, after a while. But what I want to bring up, the last point I want about mainframe merges, is it's not that they are impossible. It's not that you can't do it. But it's very, very, you need to be very serious about how you're going to take this activity when you go into it. Uh, this is a fantastic, it's not a long read, something by an airline mainframe company that's an expert. Uh, and it really digs into like, okay, this is what you're gonna, this is what you're gonna run into if you're trying to merge data. And so their comment here, <laughs> the migrating the required data out is not even remotely similar to migrating data out of any other database system. They do a really good job of being to the point, uh, and that's what engineers who have not experienced mainframe systems will chronically underestimate. Uh, so a couple points here that I'll bring up briefly. But just kind of useful if you ever run into this. And if you're ever thinking about not even mainframes, legacy system merges, uh, you need to very much understand the database structure. And so mainframes, they do not have um, references. There's no like primary keys. There's nothing like that tracking data. If you have a parent-child relationship and you change the parent field, the child's not updated. If you change the child, Parents not updated. The other children are not updated. It's just all a reference. And then there's something called cop COBOL copybooks that uh, if you do not have access to that copybook when you're trying to run and compile and run uh, evaluations of the data, you're going to migrate and it's not going to be correct. It's not going to have the right 
representations. Uh, and th this is all, I just remember them, these mainframe engineers, like saying these words over and over. So if you want to check it out, uh, this, this uh, blog post is just fantastic. But this really articulates how difficult it can be to migrate mainframes together. So I have this experience. I'm now actually a COBOL programmer in some form. And what do you do? Oh, sorry, this got a little messed up. But what do you do when you see something like this? You see this merging. You see it's not, it's not going anywhere fast. <laughs> I was trying to learn COBOL. I was trying to learn MUMS. And then I was like, I need to get out of this. This is like not the life for me. So naturally, any person in this role moves into somewhere where maybe you could try something new. So I immediately run into the Capital One Labs, and they are just absolutely wonderful. Really, like tolerated my intensity, and was like, "We gotta, we gotta restart. We gotta, we gotta build another mainframe. This is insane. You wouldn't believe the horrors that I have witnessed." I've since learned it wasn't as bad as I thought, but coming in junior, I was like, "This is insane." And so I go to this lab group, and it's like, "We gotta, we gotta fix this." And somehow. There's a group of us in engineering that are like, Let, let's, <laughs> we can do this. Let's go build a new mainframe, um, which was bold, which was just an incredible, just incredible. So we start. We actually go through, and we're like, we're gonna, we're gonna try to reason about how hard can it be. We're gonna try to do accounting for your like credit cards and your bank card. That's not, that's not that bad. Uh, two, two things were important. So first, I love this XKCD. It has just like. Um, really stuck with me and like helps me when I'm when I'm trying something new and being like I'm going to be the one that's going to fix this problem this XKCD helps me a lot so two things happened when we did it one were we really solving the problem of like narrowing down the scope of uh, back-end systems and banking or were we contributing to just one more system but two we had two two pretty big assumptions that we were wrong about one the business logic is reasonably complex we uh, we built like a team, a small team of just engineers. We didn't even have a business person. <laughs> we were like, we'll figure it out. No big deal. It's a little bit of a bigger deal than we uh, assumed. And then second, the, the, there's a lot of different problems around like you need to understand um, all of this data really, really well. And eventually, I was just talking with a coworker that I worked with about this, and he reminded me we found a like 20 to 30 page like master document from somebody that had been working in mainframes for a long time. And it was essentially just like a 20 page warning label of like, are you really sure you want to do this? Because everybody's tried and everybody brings this up. And um, this post is one of like, it's, it's just incredible um, around how they've tracked just from last year, 74% of organizations fail to complete their legacy system modernization efforts. Do they need to all fail? Absolutely not. This post, I did include a piece of it, just like really roasts like um, leadership teams, like executives, which I found fun. I don't think that's the only reason, though. I think there's um, chronically underestimating how challenging it is to ensure that you fully understand a legacy system before you try to replace it, and um, just not understanding all of the resiliency that was built up over time. So often when you're in a situation like this, if you don't want to fail, there's a couple of things that you really want to pay attention to. So these are my biggest learnings. These are my biggest takeaways, both from attempting to merge mainframes and attempting to build another. The, the first piece is they are really fast. So if you want to build something that's even going to keep up with mainframes, you do in fact need to be really thoughtful both about how you're going to scale your code and how you're going to scale your architecture. Because they are fast and they don't generally fail. We've been seeing some more issues across the industry, but for the most part, they're very, very stable. They're always going to give you your answer, um, and you're just going to keep running with them. The second is this like relational way of recreating data structures, both second and third, is this really um, big surprise kind of to me around how, yes, the business logic is kind of interesting, whether it's banking and you're making accounting, or maybe it's airlines, whatever it might be. That part is interesting, and that tends to be where you're like, oh, I want to understand how this works. In reality, you need to invest a ton of time into making sure that what you're pulling from another system or what you're creating is actually going to be right all of the time. And then the fourth has been a longer learning. I didn't quite figure this out until later recently, really, is that uh, we can, I can talk a lot about code quality. And as an industry, we tend to be like, oh, this is where we got to, you know, idiomatic 
go. Some of my favorite conversations that I overheard was them talking about idiomatic COBOL. And I was like, what? <laughs> and that's like absolutely a conversation they would have, like where you have hard-coded variables. Absolutely. And that is important. But in reality, if you are building your system in such a way where you are just unlikely to make bugs, you are unlikely to introduce something that's going to reduce resiliency, that's something that's going to last for a very, very long time. Not to say that you can, the, the biggest challenge with these legacy systems is adding more features. But if you think about the fact that they truly, I worked on programs running on the mainframe that no joke were actually written in 1971. 71. And like that code was still there. Uh, and you didn't touch it because if you did, like everything, <laughs> it's like it, that's, it's there. But when you think about, I want to write code that's around for a long time. And, you know, 20 years, that'd be a delight to know that my code is something a person's like cursing out because that means it worked. That means that it provided a lot of value and was hard to get to that same scale. So that's kind of where I got after uh, like three ish, three, four years. I don't know. Now, the next phase, quote unquote, that I've got here, this is a common strategy uh, when at a corporate level and also for people dealing with legacy systems is you've done this enough. And I was like, I, this is a nightmare. <laughs> I don't like this job. So I kind of, I stop. I'm like, I, no. So I'm like, I don't want to deal with this anymore. I'm going to go work on all these other projects. And so I start moving around. I'm building like, I'm back in labs doing like newer ideas. I do some security work. I do uh, web layers of like middleware, stuff like that. Anything. I don't want to deal with this. I don't want to do mainframes. <laughs> that is until three years ago, somebody approaches me. Now, the organization that had been attempting to merge those mainframes back when I started, I left. I was like, well, I can't help you guys. This is way out of my <laughs> depth. Uh, they kept going, obviously. And they were observing the challenges that they were seeing. And so they started to say, well, what can we do what else can we do? Do we have to merge mainframe one and two? Do we have to get the data together? They have actually almost entirely completed the merge, but they realized correctly in that process how hard it is. It's not something you can easily underestimate. Uh, or actually, you can very easily underestimate it, but you shouldn't. So they start looking at this um, oversimplified pattern that I've got here around, well, what if we create a communication layer and instead of trying to change the mainframes, or instead of even trying to replace them, what we're going to do is we're going to start building pathways to talk across all these different mainframes. And we're going to make translations between them completely transparent. So if you have any systems that need to call an account that exists on one mainframe or an account that exists on another mainframe, they don't care. They're just like, That's, you figure that out. That's for the communication layer. I just need you to get me the account information from whatever mainframe it's in. And this design was brought up to me, and it was one of those, I was like, well, I, I'm, try, I'm trying to stay away from this. I'm like not sure there was like the split of like, do I want to? I want to, but where do I fall? And in my head, I was like, well, it, it, that sounds not bad. <laughs> that sounds like it could help. It sounds like it could kind of work. And then the person at the time said, well, I know you really like Go. Uh, so if you do this, you know, we'll build all the systems and go. And frankly, the idea could have been bad, and I probably would have been like, <laughs> this sounds great. Uh, so just to give some context before I move into the go section here, is I went through, partially based on this mainframe experience, I first was introduced to go while evaluating what, what language do we want to write this bank in a box that we were creating back in the day. And I had such a delightful experience creating my first APIs in Go that I just like, anybody that knew me from like, I don't know, 2015 to 2017, 2018, there I was always ready. Do you want to talk about what the best language is? Do you want to have a conversation about this language versus that language? Absolutely. I was all the time very, very into it. So um, essentially, up until the pandemic, I would I used to travel around, and in fact, I like actually brought physically with me this like really embarrassing uh, laptop that I've got, where I thought that because they were white, I could like add all these gophers and it would be very subtle. And about halfway through, I was like, this is not subtle. This is not as subtle <laughs> as I thought. And it did help me realize that I needed to like 
calm down a little bit on the language. But for years, this laptop just died. I would walk around and everybody would be like, you seem to really like the language. And it was true. But that's where I was like, okay, if you're, if you're going to let me write in Go, I have been writing some systems in Go at Capital One, but they were internal tooling or they were proof of concepts that weren't going anywhere. There were some teams, very small, but like there were a couple systems that had gone to production and Go, and I was, I was dying to get that opportunity. So I say yes, absolutely, that's fantastic. And I have this whole vision of how we're gonna go about this. Like, oh, I've been doing this mainframe stuff. I've seen all these ways that you think it's gonna be easy and it's not. So we're gonna do this right. We're gonna, we're gonna have all these trainings. We're gonna really talk about design. We're gonna talk about our data. We're gonna like have all this like great conversation about what we're trying to do, how we're gonna do it. All the engineers are gonna have like everything they need to like feel really good about their code. And that definitely did not happen. Like not very little of that happened in reality. And I felt a lot of stress for a long period of time, a lot of kind of guilt. Like I did a couple of trainings and then it was like, what? Uh, I feel like I should be doing more. So the surprise for me is actually, I'm gonna like, I'm just gonna step, uh, no, I'll, I'll keep going. So the surprise for me is I've got a couple skills in here that I learned based on this experience that are not what I would have expected to do, where I would have thought like, we've got to write really strong code immediately, or we are going to have all sorts of bugs, we're going to have all sorts of like concerns when we're launching, we're just going to become mainframe 2.0. And in reality, what I saw was after about a year, we launched and I had to have a like a moment of reflection <laughs> that was essentially like, everything's fine like it, it works like we we found some issues in non-prod the code was fine go code it was not like i wasn't gonna you know advertise it but it was totally fine and the system was scaling the system was working in fact it was it was working pretty well so a lot of this talk is around uh, i'm going to just show you a little bit more of what i'm going to cover what I would have found the most helpful, some kind of did when I was starting, but what would have been the most valuable to seed across teams, uh, especially if you are working in some sort of like legacy type environment where you're building something new, but you needed to work across specs that you may or may not fully understand. And uh, with an assumption that you probably don't have a full squad of Go teams that are just like ready to go, a bunch of experience. Because there's not, we aren't a high enough uh, volume of engineers, so you're most likely gonna have people coming from ba different backgrounds. So these four steps should hopefully help if you're in this situation or you want to be in this situation like me, where I was just, I was begging for that Go project to work on. This should help you see what you wanna invest your time in, whether you're like a lead IC like I am, or you're a director, or you're a senior, like a principal engineer. These are the things that I at least noticed that have been the most helpful um, or where people just would get the most confused. So the first step is actually evaluating what the backgrounds are of everybody across your team. So this is not an exact, I didn't really go through and like count every person, but this is very close to accurate of the number of people with prior professional Go experience <laughs> compared to those that didn't. Uh, now they were, they had professional experience in other languages, but the volume was so low. So that's where like I joined at the very beginning and that's where I just assumed like if it's me, <laughs> and there's nobody else. I was like, we're, we're, that's not a good sign. I don't feel great about this. And I was like, well, then we're, we're kind of in trouble. We're going to need to like really fix up a lot of our code. And we've added some more people with Go experience. We're actually getting more now, which is fantastic and definitely going to help with writing better code and like the, the nicer idiomatic Go code. But we have just had very few um, incidents, outages, bugs that probably would surprise you. And I'll walk through some of the areas to avoid, but just actually really speak to Go being such a strong language for learning, for teams that are learning. Where if you are hiring people who have prior engineering experience, even, you know, like just out of college or even if they're newer, uh, you're gonna see that they look at it and say, I see what I can do with this. And uh, that's what we found. So I have a couple of notes on here. It's a little bit about like different languages and so people might disagree. But this is what I saw 
trip up engineers the most when they came in from different backgrounds. So if they came in from Java, we have a lot of Java engineers, but also C Sharp a bit, where they immediately start going is they look at your system and your problem statement and they start building a bunch of interfaces. They're like, okay, so you want to connect to a database, so you're going to need like this whole section of interfaces, then you're going to have your getters, and then you're going to have like updating your data, okay, okay. And then they start building a bunch of packages and they start having a bunch of files that are in all these different packages. And that's where they start going. They're making like their little web. And it's similar to Java, but you'll see that it kind of spreads out. And then all of a sudden, you're like, so where is that code? <laughs> and that's where, that's where they focus. Um, and now in Python and JavaScript, where I've seen it took me a bit to realize that's what was kind of happening, they would uh, get very, they would say, oh, I like this speed. This is cool. I, I, that's nice. It is faster than what I was using before. But they would say, they would say like, oh, what do you mean? I'm going to write out all the fields? and like their data types, <laughs> and they're all like, no, 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 I don't, I don't want to do that. Uh, and they just are like, mm. I know we're talking about generics and they will be helpful, but I, I would see consistently people with Python and JavaScript backgrounds be like, I don't, I don't like the sound of this. This is going to take forever. And then Ruby and functional programmers had a, generally had a hard time with both interfaces. They'd want a bunch of interfaces and they would want few validations of their data. Um, and then everybody, no matter what your background, frankly, even if you've been writing Go, everybody um, really focuses on writing libraries in different forms. Everybody has like a new idea of how they could make a library uh, because Go doesn't have like the sheer volume of libraries in other languages. So you immediately have that like, I'll go build one. And everybody wants to add concurrency. So what I'm going to do for the next couple sections is walk through where I saw these people, whether they actually came from this background or just would get stuck. But these are the places where I would see programmers kind of deviate from idiomatic Go and start doing their own kind of setups. And uh, it was frustrating at first to watch and feel like, oh, this is, this is not great. And then it was actually really validating to realize it's not that big of a problem. We can pull back. We can refactor. Uh, and that's, that's essentially what you can hopefully train on if you're in a similar situation. But before I dig in, I really want to bring up um, back to Grace Hopper with the mainframe. If people, I don't know if people caught this, but she's the one sitting next to Howard on this picture. And a lot of people know her. She's reasonably famous. Uh, was Technically did not create COBOL. She created a theoretical language before, but was the advisor for COBOL and was heavily guiding on uh, write something that humans can read, make this readable. And I found at one point a quote. I should have looked for it. But uh, I loved it. It was like a really serious quote of, why would anybody want to write in COBOL? They can just write in assembly. Like, what? Who needs that? This is, they're not real engineers. If you're a real engineer, you're going to write in assembly. And you can see it a lot in programming. So then it became COBOL and C. Why are you writing in C? You need, you need a header file? <laughs> Please. Uh, they did need header files, like it's very helpful compared to COBOL. But they would have this debate about like, oh, you shouldn't have that. And then you see it with C in all of these languages today and similar across different languages. And the major point in what I saw when I saw these people with different backgrounds come in to working with Go uh, wasn't so much that like, oh, you shouldn't do that language. If you're a real engineer, you would use Go. I, I haven't really heard that sentiment. But more that... Um, by using a language that actually is pretty agnostic in experience levels, so you're gonna, you can bring in people with a Java background, you can bring in people with a Python, JavaScript, Ruby background, and they are all going to have things to learn to write great Go code, but it's all reasonably similar and it's all reasonably manageable. It actually means you can start creating these teams with more confidence. You are going to want to make sure you've got a couple people uh, with production Go experience. I would recommend a few more people than what we had in our project, but as long as you've got enough people that can make sure to be guiding, you're going you're gonna to see pretty decent code and you're definitely going to see it's functional. You're not going to see like issues of bugs of like it's broken. Uh, so this is like, I just love that Grace Hopper really pushed this whole, like, it's okay. Use whatever language is the best for you and the best for your systems. Um, and I wanted to share that before coming in the last part. So these are some of, besides language background, these are some of the things I kind of look for when I'm working with an engineer to see kind of where their perspective is and where they're coming from and what they're going to be thinking about when they're writing code. Because a lot, all of this is actually really important when you're working with legacy systems or 
next to them or replace whatever. Uh, so there's four kind of things I'm watching. One's area is like, have they been working in production with customers? So have they gone through that exercise of like, all right, you got to be deploying. You have to make sure it actually works. If you do not, <laughs> somebody's going somebody's gonna to yell. Um, or maybe have they been working in internal systems? Because if you've been working in internal, you tend to have a longer buffer for, oh, it's OK. We'll just um, try again. <laughs> We're just bothering our own employees. On the flip side, there's this nuance around new development and legacy systems. And if you are trying to modernize anything, both of these skills are incredibly valuable and incredibly useful. And most people are not going to have both. Most of them will have kind of a mix. But when I say legacy systems, that can include uh, maintenance work, which is very common. People that have had already established systems, and they were contributing features onto it. So it could be a mix. It, this can fall in between. But you could just be saying, like, OK, here's your setup. Follow this template, and you're going to launch something. And you're not going to get the experience of, OK, I'm telling you to go create something that didn't exist before. And the thing that exists right now is frustrating but very functional. And your thing also now needs to be not frustrating and functional. And uh, all of those four skills are helpful to kind of see where the engineer is at, see what's going to freak them out, see what's going to make them stressed. And then you can use that to evaluate how you guide them towards strong Go production systems. So the next section. So this is probably my biggest learning that if I could just go back to the start, I would probably just start on these couple topics, pro frankly, even just the top two. Maybe, probably the third, probably all three. But either way, what I would go through in like a minimum viable training course, and what I mean by that is you're trying to give them enough training that they can go be productive. You don't want to give so much training that they're just like, I don't know. I don't know what to do. Like what, That was a lot. <laughs> I feel like I need to go read a textbook. Uh, they should. If they want to read the textbook, it'll be very helpful. But you want to make sure they don't feel like they have to go get like a minor or like a degree and go to be productive. And you also want to watch like how much rework is this going to take later? And is the rework something that we can just release as we're going? Or is the rework something where we're going to need to kind of really step back and say, how do we want this service operating? Worst case, do we need to start over? type conversation. And then the bottom two are probably the most helpful that I saw, where you just kind of want to encourage learning and testing and drafting. Because a lot of times people, engineers, I've felt this, feel a lot of pressure to get it right the first time. And like you, that's not how programming works. You're going to write your code. I, I write my code. To, it's functional. And now I'm going to go refactor it. And what I've found over time as I've gotten more senior is it's not so much that I just like spit out the right code immediately the first time. Sometimes, sure, if I've done it recently. But a lot of times, uh, what I've done is I've just gotten faster at going from this is functional to this is, this is idiomatic. This is something that I can explain all the types and stuff like that. So what I've really focused on is encouraging that kind of cycle of iteration. So that's kind of what I would focus on when training a new org. If they don't have a lot of Go experience, I would watch and see where, where I can help them out. Now the first piece. So this is just straight copied from my absolute favorite in the entire world reference for Go. And it is the wiki page for Golang uh, code review comments. I'm going to just throw this out there. I do not know why it's so hard to Google for this page. But if somebody can fix the SEO on it, it would be phenomenal. Because this is. Uh, I actually like was looking at it this week. I haven't read it in a minute. I think they've added some more stuff to it, but it's probably like 13 to 15 pages if you print it out, and it just it just hits. All of these comments are very very valuable. If you go through and read them multiple times, you're going to start learning things about what do we mean about idiomatic go. And you're probably not gonna if you're coming in cold, you're gonna be like I I don't know like th that's nice. But when you read when you write code and read it again and write code and read it again and you hear somebody say oh, you're going to want to do this or that, and go read it again, things will start making sense. So interfaces. This one is the first thing I would focus on. And it was actually, uh, pat myself, it was the thing I did focus on at the start. I was like, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. We, gotta, we have to define these interfaces decently between systems. Um, and what this code shows, first of all, love that they put in all caps in a comment, do not do it. Hilarious, just incredible, whoever wrote this. But what they're saying here is they're saying, this is common in a lot of languages, definitely common in Java, is when you're making a class, you're going to define an interface that has every single method listed. You're just going to let, these are all the methods that you could use. 
And it kind of looks nice. It kind of looks like, it sort of reminds you of like C header files, but it's just a list of things you can do. Uh, and you're like, look, it's like my home page of like, these are all the methods for my interface. Fine. That's actually in no way, shape, or form valuable for the consumer. You've just, you just, why not just make the whole thing public? You just listed all your methods. And what it forces the consumer to do of your package is every time they want to create something, that you've defined, they need to define every single method that you listed. And it's actually very annoying. Uh, and so what Go is bringing up in this section is don't do that, don't do that. Actually just, just have your methods as a part of this thing that they've defined. And then at the consumer level, they're gonna, they're gonna define the interface. So you see that top right section, they just say, hey, this is the interface for Thinger, you're gonna call this method thing, Wonderful, everything is fantastic. And then what you see here, you see consumer.go, consumer.test. What you've allowed the consumer to do here is define their own um, alternative packages that are the same interface as your package, but it only has the methods that they care about. So you have just saved them an incredible amount of time. Say I am writing a system that all I want it to do is add values into the database. I do not want it to delete. I do not want it to update. I don't want it to do any of those things. I'm going to define a consumer interface that it just only lets you add. And so what that will tell programmers who come in after me is you can't delete even if you want to. Yes, certainly. If you're writing to a database, they all have ways to delete uh, data inside of there. But I don't want you to do that here in this code. And that's what this is getting at. And so when people start to understand this, they start to see some of the freedom in interface design. Uh, and they start to see how they can set up their systems to be very specific and intentional and clear about what they want to be doing at their consumer level. Now, the second thing that I will be bringing up is around typing. So this is the one where programmers come in from uh, untyped languages or things that just sort of let you flip around between all your types. And they say, I'm sorry, what? I just want to save this into their database. I just want to like, I just, I just want to get it in. And uh, there's actually some content from Bill Kennedy that's like incredibly, he, he tends to open his courses with this and have resonated well with me and really resonate with like all the mainframe learnings from earlier around uh, the entire job of software engineering, generally speaking, is taking data from one location, transforming it and saving it somewhere else or getting it to another person. Like that's, that's kind of the job. And a lot of times when you start saying, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna throw the data around. What you end up with is very much like a mainframe type scenario where you have all these references to data and you have no idea what's gonna be used where. So um, the thing to think about that I've seen kind of calm down engineers when they're in this situation is to not think of it as a massive list of fields that you need to like, all of them are different, they're all unique, you're really like, oh Jesus, this is frustrating. And think of it more like, this is a JSON representation, in many cases, that's what we do. Um, there's only so many data types. You can have an int, you can have a string, you can have a Boolean, you can have a collection, but there's only so many things you need to be working with. And breaking your structures down more programmatically tends to help them see that they can actually work through definitions quickly um, get all these validations going and feel very confident that their data is really uh, correct and safe at the end of the day. So, oh man, I got a bunch to talk about. All right, I'm gonna like speed through a couple of these slides. The last thing I'm gonna bring up is uh, library development. I'm just gonna bring in this section. Um, a piece that comes up if you're in a larger company and you do not have well-established Go practices is everybody's gonna say, build me the libraries that we've got for Java, that we've got for Python. I need you to just, just make the same libraries. We already got it for Java, we must have it for Go. And on the flip side, newer engineers, they're gonna say, I, I need to write this library because um, I'm writing code and you know, nobody else should have to write this code, we'll make a library. And a huge opportunity here, when you're, if you're new, if, you, if your Go is not a well-established language at your company, is to really rely on your senior engineering level to think through, how do I learn from the libraries we've created in the past? And how do I ensure that uh, when we create libraries, we're being very diligent to make sure that it's good quality and we've done enough testing in it. So I just encourage relying on those people there. Um, all right, testing and code review. Man, I want to talk about everything for a very long time. 
I'll speed through this. This is a cool one. This just talks about systematics. This is the mainframe system that I worked on. Uh, again, it's a program that's installed on these mainframes. And this is from a couple years ago, but like it's, it's still in use today. It's, it's pretty popular. One thing when I worked with these systematics engineers that they would talk about was when they were creating this. Like they worked at, some of them worked at this company back in like the 90s and 80s. They said the quality of code, the care that everybody put into it, uh, into the system back then was so high that uh, there was never a doubt that everybody, every engineer really understood what they were building and why the data needed to look a certain way. And that's what built something that lasted for so long. So I'm going to highlight just a couple of the things that are really, really valuable in breaking down testing. We will probably reference it throughout this conference, but testing tables, fantastic, really, really helpful. Defining your testing tables to look like the function definitions that you're calling is actually really helpful. So thinking about it like you've got your input and your output to whether it's a function, whether it's a handler, you want to define your testing table to look a lot like the function you're calling. Uh, that tends to simplify things and make it really clear for input and output and validations. And I've seen programmers build tests a lot more quickly with that. Now, the last part, though, is a, a really good sign. You want to like a smell, kind of. Is your, and I've done this. You're building test tables. They're getting pretty long. Now you're trying to build, like you're trying to do data validations. You're trying to check if your dependencies are working. You're trying to check if um, your business logic is working. That tends to mean that you want to split up that function. And it's a great way to start writing more idiomatic Go code is to see when your testing tables are like trying to test a bunch of things at once. And if that's happening, see where you can split things out, see where you can simplify uh, and, and, sh and shrink down the scope of a function. It's a really good place to look for. The last thing I'm going to bring up about testing and code review, so I, I would personally, I just consider this like the poor person's code review. So you've got a, a ton of code reviews that you want to do. You'd love to do all of them. You know you can't. What are you going to check for that's most impactful? Uh, I tend to do like, I'll, I'll kind of line up like 15 minute reviews to see like if I could just check through and, see, and notice anything, uh, whether it's actually a bug or just like you consider this or that. Uh, these are the things that I'm looking for in order. And I'm going to just move to the next slide. What's nice about this is you can actually kind of split. A lot of times you have two code reviewers. If you are, I tend to work with engineering managers. And what we'll try to do is have the engineering manager more focused on the use cases and saying, have you tested all of the ways that our system could actually be used? I'm more focused on the code quality. We're both looking for both. But it makes it in a way where we've got two eyes, and we're kind of specializing on different areas, and it makes the code review less overwhelming and faster to do. You can do this with anybody. But I have found this to just having a checklist of the minimum stuff I'm going to look for be really helpful. Now, finally, I'm just going to show a couple of pieces of what we've built, and I'll just kind of end on where we've gone. So this got formatted when I changed to Keynote, weirdly. But this is what we are actually building. So when I talk about mainframe scale, you have to get all these daily updates for every single account that's gone through, every single transaction. Uh, we do not have incredibly high volumes of traffic going through 24-7 yet. It's going to get higher over time, but it's still not overwhelming. The interesting part about banking, as you guys know, you spend your money and then you are in like a, it's like in process and pending. And then the next day it updates to be, it's good. What's happening there is you're going through the Federal Reserve, you're checking if like money transferred between all these people. So what we get is essentially like this big dump of all the updates. Like, okay, we've processed, update everything now. And what we want to do is do it as quickly as you can. So we see, um, I'm just going to, yeah, I'm going to skip towards the end. Actually, I don't have it all in there. So we've seen up to about like five gigabytes per second come through every day that we're trying to process as quickly as we can to update all of our systems. And that creates this interesting load that we've got to handle. And the piece that I will end on, <laughs> I guess, is uh, I fully expected when building this system that at some point I was going to need to like slow down the team and be like, OK, I need a couple days. We're going to need to refactor and add in some concurrency because at some point we're not going to scale. And to my like disappointment, that didn't happen. We actually just scaled. And in fact, where we saw issues had nothing to do with our Go code, and it had a lot to do with our infrastructure. They are not bad issues, but it had to do with like, <laughs> we're going to slam you with a bunch of data. So the load balancers actually have a certain level of capacity that uh, they allocate. 
And if you start, this is our traffic pattern, so you can kind of see we've got some real-time data going through, reasonable volume, and then we've got every single update that's coming for every single account across Capital One. And what you see is like, okay, here's everything happening. And uh, learn some cool tricks around how to scale the load balancer, not particularly hard, but you need to do it. You're gonna see that at your database level. You're also going to see, what we've found is we've seen it when dealing with other people's systems, like in the company, way more than our own, which is kind of disappointing when you're like, oh, I really wanted to like go through and add this. Uh, but also really fantastic from a language standpoint that you do, you often don't have to add concurrency. You will sometimes, but you tend to not. Uh, and my tip here, though, is if you do not have advanced performance testing systems, that's actually a very fun, you'll probably want concurrency built in there, um, thing that you can build that will be really, really valuable and help you out. So the final thing I want to bring up is um, this is sometimes what our traffic patterns look like. So we'll just kind of see tons of requests. And the request volumes themselves are not that high, but the volume of data coming through can be incredibly large. And I remember pulling up production and seeing that this was our traffic pattern and being like, oh, no, like this, what was this? And the like uh, pause to realize that like actually everything was perfectly fine. Didn't matter. We we were nobody was getting alerted to anything. This was just like absolutely what we can scale to. It was really comforting. And at this point in time, over the last like year ish, uh, we've gotten over 33 million requests, and we've processed. Um, I was hoping we were at the petabyte scale, only at 841 terabytes of data, but we're getting pretty close. And that's just what we've been running so far in this system, all written in Go. And the last. Uh, bigger thing I wanted to bring up is we did in fact shut down one of our mainframes back in June, which was like my personal, like I was real excited to do it. There's a bunch more to do. But just based on um, scaling up the systems, writing them all through, had a lot of success. Okay, so the last tiny, tiny things I'm just going to mention. First, really quickly, I really want to say hi to my mom. Uh, she's watching this, she's not an engineer, but she's actually got really sick over the last month and she's watching this from a hospital where she just had chemo treatment this week. So I wanna say hi to her and if anybody's watching and you want to just say like, hi mom, I think she would really appreciate it. She was so excited, she kept saying like, you gotta do this, you can still go through with all of it. And she, I think she's just loving seeing everything that we're doing in engineering. Uh, you can say hi mom to my mom or your mom, whoever's around. Uh, and I, but the final couple updates is we were talking about this last night, and I was like, I'm pretty sure you can write Go on mainframes. If you can't, you could. It's just not <laughs> supported. And I went and looked, and like for sure, we could definitely be writing Go systems um, on IBM's mainframes today. So just throwing that out there for anybody who wants to do that, I would be interested. And in fact, next September. There's like a actually pretty legit looking conference in Philly. So if you are interested in these like mainframe modernization <laughs> efforts, it's alive. There's a lot of people engaged. Uh, and I'm so excited and happy to be here. I hope uh, this was helpful for some of you. And uh, if you have questions, if you have ideas, if you just want to talk about legacy development, I would be thrilled to. And I will just end on this final one of my favorite quotes from Grace Hopper, where uh, they said, you know, computers would only do arithmetic. That's what they said when they launched mainframes, like we're just gonna use it for math. And she really looked at that and said, I think we can do a lot more here, which I find fun and I hope happens for a lot of you in your careers, but that's everything. Thank you. And I will hopefully see you guys all on Discord. Awesome. Yeah. Hi, mom. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Kaylin's mom. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Kaylin. Um, this was a, there's a lot of uh, um, awesome takeaways uh, from from your talk, and uh, and yeah, it's 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 something I'm looking forward. Yeah, to. You're not alone. There were people talking about mainframes. So Seriously, there, yeah. there, there, there is more than just fire. you. Yeah, yeah, and yes, GoBall is getting generic. So you're just gonna have to use a lot of redefines. Yep. I saw a couple <laughs> mainframe startups getting started. So <laughs> you, you inspired that. <laughs> so yeah. next up, um, we're gonna have lightning talks hosted by Mark Bates, and I just want to highlight like how much of uh, like an integral part of GopherCon, the lightning talks have been, mm -hmm. and it's... And Mark has put in a, a super huge amount of work to make these amazing. Every They're year. Really gonna be, yep. They are every year, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there's, there's always really, really amazing talks. It's a great opportunity, as we kind of talked about in the opening, for you to dip your toes into things or to try out new material before you write a bigger talk on. Yep. 
And so I just, you know, I, I can't thank Mark enough for doing this for us every year. Thank you. And if you tell him I said nice things about him, I will deny it, I swear. <laughs> we love you, Mark. Yeah. We love you, Mark. Yeah. All I right, want to so do a quick mention of the VMS, the virtual meeting spaces. you got to go on the platform, gophercon.com, to sign up for these. It's free. It's just part of the platform. We've got Brad talking about a financial services lake house. And we've got two uh, sessions from Microsoft, one about Azure for Go developers, the other about gRPC. Feel free to jump into those. You can jump in there in the lightning talks and switch back and forth if you want to see both. Totally fine. That's all for me. That's my spiel. All so. right. Now I got to go wash my mouth out for saying nice things about Mark. <laughs> right, take it away, Mark. <laughs>
and we write a function get leaderboard from Redis cache. We pre-cache the leaderboard page in Redis. It's a simple uh, get by key for the leaderboard. Uh, we can't just cache the main leaderboard, however, uh, because we have permut permutations of leaderboard by language, by hireable badge, by country flag, and we have up to 100 pages of each of these permutations. Each per permutation is 100, about 140 kilobytes, so uh, times 622 languages times 250 countries, times 100 pages. That's a total of two terabytes of data that we have to cache. Uh, thankfully, we can compress that down, though, to about 24 kilobytes per page. Uh, but still, that's uh, about 363 gigabytes of data that we have to cache. 300 gigabytes is much more than that 16 gigabytes of RAM we have. So. Um, on our on our DigitalOcean droplet here, the RAM that we have available won't be enough to cache all of those leaderboards. So what do we do? Uh, we could upgrade to a two thousand dollar per month instance that gives us uh, two hundred fifty six gigs of RAM, but our three hundred and seventy three gigabyte data set still won't fit in that two hundred fifty six gigabytes of RAM. So the solution is something called SSDB. SSDB is a drop-in replacement for Redis that uses disk space instead of RAM to store your data set. SSDB uses LevelDB but from Google, but it uh, can also use Facebook's fork of um, a LevelDB called uh, RocksDB. And LevelDB and RocksDB use uh, SS table key value library um, or key value table that uh, is written by Google based on Bigtable. And using um, an SS table, you can, as, uh, SSDB is able to look up keys on disk with a single seek. So it makes it its performance on par with Redis actually. So now we can use this uh, storage optimized instance from DigitalOcean for $155 per month instead of 2000. And it comes with 450 gigabytes of SSD and VME storage, uh, plenty of room for our 300 gigabyte data set. And we just saved uh, about $1,800 per month by uh, not using Redis. And because SSDB works with your existing Redis clients, you don't need to update any code. You just change the IP address of, of your server uh, and point it to the SSDB instead of Redis, and nothing else needs to change. There are some limitations, however, uh, with SSDB. Uh, there are and some differences between SSDB and Redis. Uh, so SSDB can only um, expire uh, simple keys. Uh, actually, let me start with the with. There's no Lewis uh, function support. Uh, there are some command changes, uh, like some. Commands are renamed uh, ZAD and ZSET and some others um, as well. And uh, the the most probably the most cumbersome thing is that um, SSDB can only expire simple key value strings, uh, not HMAP or lists. But you can always uh, manually delete them uh, with one command, uh, same as Redis. So um, bearing in mind those limitations, uh, there it's it's SSDB is very uh, simple to configure. It has less config op options than Redis, and therefore it's it's extremely simple to set up. Uh, just make sure to increase your Linux machine's file max so settings so the SSDB can open enough sockets and file handles to be performant. And also remember to run the SSDB CLI compact command to reclaim disk space from deleted or expired keys. And I've uh, included a handy one-liner one -liner for that compact command here that uh, makes it easy to run from a con script because normally it blocks on user input. Uh, but this, this gets around that, so you can run it automated. Uh, that's, those are, these are the two things you have to remember with SSDB. And if you're wondering if using SSDB instead of RAM or SSDs instead of RAM, SSDB actually performs better on average than Redis when writing keys and about the same when reading. 
And uh, that's that's it for me. And uh, thank you for having me. And uh, mic drop. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Alan. Uh, that's the virtual mic drop for you. <laughs> Love it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I'm definitely going to be checking that out. Okay, so let's bring up our very next speaker, Marcus. Yes, hello. Hey, how are you? You can hear me then, I take it? Yes, I can, definitely. Fantastic. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Oh, I can't complain. I'm it's gopher con. <laughs> I know, There's nothing right? Nothing to complain about. So where are you I'm joining us from? I am calling in from Aarhus in Denmark. Denmark. Awesome. Yes. Interesting. Right. And you're going to be talking about HTML components? Yes, exactly. That's HTML far out of my pay grade, so I'm going to let you talk <laughs> about that. Go for it. I know, right. Right. So, yeah, this is my lightning talk about HTML components in Go or why I sometimes miss React. Um, because the thing is, I really like React. I've been a full stack developer for a long time. Um, I've been working yeah, with JavaScript, uh, doing web UIs, and what we all know and love. Um, there are two reasons, main reasons, why I really like React. And none of them are actually technological. Um, so the first thing is the mental model. It's just nice that it's so, it's so simple. It's uh, quite elegant um, makes, yeah, it's uh, easy to be productive in it, but also it's really easy to communicate to team members about how you put these components together in the front end, um, how you compose them together to build a greater whole, whether, whether you're building a web UI or an application or whatever. So the second reason is the ecosystem. So no matter what component you really need, you can fire up your favorite search engine and then try to look up um, yeah, whatever component you need and find something pretty quickly and then basically um, get it running uh, with a fairly high uh, percentage of uh, yeah, probability. So that's why I really like React. Um, but now I'm a Go developer, right? So how, how do I do this in Goland instead? So I've been writing Go since uh, 2016 now. Um, and I was really missing that way of writing components. So I thought to myself, well, I'm a developer. I could do something about this. So of course I did. So I'm introducing components. Of course, this is a word play between components and Go. And if you look closely, there's a tiny bit of DOM in there. So pretty good. Oh, and then wait a minute. So let's go back to my uh, reasons for why I like React and how does it, this apply to components? Well, one thing is it's the same mental model. So it's all compon uh, components that are composable. It's the same idea, basically. Uh, you can build these components together until you have a web UI that you're satisfied with. So, and the basic premise is that you have some data that you put in and you want some HTML out, right? So that's what we, that's how we build our UIs. Um, so in components, the components, they are just Go functions. Um, and I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but before that, a little disclaimer. When I'm talking about this, this is all the classic web or whatever you want to call it. So server-side rendered components that are from the classic uh, request response cycle. So there's nothing fancy about WebAssembly or anything going on in the browser. This is all just, we want to generate some HTML, do one thing and do it well. So with that said, uh, let's have a look at some code. So we have our imports, of course, we import the package components. And then also you'll notice I'm using a dot import for the HTML uh, package inside components. So I know this is generally frowned upon, but bear with me for a second. So here we have our actual function, uh, the component, which is an app in this case. So as you see, it's a, as a, it's a Go function that we know and love. And it returns something called a node. And I'll get back to what it, that is exactly. But it returns this nav thing with a class, uh, an ordered list, some list items, some links uh, that have an href attribute and some text in them. So basically, if you can read HTML, you can pretty much read this as well. Um, so, but this, um, this is only one component uh, with some HTML components underneath. So how does this look when we refactor a bit? So let's take our navbar and um, extract the navbar item. So basically the, the list item, um, and then add some properties, the data in and the HTML out I was speaking about earlier. 
So nothing, there's nothing really surprising about any of this. If, if you've ever written React, this is basically how you would do it as well. Um, so yeah, so now you have navbar and an fbar item, two components. Let's have a look at a slightly more complex example. So we have uh, some authentication going on, maybe. Uh, we have a locked in parameter that we pass to an fbar component, as well as a current path on where we are in our web app. So we can use the if function that's also provided by components, which is a really simple function that just takes an expression. And then uh, if that uh, expression is true, you basically return the component. And if not, you don't. So you get these nice inline uh, declarative ways of describing components. Um, also, another helper is the classes helper, which is basically a map from CSS um, classes to, uh, again, a Boolean expression. And if that's true, the class gets included. If not, it doesn't. So pretty simple like that. So how does this render to wh whoever is viewing it? Well, also, again, our basic HTTP handlers that we all know and love from the Go ecosystem. So in this case, it's we have our response writer, W. We have a home page component. And we call render on it and then pass it that writer. And that's basically it. Of course, in this case, it returns an error. But as you remember, you should always just ignore errors. So this node interface I was speaking about earlier, what does it do? Well, it's really simple, like most uh, good interfaces in Go. So it has one function in it. It's called render. It takes a writer, and it returns an error. And that's basically it. So if you want to do a, a component, uh, you have to implement this interface, and that's it. And of course, in components itself, as you saw, a lot of the HTML elements and attributes are already included for you, so you don't have to write them yourself. If there's anything there that's not included, then you can use some functions for that as well. So basically, so there are some uh, other helpers as well. Map uh, for mapping data to components, group for grouping elements, raw uh, for injecting HTML, and textf for string interpolation, and some other stuff as well. So. The ecosystem is uh, components and hero icons uh, is something I created. So icons are by the excellent Steve Sugar of Table and CSS fame. Um, but yeah, this is something I built. And of course, I can't build all the components myself. So this is where you come in. I'd really like for components to take off and then people start building these components. So if you want to join in on the fun, go to gomponents.com. Uh, check it out, uh, download it, have a go at it, try it out. Uh, publish whatever you find, and that's basically it. So yeah, thank you very much. This was a talk by me. You can find me on Twitter, Marcus RGW, and I also build online Go courses at golang.dk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcus. That was awesome. I told you it was going to be above my pay grade. Uh, HTML, it, it ain't what it was when I started doing it in 99, kids. That's actually 96. Sorry. Anywho. Getting ahead of myself there, making myself a little younger than I actually am. All right, so enough about me. Let's bring up our next presenter, Tom. Tom, you there? Hi there, Mark. How are you doing? Okay. All right, and yourself? Very good here. Yeah, fantastic. I'm fantastic. Where are you joining us from? I'm joining from Zurich in Switzerland. Switzerland, yes, so you can tell by the accent. <laughs> I'm British, actually, but I've been here for a few years. Nice, nice. Awesome. And you're going to be talking about chez moi, is that correct? Yeah, you got the pronunciation right. You're French. <laughs> I, have, I have no idea what that is, but why don't you let us know? Thank you very much. Go for it, Tom. Cool. Thank you very much, Mark. So, hi, I'm Tom Payne. I'm a developer at Isovalent, but this is a personal project called chez moi. This is French for at my house. It's a dot file manager, and it's only been made possible by Go. And basically, if Go didn't exist, Shamer wouldn't have been successful. So this is interesting if you're writing uh, CLI applications for users and you want to get them uh, into as many users' hands as possible. Firstly, what is Shamer? It's a cross-form platform dot file manager, your dot files, your config files, the Git, Bash, ZSH, Vim, whatever. It generates them for a single source of truth across a massive range of platforms. With multiple install methods, it's super secure. You can store your secrets in your password manager so they never appear in your, in your .files repo. You can encrypt whole files using GPG and Aggie. And it's become really popular. And this popularity is really thanks to uh, the decisions that the Go team have made. It's got 5.4K stars on GitHub, 87 contributors. The link there is you need to check it out, github.com slash tloop. Shame what? Paying. Shame what? Why should you use it? And it gives you, enables you to maintain a familiar customized environment 
all the things, all the effort you've put into configuring your tools, you can now have that across multiple diverse machines, whether it's your home laptop, your work development machine, uh, a Windows box. And what we're seeing at the moment is that although we'll hang on to our laptops for a long time, we're increasingly developing in ephemeral environments like GitHub code spaces or uh, dev containers. And it's really nice to be able to bring in all that work you've done setting up your, your system into a, into a new system very quickly with a single uh, single command or from a single controlled uh, version control branch so you get backups and history and all sorts. This is a graph of Shamar's popularity. It's the yellow line here you can, uh, compared to the other top four dot file managers at the moment. And you can see that in three years, it's gone from nothing to being the number one dot file manager. And I think it's only possible because of Go. How is Go? Like, brought real advantages to users. The first thing is makes it really easy for users to install. This decision from your Go authors to have a single static link binary is massive. There's no language runtime you have to install. Imagine having to install Python or Ruby from scratch on the machine, particularly if you don't have root. There's no dependencies. Actually, everything gets built into the binary. So it's just a single file that you can copy on within curl, SCP, whatever. Uh, Go Embed allows us to um, include lots of other files and the Shamar uses it for documentation. So even though I'm distributing a single binary, there's a Shamar docs command that gives you all the documentation embedded in. The cross-platform by design, the Go authors, so really supporting Windows as a first-class citizen is a fa fantastic win because most doc file managers don't run on Windows. Um, Windows is very different from the classic Unix systems, but thanks to Go's efforts to include Windows, we get first class dot class dot file manager on Windows too. And Go's text, tem uh, text template library is fast becoming the standard for configuring uh, many systems now, particularly on te templating YAML. But also, it's not just for users, it makes it really possible for developers, it makes it an easy project to contribute to. The high quality platform standard library means it's just less that I work that you have to do as a developer to get cross-platform uh, compatibility. An interesting thing as well, compared to other languages like Rust or Python, the concurrency built into the language means that all the Go libraries are compatible. They all use the same concurrency primitives. In contrast with Python, where you have to choose between Gevent uh, twist or Twisted or in, uh, in Rust, which version of async, whatever you're using, they fragment the, the ecosystem. But Go doesn't suffer from that. Of course, you've got excellent cross-compilation, um, there's some fantastic tools from the community. I want to particularly highlight TestScript, um, which is actually pulled out of the Go internals project, which is this fantastic integration testing, a project called Go Releaser, which if you're distributing your Go binaries, it builds you packages for everything. It's, it's absolutely brilliant. Go check it out. But nothing I've sort of observed with when Lonely Show Mile is that it's not just uh, shared libraries that matter. It's also the tools that you might have to depend on. Um, so, for example, Shamar allows you to encrypt whole files with Aggie, which is a new GPG-like uh, encryption tool. But rather than re relying on an age binary, as these things are, as this is distributed as a Go library, I can embed this directly into Shamar. Similarly for Git, thanks to the great Go Git project, you don't even need to install Go Git. Oh, sorry, you don't need to install Git on your machine to be able to check out your Git repo. And if you're this I'd like to encourage people as a pattern to use that. If you're building a command line tool, please do make a library version of it so that others can embed here and avoid those, uh, those dependent on external binaries. That's it, very quick, the lessons I want you to take home. If you wanna get, build a popular tool to get maximum user reach, you wanna minimize your external dependencies. You can make your tool available as a library. And of course, please do go check out Shamar. Thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you very much, Tom. I appreciate it. It was wonderful. Uh, uh, yeah, just to double down on something Tom said, I agree. Make your CLIs available as importable libraries. Um, I was just telling some of my students last week that exact same uh, advice. Make it, make it so that us tool developers don't have to have dependencies and external binaries. That was an excellent talk. So up next, we have Yuri. Yuri, are you with us? Hi, Marek. Hey, how you doing? I'm OK. And you? <laughs> I'm, I'm doing great. It's GopherCon. <laughs> yeah, awesome. <laughs> where always. are you joining? Exactly, where are you joining us from? Yeah, I'm joined from Krakow. It's in Poland. 
Oh, very nice. Yes, exciting. And you're going to be talking to about customer, about doing front end work. Is that right? Yep, right. Oh, mm. all you people in the front end work. Okay, you're far, yeah. far, far better than I am. Go for it. Okay, thanks. So, hi, everyone. Today, I'd like to present the library named Kyoto. It's an SSR first go front end library. And if it's not so interesting for you, feel free to take a cup of coffee during these seven minutes. So, uh, but first, um, uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Yuri Zinitz. I'm software developer uh, at Akamai, but also a core developer of uh, Broker One real estate platform on part time. And uh, the overall story I'm going to tell is actually related to Broker One development process. So, um, before I start to talk about uh, Kyoto itself, it's really important to know backstory because we are not creating technologies for technologies, but for solving different problems. So, long story short, in the beginning of the platform creation, we decided to create a prototype first. We took a well-known JavaScript framework with a set of ready-to-use material components. And uh, as usually happens, the prototype became the main project. <laughs> Uh, over the time, we began to feel the impact of this decision. Uh, it was uh, hard to keep uh, overall project set up clean and tidy. We had a lot of difficulties with SSR, memory leaks on server side, and the uh, performance score issues. Uh, we completely lost control. And uh, after this discussion, our team decided to drop this prototype and uh, go more in uh, go um, in more traditional way, use template engine. And um, so why did we choose such a radical way? Uh, we had several reasons. Uh, unnecessary complexity was one of those reasons. Uh, not many people really understand how their project setup works under the hood. Uh, we pack with tons of configurations, Babel, tree shaking, lazy loading, and uh, especially when it's not work as expected. You need to bring a significant runtime and the virtual DOM just to render a simple things like articles or pages with minimal dynamic behavior. Template Senchain reduces overall complexity and allows uh, taking full control over front end. Also, this approach reduces amount of bugs and quirks because we had um, we can find uh, most of the problems on uh, building and testing stages and. Um, so uh, our project became much better with uh, this migration, but we faced some common inconveniences. We have started to use more copy-paste. Uh, our handlers became a spaghetti because of asynchronous API and database requests. Uh, and we all have to admit vanilla, G, uh, vanilla JavaScript is quite verbose for simple dynamic things. That's why Kyoto was born. And, uh, we are going further. Uh, so uh, what uh, Futures Kyoto provides? Um, how it solves these issues? First issue I solved is called organization structure. For each page and component, you have separate Go structure and template definition. You can include data fetching and display logic just right inside the component. Second thing I provided is page rendering lifecycle. This allowed me to solve asynchronous calls issue. You can implement asynchronous method for components, and it will be and it will be called with own Go routine under the hood on page rendering. As an example, you have ten instances of the component on the page. In that situation, ten Go routines will be created for each asynchronous call. And the most interesting thing in this library I've implemented is a built-in dynamic functionality inspired by Hotwire and Laravel Livewire. It's pretty simple and limited because it's created for simple things, but uh, people really liked it, and I'm extending functions over the time. And um, as the project has solidified its core idea, I'm able to make some plans for the future. We are already working on UI kit based on Tailwind UI and already using it for our internal tools. Anyway, it still needs a lot of work. Also, one of the features I'd like to provide is a server-side state. This approach will reduce inutional amount of data to transfer between server and client. And uh, last, but the most interesting thing and crazy idea I'm experimenting on is uh, bringing the whole rendering process to the edge workers. It's giving to us a serverless setup insanely fast responses. 
Unfortunately, Cloudflare Edge workers have a lot of restrictions, uh, like one megabyte executable size limit, and don't have official support for Go. Um, and uh, I was able to run Go and on the Edge workers with tiny Go compiler and Wasm, but it's not enough to be able to use Kyoto as expected. And um, so here is a quick summary for this talk. I think Go has a big potential and uh, it's not limited uh, by current domain. Otherwise, it would be impossible to create tools and libraries like this. And I'd like to note that Kyoto is not framework by its own. On my opinion, combination of UI kit, project blueprints and best practices are actually became a framework. Uh, and I'm not creating Kyoto opposite to JavaScript solutions. Even more, it's possible to integrate them. I just believe that every solution has its own purpose. And I hope this solution will have someone too. So you can find all the needed links on this uh, slide. Don't hesitate to contact me directly anytime. And uh, that's all from my side for today. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Yuri. That was yeah. wonderful. <laughs> ah. Awesome. So much great content. Well, we've, we've got to just keep going here. So I'm going to bring up our next speaker, Ron Evans. Ron, join us on stage. Hello, GopherCon! Yes! All right. It's so great to be back with you, Mark. But, Mark, what happened to your beard? You were uh, supposed I, to have a beard. I trained the targeting the computer for my drone to look for you with a beard so well that uh, was that was the plan i figured i would grow the beard fake you out then shave it off clever clever you like that oh, oh, well mm. hola mi hermano it is lovely to see you it is great to see you as well my friend <laughs> again and, wish we could be doing this in person well we we miss you all you can see i'm wearing my retro gopher con t-shirt and i'm wearing my GopherCon hack session pit crew t-shirt or, or uh, love it you know uh shirt so yeah we're we're ready okay we're well ready. give us give us the update on tiny go all right so this is a small update about tiny go so i am dead program aka ron evans in the real world but that's not really that important technologists for hire that part is always very important at the hybrid group where we're a bunch of technologists for hire doing software for hardware companies. So I'm here with GopherBot. So GopherBot uh, what joined the universe uh, two years ago at GopherCon. And so you can go uh, get the source code and the 3D much. So we never actually got to introduce this, unfortunately, because the COVID happened right then. But this is a Go-powered badge. So yeah, next time we're all together in person, then uh, we can hack on those together. So those were both made using TinyGo. So if you've been living in a very remote place, you don't know about TinyGo, but it's a Go compiler for small places like microcontrollers and WebAssembly. Yes, you don't need to use Rust for WebAssembly. You can use Go. So let's take the current stats. Over 9,000 stars on GitHub, 495 forks, with the latest dev branch having over 2,400 commits, over 100 contributors, thank you all so very much for making TinyGo what it is. Over 74 different hardware boards supported and 74 different sensors and displays. And since our last release about three weeks ago, 2.75 commits per day since the last release. So the project's going fast. So let's talk about a couple of quick highlights from that last release. Uh, lots of runtime and standard library support improvements. So you know, your garden variety Go code will maybe just work now. Um, lots of work done on WebAssembly, uh, especially the WebAssembly systems interface, and we'll see some examples of that. And then Windows, yes, you can actually build a Windows executable with TinyGo now. It's absolutely amazing. So let's take a look at some TinyGo out in the real world. So here is a really cool tweet from Matt N., uh, known for the MJPEG package as well as the TF Lite package. So Matt and uh, in Japan is very excited about being able to build Windows executables. And we can see here that the normal Go compiler, about two megabytes in size with TinyGo, only just under 300K. So also from Japan, 
Takasago-san, who is a, a longtime contributor and done lots of cool work in Tiny Go, had a really awesome Tiny Go workshop recently featuring the Wio terminal from Seed Studio. So that's a very cool workshop contents online. Speaking of WebAssembly, so you can actually use Tiny Go with the Envoy proxy, and there is an SDK which is available from uh, Tetrate Labs. It's the proxy WASM Go SDK, and it works with TinyGo and only TinyGo. Since you can't write WASA, what, WASI applications using the regular Go, just with TinyGo. So check that out. So speaking of more web assembly excitement, so recently the WASM 3 runtime project released the embedded WASM apps, which you can actually compile WebAssembly code and run it on embedded microcontrollers. So it's a different way of achieving the same sort of thing you could do just with regular TinyGo, but supports assembly script, Rust, C++, TinyGo, and Zig. So another awesome place for WebAssembly and TinyGo. So um, the IOTA project, if you're interested in blockchain stuff, recently released support for using TinyGo as the programming language for their smart contracts. So that's pretty interesting. Um, if that's a new space for many people. And then the Astro Project uh, recently, whoop, sorry, jumping ahead of myself here. The Astro Project uh, has got a front end development package a compiler that you can compile the WebAssembly using TinyGo. And in fact, their online astro.build forward slash play website uses the TinyGo compiler. Then um, speaking of interesting and cool content, there was a great series that was put together by this blogger, and they wrote a whole series of Learning Go. This particular um, article talked about how to create a Game Boy Advance game in Go using, of course, Tiny Go. Um, so then uh, back to the businessy sort of stuff, the legendary Ray Ozzy's company, Blues Wireless, is using Tiny Go for a bunch of very interesting things. Go check them out at blues.io. Then we've got, oh, I mean, there's so many things. Uh, so Tobias Thiel gave a talk recently at Embedded Fest, which is Eastern European's biggest Linux and embedded conference. So that was a really cool talk. Um, you can check that out on YouTube. Also, Tobias published a book about TinyGo earlier this year. Yes, there is a paper and electronic book for TinyGo. Check that out. So earlier today in Australia, there was the Australia IoT Christmas edition. So yeah, time for the Christmas edition lights from GopherBot. And uh, the, uh, what is his name? Leon Champton gave a talk and actually Leon is gonna give a lightning talk I think tomorrow or the next day about TinyGo. Then we've got the suborbital dev uh, recently on the Atmo application server, which is back end Go using TinyGo and WebAssembly. So there's gonna be a talk by Connor Hicks after this, a full length talk. So check it out, more info at tinygo.org. You can follow us on Twitter at tinygolang. And thank you so very much. It's been great to be here with you. Thank you so much, Ron. Uh, awesome, can't wait to see you in person some point. Like <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you all so much. Uh, thank you, Ron. That was honestly, that was excellent. And you know what? I survived. Not a mark on me, Ron. Try again next year. <laughs> anyway, okay. We have uh, on one final talk for you today. They've all been so amazing. And I can only imagine this one's going to be amazing too. Let's bring up our final speaker here. Ryan, are you with us? Yep. Hello. Hey, how are you? I'm doing great. Great. Where are you joining us from? Uh, Denver. Denver, Colorado. Fantastic. Home of the original GopherCon. Did you ever attend any of the ones there? Unfortunately, no. Oh, real shame. Yeah, the first five were there. They were really, uh, that was honestly, I loved having it in Denver. It's one of my favorite places. Uh, so awesome. You're going to talk to us a little bit about memory usage today. Is that correct? Yeah, I just have a little story about memory optimization. Fantastic. Go for it. So hi, I'm Ryan Hitchman. I'm a software engineer from Sourcegraph. Um, and uh, today I'm going to be talking about some work that we did this year. So Sourcegraph is a universal code search engine so that every developer and company can innovate faster and find their code uh, 
And most of our code is open source, including Zooked, which we use to provide regex code search for 2 million repositories. Um, and this year, uh, a large part of our work was scaling our searchgraph.com uh, search engine from indexing 300,000 to 2 million repos. And a large part of that effort was reducing the RAM usage for Zooked, for the Zooked servers responsible for handling most of the code search uh, backend. So Zooked is a Go program initially created by Hanwen Nians uh, at Google that performs trigram-based regex search. Um, and that means that it builds an inverted index that has a map of every three letter sequence of characters or trigram to its location in a repository. And then by iterating over the locations of each trigram, you can pretty efficiently implement uh, most regex searches. So initially, um, these are some graphs of our monitoring. The large purple area on the left is the RAM used by the different uh, Zooked replicas. So this is taking about 500 gigabytes of RAM, um, and the tiny lines under it are all of the other jobs. So by far the majority of our uh, you know, spend for cloud servers was on Zooked. Um, and then the drops are implementing these changes that I'm going to describe. Um, and it brought it down to about 150 gigabytes of RAM instead, which let us scale up a lot more. So Go has some really good profiling tools uh, with deep runtime integrations, and it makes it really easy to collect memory profiles to show you exactly what's occupying the heap. Um, there's lots of blog posts and good documentation about them if you look for it. So as a, as a first step for optimization, um, uh, I built a test corpus from all the files that one of the backend servers was indexing, um, and then I collected a memory profile for that. So this shows precisely where it was using memory and uh, gave me the first indications of what needs to be looked at. So the corpus uh, represents 19,000 different repositories from GitHub mostly, uh, 2.6 billion lines of code and about 166 gigabytes of disk space. Um, so the mem this memory profile has 22 gigs of live objects on one server. Um, the total RAM usage your Go program uses does depend on other garbage collection things going on, but it's pretty decent and we do set a slightly more aggressive garbage collection threshold. Um, so in this case, we set a threshold of only using 50% more space than live objects instead of uh, twice as so much, which is a default. So digging into the code, um, uh, two thirds of the RAM usage is by this one function, which is building effectively a map from 64 bit to uh, 64 bit ints to 64 bit structs here. Um, and Go maps are very fast, but they have uh, quite a bit of overhead per entry, 40 bytes. And when the actual data we're storing here is only eight bytes, that's uh, or only 12, uh, 16 bytes, sorry, that's quite a large overhead. So it's worthwhile to implement a more com compact data structure for it. Um, there's many different kinds of dynamic maps you can implement, but all we really care about is being dense and static. Uh, so sorted arrays and binary search works really well. So as a first pass, just switching from a Go map to two slices, got from 15 gigabytes to five gigabytes. Um, and this has logarithmic lookup speed instead of O of one, but it did not present any problems for our particular use case. Um, and there's a few more things we could do for our usages where uh, instead, of, <coughs> instead of an array of 64-bit in, uh, ints, we can do two arrays of 32. But, uh, and, and there was another switch for, um, and that reduced it down to 3.5 gigabytes. And uh, yet a more complex one shifts ASCII trigrams because we're indexing Unicode and ASCII is much smaller. So that got it down to 2.3 gigabytes. So we've slashed this one data structure from 15 gigs to 2.3 with no real problems. And a lot of these could be generified now, but at the time generics were not available. So as we shrink the uh, these largest one, the, the largest problem, other pieces start to dominate. Um, so a lot of pieces of metadata that were loaded from disk uh, into memory, we changed to be um, to be memory mapped uh, and accessed on demand. And some other things were left compressed until needed, uh, which shaved off another two gigs. Um, and I think the easiest takeaway here is if you have big static slices, uh, you are probably wasting memory because the excess capacity you have uh, that you're not adding to 
is just using memory. So if you simply copy them into a precisely sized slice, you can save a lot of memory. This was worth 500 megabytes um, of improvement here. So putting it all together, uh, the memory profile looks like this, which is a five times reduction overall, uh, which means that with the exact same resources, we can serve search queries for that many more repositories without requiring more servers. And it went from about uh, 1400 kilobytes of RAM per repository loaded to 310 kilobytes with no measurable latency changes, which is the really important thing. And I guess uh, in summary, memory is really expensive. Uh, we've had a few other talks already about how RAM is expensive and getting giant RAM servers is, is uh, costly. So have you profiled your applications? Um, you can find some really big wins with small changes if you look with the profile. Uh, Greenfield memory optimization is very satisfying and uh, it's a good distraction from all the other future work you're doing. So go out and optimize some code. Well, thank you very much, Ryan. That was wonderful. I'm definitely going to make some of those changes. Well, with that said, everybody, we've come to the end of our program. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. We'll be back again tomorrow, Thursday, and also Friday at the same time with more incredible talks. So with that said, I'm going to throw it back to the studio so we can hear more great content. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much, Mark for putting all this together. Thank you to all the speakers who took the time to put together their lightning talks. I'm looking forward to seeing some of the additional lightning talks that will happen over the next couple of days as well. This is, this is always fun, and I'm kind of glad we get to do it every day. I also, you know, it was great to see Ron Evans, too. Mm -hmm. You know, it's yeah, it's yeah. one of my favorite uh, people. Yeah, in the yeah, I always community. love that. Yeah. And uh, I, I heard him mention that, you know, we don't need Rust for WebAssembly anymore. And that's a little disappointing because yeah. I like Rust. And yeah. hey, you all want to hear some, like, interesting uses for wrong, Rust? Wrong, wrong conference, yeah, bro. you got to go somewhere. Yeah. Go uh, somewhere. All right, yeah. all right. Over town is not the is there, is, there, <laughs> is there a Rust channel in, in desk? No, Discord? you cannot no. have Rust at this yeah. conference. Pe peanut gallery weigh in, though. Should we? Should we or shouldn't we? Rust I think channel. we should talk about Rust. <laughs> no. Hey, uh, hey, did you know we have a mainframes um, channel? In, uh, in, yeah. In, yeah. In, yeah, you don't have to use Rust in there either. Yeah. By popular demand, we have a mainframes channel. Wait, so we can talk about mainframes, but we can't talk about Rust. I mean, that's correct. That's correct. It's a language <laughs> conference for Go. We got to stick to Go. Yeah. Uh, but right. we talked about COBOL. <laughs> As, well, we no, talked no, about Go Ball. Go Ball. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Okay. That's, that's yeah. different. All right. Yeah. All right. I'll concede. No, <laughs> no rust. Enough. Yeah, fair enough. No rust. All right. Well, uh, we've got some content coming up. Of course, there's another talk coming up. We also have some, uh, some other sessions as well. So I'm going to list them off. I'm the guy who lists them off now. So you, you just focus <laughs> in and get ready. All right. So we've got Praetorian. They're a security company. I think they're, they've got some new Go stuff going on. Uh, their new project is called GoCart, which is a next-gen open source security scanner. Um, and security is another big thing that we're seeing these days coming in, especially to Go. But, yeah, there's been but, a lot of security tools written in Go recently. Yeah, yeah and that's super interesting stuff because it's one of those, like, you don't think of it necessarily, or a lot of us don't think of it, although we should. But then on, like, day two or month two, or then you realize, ah... Yeah, I got to be secure because <laughs> I'm running, you know, business with people's data, and, and it's really important. Wait, can so we tell that to all of the people who have had breaches recently? <laughs> I would love to. Yeah. You mean security is not, is not someone else's job? Hey, not anymore, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> not my problem. I built it. <laughs> yeah, you got to build it in. So yeah, Praetorian is definitely one of the players in this space. Um, we've got another one called Always Learning. Uh, this one is fo focused on engineering cultures at Course Hero. Uh, that should be super interesting. And we've got Buff, uh, a newer company that's doing protobuf stuff, uh, hence the name. I thought they were just saying, oh, I'm Buff. They're Buff. No. They are a weightlifting company <laughs> <laughs> powered by Go. Um, the one's called uh, Buff Helps You Go Faster. We've got our friends CockroachDB uh, doing a live quiz show. Tune into that. That's going to be pretty cool. Uh, and then we've got Microsoft coming back at you um, to talk about GitHub Actions, uh, specifically, of course, how you apply them to your Go projects. Uh, so Wait, that's going to be another quiz show. I guess so. Multiple, man, that's a yeah. popular format, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, and I mean, yeah. speaking of quiz shows, if you've not gone and filled out the survey for Go First Say, you should do mm -hmm. that. Yeah. So uh, tomorrow we're going to have a, a quiz family show? feud quiz style show. show with Go Time, and they need the survey says answers. Mm. 
for our Go Team yeah. contestants to guess. Prove so them, prove them wrong. You know, yeah. make them make them think twice about what they thought they knew <laughs> about yeah. this community. And so you can do that survey at gotime.fm/gs for Gophers Say. Mm -hmm. We should do that. I'm gonna do that after. Yeah. yeah. After, yeah. Just to get. Get stump some people. I'm a troll. Hey, I'm, people. I'm trolling people. I'm trolling. <laughs> after after the episode of Go Time, we're, I know, we're right? on it. Yeah. And we it's are my turn. Yeah. <laughs> that was great fun. It's going to be again. It's going to be. And then, again. if you want to attend any of the VMS sessions that Aaron mentioned, you do need to register for that. So just go to the GopherCon.com website to register. You'll need to have a ticket to get in uh, if you're not already registered. Yep. Pretty easy to register. A couple clicks. No big deal. But yeah, do 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 that. Uh, definitely check some of these out. They're going to be pretty cool, great fun. Uh, you said doo doo. As a father, I have to <laughs> yeah, have call to, out yeah, that dad joke. joke. That has okay. yeah, yeah, that okay. has that dad joke potential to okay. it. Okay, yeah. fair enough. All right, do we have a dad jokes <laughs> channel? <laughs> we should. I think we do. We might have to. Yeah. Peanut I mean, gallery again. Wait. Chime in. in. But I mean, if it's a dad jokes channel, then it has to be a database. Oh. <laughs> oh, groan. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get into our next talk. Uh, this is a talk by Connor Hicks, who is the founder of so Suborbital Software Systems. Um, again, working on security and distributed systems. Um, they have a family of open source projects. Uh, and this one today he's going to talk about is focusing in on WebAssembly, again, which, as we've learned, but in Go, in Rust not, not in Rust. Mm, yeah, not in Rust. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So, with that, uh, take it away, Connor. We're excited to see what you got. Suborbital. I founded Suborbital to bring about a step change in how we think about and deploy cloud compute by using WebAssembly as a new technology for packaging our software. So this talk is all about WebAssembly and why you would want to run it inside of a Go application. Uh, we're going to cover what WebAssembly itself actually is, then we're going to look at why you would want to do this in the first place, and we're going to talk about how you can go about doing it if it sounds like something you want to do. And then we'll talk about some use cases and cover some things that you would want to do in the real world with this combination of technologies. So we'll start with what is WebAssembly? Well, WebAssembly is a binary format. It is a standard that describes a, an executable function. You can take a high-level programming language like Go or Rust, and you can compile it to WebAssembly so that it can run in a platform and architecture independent way. Now, Go has really good cross-compilation support, so you might be wondering why you need this at all. Well, with WebAssembly, cross-compilation becomes a non-issue entirely. You can compile a single .wasm file, and that exact same file can be run on all the different platforms and architectures that you may need, like ARM, x86, mobile devices, IoT, whatever and it can be embedded. So this is probably what's going to take up the most time during this talk is talking about embedding WebAssembly within another application. And there's a bunch of great reasons why you'd wanna do that that we'll cover in a minute. And I wanna to touch on the difference between WebAssembly itself and the WebAssembly runtime because these two things are often conflated and they are actually distinct. So WebAssembly itself is actually a specification that describes the binary format, whereas the WebAssembly runtime is the thing that actually executes that format. So a WebAssembly module can be run in a number of different kinds of runtimes, such as the browser, uh, standalone WebAssembly runtimes on the server, or others, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So people often ask, why would I want to use WebAssembly on the server? I thought that it was something designed for the browser. Well, you're right in that it was the first thing that WebAssembly was used for, and all of the major browsers started supporting WebAssembly quite a while ago, actually. It's one of the most common things that you probably see on the internet about WebAssembly is these you know, powerful browser applications that were built using WebAssembly. But people quickly realized that the WebAssembly format and WebAssembly runtimes themselves aren't intrinsically tied to the web browser. And so there are a number of use cases that we came up with that make it pretty unique. So, you know, why does WebAssembly make sense to use outside of the browser? Well, it has a couple of really nice properties that make it useful in the web browser because the web browser is sandboxed and all of these other things, but uh, we find ourselves wanting to use it uh, on the server side for some of a lot of the same reasons. 
So the three tent poles that we very often talk about when it comes to WebAssembly is performance, security, and portability. But when it comes to the server, I also like to talk about hot loading as the fourth uh, major point as to why you would want to run WebAssembly. So to quickly touch on performance, because we're going to go into it uh, quite a bit later, the performance of WebAssembly is uh, often billed as near native. So this means that you can get close to, if not the same performance as a native binary compiled for the individual platforms, uh, but you get the benefits of all the other things you see on the screen. So we've already touched on portability, so let's talk about security. Security in WebAssembly is somewhat unique in that WebAssembly is a sandboxed execution model, and it is a deny by default sandbox model. So when you are executing WebAssembly in a WebAssembly runtime, you cannot by default access anything in the outside world. You cannot make arbitrary syscalls. You cannot just willy-nilly make network connections, access the file system, things like that. The WebAssembly runtime intercepts every syscall or every host call that the module attempts to make, and the runtime is in control of what is allowed through how those syscalls are handled and all sorts of things. This has really great impacts when it comes to supply chain security because you can theoretically and actually in practice run untrusted code in a safe way as long as you're careful and uh, it really limits the impact of malicious code in a lot of cases. And then when we're talking about the server, I, I like to mention hot loading because I think it's fascinating and I found it very useful in a number of actual real world scenarios. And so this is the ability to actually swap out a WebAssembly module without needing to stop a host process, without needing to drop network connections, without needing to stop serving HTTP requests, for example. And this is really useful because when we are deploying or rolling back code that's running in our cloud environments, we, we really like this property of not having to drop network connections so we can continue to serve traffic. Some of them just might have to pause for an extra you know, beat to wait for the WebAssembly modules to reload. Uh, but actually, if you do it correctly, you can continue to serve requests with old versions and then start immediately using new versions of these WebAssembly modules to serve your requests once the swap is completed. So there's some ways to do it in a really, really nice way. So one of the comparisons that often gets made in the industry is WebAssembly versus Docker. And I want to touch on this because on the surface, they do look fairly similar, but they do have some significant differences that, you know, makes it kind of an apples versus oranges kind of scenario. Um, but, you know, they can be used for some similar things. Uh, and people sometimes ask, like, will WebAssembly kill Docker? And I think the answer to that is no, because they serve different purposes. So if we look at WebAssembly, it's a compiled program. You have taken some source code and you have created what is essentially bytecode. Whereas with Docker, you are packaging a lot more than just the code of your application. You're packaging other binaries like curl, like shells. You are adding other files. You have a file system. You have user accounts. You have all these things that make it OS-like. But WebAssembly, on the other hand, is really just a single program. So you can actually think of WebAssembly as just one program that could get embedded into and run inside of a Docker container. So while the comparison on the surface does make a little bit of sense, I think in practice there's actually enough differences that these two technologies both have a place in the world and even in the future. So performance, we kind of touched on this uh, for, a, for a quick second, but we're going to go a little bit deeper on it now. I talked about near native performance, and this is the line that we like to use when we're talking about WebAssembly, but you know, it, it can actually be true, and uh, we'll, we'll look at some performance stuff in a minute with the, with the code. But I want to talk about what we actually mean when we say near native performance. So the term near native performance, uh, it has a lot of undertones to it. There are a bunch of different factors that come into play when we talk about near native performance. So one thing to note is that when a WebAssembly runtime executes a WebAssembly module, it is actually doing some translation between the WebAssembly format and the platform specific uh, bytecode that it needs to actually execute on the machine. And so it can do this in a number of different ways and somewhat similarly to um, you know, the V8 engine, for example, it can do JIT compilation, where it is interpreting and compiling com uh, parts of the application in real time. But we can also do ahead of time compilation. So you can actually take the entire WebAssembly module and you can convert it to an x86 binary if that's the way you want to do it. 
And depending on which of these methods you use, and most WebAssembly runtimes will allow you to choose, you can actually get different performance characteristics. So for example, if you're using just in time, you will often get faster startup times, but the uh, sustained performance over time might be less. Compared to if you use ahead of time compilation, your application might start up more slowly, but the performance over a sustained amount of time would likely be higher and closer to that of a native binary. So we look at uh, different languages slightly differently when we talk about WebAssembly, because in fact, uh, languages often need to package their own standard libraries, their own internal runtimes into these WebAssembly modules, and that can actually affect the performance of the module, especially when it comes to cold starts and you know quickly bringing out new instances of a WebAssembly runtime. So when we look at something like Swift, for example, Swift has a very large standard library and a very large runtime implementation. And all of that gets packaged into a WebAssembly module when you compile it from Swift. And so loading that module and doing AOT compilation, for example, is very slow. So you can actually have quite long startup times compared to the other languages when using WebAssembly, even if it's the same runtime. And then you look at something like TinyGo or Rust or AssemblyScript, they have uh, quite small runtimes and quite small standard libraries. And so the, the modules are several orders of magnitude smaller after being compiled, and that translates to faster startup times. And you know sustained performance can actually be comparable no matter the, the cost of the runtime or standard library. But you know we, we will look at the exact numbers in, in a minute. Um, so let's kind of summarize quickly what we saw. Why would you want to reach for WebAssembly as a tool? Well, the multi-language support is an important one. It is a format that can be uh, compiled from multiple different programming languages, which is nice. Uh, in our open source projects, for example, you can have a an application that comprises uh, several different languages all in one, and it can seamlessly switch between them without you as the developer needing to do any special work. The WebAssembly runtime is just executing WebAssembly after all. Uh, hot reloading, I think, is an important one to remember because you can swap out business logic, you can roll out new versions, you can roll back versions of your software uh, in you know single digit milliseconds. It's a very powerful tool for managing software deployments in large architectures. And the security model is one of the most exciting things about WebAssembly. And this is, you know, the deny by default sandbox, the ability to more safely run untrusted code, protect yourself against supply chain attacks and all those kinds of things is really, really attractive about WebAssembly. All right, so we're gonna dive in a little bit deeper here and we're gonna look at some actual uh, code examples. We're gonna look at some of the internals of how WebAssembly interacts with the host and uh, we'll look at some performance. So this is a snippet of AssemblyScript. Uh, AssemblyScript is a WebAssembly native language. It is roughly based on the syntax of TypeScript. So it should be somewhat familiar to all the web developers out there, which is a really big benefit to this particular language. And as you can see, it looks fairly normal. We're not having to do anything crazy to get the benefits of WebAssembly. We are um, writing code at a very high level. We're not doing any low level memory management. You know, things are looking fairly normal. We are making HTTP requests. We are working with JSON. All of these things are great. Um, and I'm going to use, you know, this to illustrate the fact that, you know, WebAssembly doesn't have to be scary. You don't need to learn some, you know, crazy new language. You don't need to do low level, like C like memory management. You can get into it fairly easily with languages that are pretty familiar to you. So flipping over to the other side, uh, say we take that assembly script code and we compile it to WebAssembly, how would we actually go about running it? Well, uh, we have a, an open source package called Reactor. It's a, Go, it's a Go library that allows you to very easily run WebAssembly modules in Go. And we provide a lot of the utilities, tools, and frameworks that you need to make this happen. So Reactor is fairly low level. Uh, it is something that you would uh, reach for when you want to do something relatively custom. You want to run WebAssembly as part of an existing Go application, for example, and you want to be able to execute you know, user submitted code or hot swappable code in a very performant way. Internally, Reactor is a scheduler, so it can have many, many instances of the WebAssembly runtime instantiated all at once. It will automatically manage pools of WebAssembly instances to make sure that jobs are handled in a very efficient way. 
So in this particular example, what you're seeing is a, a WebAssembly module getting loaded, in this case, from a mysterious cloud bucket. And then that WebAssembly module, which is represented by the ref uh, variable there, gets loaded into an instance of Reactor by registering it. Uh, and then the, the module is executed by passing it an input. Now, something to note about WebAssembly is that the data types are very primitive, we'll say. There are not yet uh, representations of higher level uh, structs and strings and things like that. Currently, we're limited to things like bytes and I32s, you know, I, uh, F32s and, and other fairly small, low level uh, variable types. Now, Reactor handles converting most of these things on your behalf. So we will um, manage the inputs and convert them to WebAssembly compatible memory and then make that memory available inside of your WebAssembly module in a fairly intuitive way. So you as a developer don't need to care about some of these specifics, but in general, you are gonna be passing uh, fairly simple data types around when you're working with WebAssembly. And usually we like to say, just use JSON because it simplifies a lot of things. So when Reactor loads the WebAssembly bytes, uh, it will create an instance with a, an underlying WebAssembly runtime. Reactor supports several different WebAssembly runtimes like WASM Time and WASM Edge. So you can choose which low level WebAssembly uh, runtime is actually executing your code. And then it makes those uh, instances available for execution immediately. So there's nothing that you as the developer need to worry about in terms of instantiating and uh, setting up the actual runtime or module itself. So now I wanna take a look at how the WebAssembly module actually interacts with the host. And when I say host here, I mean Reactor or the Go program that is using Reactor to run WebAssembly. So when a WebAssembly module, like the one that I showed in the last slide, makes something like an HTTP request or tries to access a file or open a socket or anything like that, that request, that syscall or host call is, in, is actually caught by the runtime and the runtime is allowed to handle it in whatever way it likes. And in this case with Reactor, we have added a special set of capabilities to the WebAssembly runtime that give you the common actions that you would need to build cloud applications. So making an HTTP request is a fairly common thing that needs to happen. And so we added capabilities to the WebAssembly runtime to make it happen. Now, the actual runtime that is executing the WebAssembly is actually swappable when you're using Reactor. So you can choose between WASM Time, WASM Edge, or others, and Reactor will create an abstraction over those runtimes, and they will make the exact same APIs and capabilities available no matter which one you choose. Now, what you're seeing here is actually a screenshot from the Reactor code base itself, and it's illustrating how when the WebAssembly module makes an HTTP POST request, that request is in, uh, is actually caught by the runtime. The runtime is able to then evaluate it, determine if it's allowed, uh, it can do filtering, it can do security checks, and then it will actually use the Go implementation of that call to complete the request. So we're actually using the Go HTTP library and Go's amazing networking capabilities to do really efficient HTTP requests on behalf of a WebAssembly module. So there's no actual HTTP client built into the WebAssembly modules. They are simply interacting with an interface and that interface is, is defined by Reactor and mounted to the WebAssembly runtime when it instantiates that module. So I wanted to show this to illustrate the fact that we are actually being very explicit about what we are allowing these WebAssembly modules to do. And it's important because we want to prevent malicious activity. We want to allow ourselves to run this, you know, user submitted untrusted code and be very sure that what is actually happening in the real world is safe and there is no uh, risk to our infrastructure or other parts of our application. All right, so we're gonna dive into some code and we're gonna take a look at actually writing and running some WebAssembly. So we're actually looking at a repository here that uh, you saw the link on the slide, uh, github.com, cohix, gophercon-21. This is a very simple example of writing various languages, 
compiling them to WebAssembly, and then executing that WebAssembly using Reactor in a Go program. So on the side here, you'll see a number of different programming language names. Each of these is a single function that has been written to demonstrate compiling to WebAssembly, and then we are going to execute it in our main.go function. So in the effort of keeping this very simple, we're just going to be calculating factorials. It's a pretty classic way of demonstrating, you know, the performance of something. We're going to do it with some, you know, relatively large numbers <laughs> to show that we're doing some real work here. But at the end of the day, we are going to be just comparing these different languages to see what the performance differences are between them. So I'll, I'll quickly walk you through how we set up this application. So the Reactor instance is created and then three different modules are registered onto that Reactor instance. We have one for Rust, one for TinyGo, and one for AssemblyScript. And it's going to reference the .wasm files for each of those compiled functions. And then what we're going to be doing is executing a, that function that has been loaded with the input of 5,000. The module for each language is going to calculate the factorial of the number 5,000. And then we're going to do that 100,000 times for each of the languages. We're going to calculate the amount of time that it takes in milliseconds, and we're going to see what happens. So let's start by looking at the Rust function. This one is uh, fairly straightforward, as they all are. And we're simply using a recursive function to calculate factorial. Nice and straightforward. So as you can see here, this is where some of that abstraction that I was talking about before takes place. So Reactor has both a host library to run WebAssembly, but we also have guest libraries, what we call the runnable SDK or the runnable API to interface on both sides of that boundary, which we call the FFI boundary or foreign function interface boundary. And these two libraries, the one inside of your Rust module and the one outside running that module, collaborate to manage memory and pass data types around and all that kind of stuff. So at the end of the day, what we end up with is this run function, and it takes in bytes as input and returns either bytes or an error as output. And so we're just going to be taking that 5000 as a string that we inputted, we're going to be parsing it as an int32, we're going to calculate the factorial, and then just return that as a message. Very straightforward. Now we're going to use uh, our SUBO CLI tool, which is a wrapper around the various language tool chains that you might need to work with WebAssembly. And it includes Docker images that will automatically build your code. So you don't need to install the Rust tool chain or the assembly script tool chain. It will just manage that for you. So if we build the Rust runnable right here, you'll see that we are using that Docker tool chain. It's going to go in, it's going to grab the code that we've written, it's going to compile it down to WebAssembly, and then we'll be ready to go. So now that it's built that WebAssembly module, we can go ahead and run it. But I'm going to take a look at the other two first. So let's take a look at AssemblyScript now. The, uh, there's a bunch of code that gets automatically generated that you don't need to worry about. And then there is a fairly similar looking run function that takes in bytes and returns bytes. And we're doing something very similar with a recursive factorial function. And then the last one we'll take a look at is the tiny go version. So tiny go, as you may know, is a variant of go that is designed for small spaces or tiny spaces. And we use this because the WebAssembly modules generated by TinyGo are uh, much smaller than the ones generated by the regular Go, Go tool chain, and we actually get slightly better performance. Now, I know the Go team is working very hard to have you know full and complete WebAssembly support, and I really look forward to the time when that is complete uh, because I'd love to be able to use a single tool chain for everything. But for now, we use TinyGo. So once again, we're using something very similar, a uh, recursive factorial function, and we are calling it in much a similar way as the others. And now that we have all of these, we're just going to compile the other two. So we're going to compile the tiny go example. Which is going to download the Docker image to do so. I'm just going to run it natively. And now that we've built the tiny go version, we are going to build the assembly script version. So now we have three WebAssembly modules that can be executed. And we're going to go back to our main.go and we're going to actually execute them. So in this repo, there is a make file. So you can simply uh, execute make run. 
and it's going to go ahead and run that factorial function 100,000 times with the input of 5,000 for each. So as we go through here, we can see the amount of time that each of these languages is taking to calculate that uh, information. So with Rust, about 1700 milliseconds. TinyGo, also very close to 1700 milliseconds. Assembly Script, 4600 milliseconds. So you can see that there is a difference between the different languages depending on a bunch of different factors. Now, uh, all of these are using various kinds of optimizations and uh, the tool chains are different and the WebAssembly modules that they output are different because they contain different runtimes and standard libraries and all that kind of thing. But as you can see, out of the box, we have slightly different performance. And I do also want to try running with a different um, WebAssembly runtime under the hood. This is the exact same reactor program, just using a slightly, uh, with, with using a, a different low level WebAssembly runtime. And as you can see, we're getting pretty much comparable results. So the, uh, the actual difference between the runtimes is fairly minimal, uh, but the differences between the languages can actually be more pronounced. So I highly suggest you go take a look at this repository. You can try it out and you can actually go ahead and start messing around with it yourself. All right, now getting back to the slides, uh, we will move on from code time and we'll talk about some use cases. So why exactly would you want to use WebAssembly to build applications? Well, there are a couple of pretty major ones and uh, you know, a couple of these we as you know, Suborbital have been uh, working on for quite a while now. So we, we've been focusing on user submitted code because we think that using WebAssembly to power plugins and you know, user submitted uh, functions and modifications is a really powerful use case for the technology. But even without any of that, you still get a lot of benefits like hot reloading. So you can be writing your own code and deploying your own code, but still get the benefits of hot reloading, for example, if you allow your application to quickly load and execute new versions directly from your CI CD system, for example. And then uh, there's a particular use case that I think is really uh, compelling, which is using WebAssembly for FAS or functions as a service. And the reason why I think it's pretty compelling is because of that performance story that we talked about earlier, particularly the FAS cold starts. We're finding that you can spin up WebAssembly functions in single digit milliseconds or less. You can actually sometimes do it in microseconds because of the tiny binary size, the, the fact that they can be JIT or ahead of time compiled. All of these factors, if you tweak them, you can get these things starting up in order of magnitude more quickly than a container, for example. So there are a lot of use cases where you can you know, quickly scale up and down your ability to handle traffic you can uh, emulate things like AWS Lambda and actually get similar or often even better performance than these you know, really large scale professionally developed systems just by using a different technology. And you don't have to worry about any of the inherent performance problems that come with technologies like containers or micro VMs. So I wanna touch on a couple of different caveats because uh, you know, WebAssembly is a young technology. It's not fully emerged and there are some things that you need to keep in mind when you are looking to adopt it. And uh, this starts with being very careful about WASI and capabilities. Now, what is WASI? We have never heard this term before in this talk. Well, WASI is the WebAssembly system interface and in much the same way that Reactor adds you know, cloud native specific capabilities to the WebAssembly runtime, like HTTP clients and accessing databases, WASI intends to be something more similar to POSIX and giving common operating system type functions to WebAssembly modules. So accessing file systems, accessing, you know, Berkeley sockets, those kinds of things. And, you know, it's a young standard, it's still emerging, but it is already available. You can try it. The runtimes that Re Reactor uses under the hood all support it. So you can give it a try without changing any code. Um, and you need to be careful with these kinds of things because if you are intentionally running user submitted code that could potentially be malicious or mining cryptocurrency, you want to make sure that you are setting up the WebAssembly runtime in exactly the way you need and limiting the, those capabilities as much as you need to, to ensure the safety of your infrastructure. Reactor has a lot of things to help you do this. You can very uh, granularly configure the capabilities that Reactor enables, and we make, we make sure that you are able to keep your infrastructure and your servers safe when you are running 
user submitted code. The next is multi-tenancy. Now, uh, sometimes, you know, being a bad uh, tenant or being a noisy neighbor is a problem when you are running even your own code because you could accidentally introduce a problem, but especially when running untrusted code because you could have people intentionally trying to take down your infrastructure by, you know, running code that will bomb your CPU, take up all of your memory. So WebAssembly helps us because there are, you know, built-in controls to limit these kinds of things. And we can do simple things like limiting memory, CPU, and execution time, but you need to be careful about these settings and just ensure that you are setting sane limits when running your user's code. Next up is data formats. And this is generally uh, differences between programming languages when compiling to WebAssembly you can't always expect that everything will work perfectly. Like I said, WebAssembly is still a young ecosystem. And so there could be some compatibility differences. Uh, doing something simple like parsing data formats can be a little bit more challenging because WebAssembly has very, very strict data form, uh, very strict data types. And so this can cause problems when you are trying to infer data types, such as when you are parsing JSON, for example. We will uh, look at the package ecosystem just a little bit. And the thing I want to say about it is, you know, you can't just take any old package off of uh, your common package registry like NPM or Cargo and expect that it will just work. Because of the way the WebAssembly sandbox is architected, because of the way that the WebAssembly modules interact with the WebAssembly runtime, you know, code trying to make arbitrary syscalls is not going to work. The WebAssembly runtime does not conform to the Node.js API or to any other common API. It is its own uh, set of capabilities and host calls. And, you know, just expecting any old off the shelf code to work is probably realistic at the unrealistic at this point in the game. And so this is something to keep in mind. It can often be circumvented. You can often port or you can often uh, make small tweaks to make things work just as well in WebAssembly, but you do need to be a little bit cognizant and don't expect everything to work right off the bat. Next is cold starts. And we already looked at how performance can vary between different languages. And, you know, I touched on the fact that Swift, uh, for example, has a much larger runtime and standard library than some of the others. And this can affect cold start greatly. So when you are choosing languages, uh, either for yourself or for your users to write WebAssembly uh, modules with, you should keep in mind that you probably want to start with something with a very small runtime like TinyGo, Rust, or AssemblyScript. And then finally, if you are going to be allowing your users to write code that is embedded in your own architecture, I would highly suggest communicating with them, making sure that they know the capabilities, the limitations, and the expectations of what this is able to do. Uh, it's not yet a silver bullet. One day, I think it will be, and we're rapidly approaching that time. But for now, we still have some work to do to get it to the point where, for example, any Node.js application could run within WebAssembly. We're not there yet, but with a you know healthy dose of documentation, communication, and expectation settings, it's absolutely possible for everybody involved to have a really good experience. So at the end, let's summarize. We'll do a wrap up by covering the what's, why's, and how's, because that was, after all, the title of this talk. So what is WebAssembly? It's a binary format that high-level code can be compiled to in order to execute on various platforms with near-native performance and really nice security sandboxing properties. Why you would want to run it include things like hot swapping code without dropping network connections, running untrusted code, running user submitted code, or running multiple programming languages seamlessly within the same project. And how you can go about it is by using our reactor library. This is something that is quite mature. It's been around for a long time now, and we're really happy with the way that it turned out. You can use the runtimes themselves. You can use V8 in a web browser, but for this purposes of this talk, running WebAssembly in Go, we believe that right reactor is the best way to do so and also the easiest. That's all for now. Thank you for listening. I hope you learned a little bit about WebAssembly and I hope it sparked some ideas about how you could use WebAssembly in your own Go programs. Please do feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to answer questions, help you get started, whether it's with reactor or not. We love to help with anything to do with WebAssembly. We have some very seasoned WebAssembly uh, veterans on our team and we're happy to help in any way that we can. Thank you very much.
the end of the day, it's being proud of the work that you do and building cool projects with people that you enjoy spending time with. Thanks so much for that fascinating talk about WebAssembly in Go. In Go. Not, mm -hmm. not Rust. Yeah. 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 So I've made some promises behind the scenes mm -hmm. that I would do WebAssembly in Go now. But <laughs> you sound really excited. <laughs> <laughs> you just ecstatic. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I really am going to start doing that stuff. But yeah, it's, it's really fascinating to see how much this has come along in Go. Rust has typically been the language that most people yeah. are writing WebAssembly in. So I'm great to see us make strides. Yeah, I mean, we've seen novel use cases of Go almost all day now. And you know, this is just added to the list, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It goes better than Rust. Just <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, we don't have a Rust channel, but we do have a Dad Jokes channel. Yes. Now. And there's already some premium content in there. Is Am I missing out? So you're yeah. missing out. Yeah. You are all missing out <laughs> if you're not in the Dad Jokes channel. Like, yes. that's just, I didn't even know there was content yet because we just created it. So that's awesome to hear <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, we've got a couple of virtual sessions and, and focus in here because, you know, I'm, I'm your guy. If you want virtual <laughs> sessions, I'm your guy. All right, here we go. You ready? Everybody ready? Yeah, yeah. Ready. Right. yeah. ready. All right, so we've got LightStep coming at you with some distributed tracing office hours. Distributed tracing is pretty interesting, I think. Uh, not as new on the scene anymore, I guess. It's been a couple of years since it really kind of hit us all. Um, but hard, pretty hard. Yeah, I took it pretty hard, yeah. Yeah. It hit, yeah. It hit you, yeah. It hit you really hard. <laughs> this is it. it came in with, <laughs> with some power, hit Johnny really hard, and LightStep is here to talk to you about it in their office hours. Um, also, Buff, their office hours are continuing. Uh, they are, contrary to popular belief, not a weightlifting company. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they do uh, a lot of stuff with ProtoBuffs, hence the name. ProtoBuffs is also not a new technology, really. A lot of us have probably heard of them, uh, heard of ProtoBuffs, that is. Uh, but Buff is doing a lot of new stuff with ProtoBuffs, and, and they're here to talk through all of that. Um, yeah, and if you're note, watching us through any of the other platforms, if you want to access the virtual meeting spaces yeah. with the sponsors, you do have to be registered. If you're having trouble like actually getting in, if you are registered, make sure you're not running like an ad blocker, pie hole, or running through Brave for whatever reason these That's, things want you to look at ads. So. Yeah, it's all written in Rust. It's really secure, so you know they don't let you look at ads. Cause Aaron, Rust. Aaron, we were. I thought we talked about this, bro. I'm like, what? What are you doing, man? <laughs> <laughs> oh, and also uh, in our last segment, I had mentioned that the Go for Say was tomorrow. There's a different Go Time segment tomorrow. That's the AMA with the Go team. Mm -hmm. The Go for Say contest will be Friday, but. The, you know, the request still stands. Let's get in a bunch of submissions so that we can make that a really fun game yep. Yep. and troll them as hard as possible. Yes, yep. please do. Oh, also, I checked the stats on our Gopher Academy YouTube. Um, you've had hours. We haven't even got one of those 75,000 subscribers we need for my plaque. Come on, come let's on, get on top. Buddy. I mean, must you write this in Rust for it to be? Like <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I think if this was RustCon, it would have been. It would have happened. I think we're being punished for pushing <laughs> Rust so much. Actually, I think that's what's happening here. Oh man. <laughs> uh, so who do we have up next? So up next we have Mr. Daniel Sellens. So. Let me tell you, D Daniel and uh, really uh, uh, a few of us who were just uh, talking shop yesterday, and, uh, and, and, and this guy is passionate about uh, um, distributed systems and, and messaging and event-driven systems and, and, and the like. And, Do you uh, think he was hit hard by distributed tracing? Uh, I, I would have to say, I mean, I yeah, we're gonna yeah. we're gonna find out how hard he was hit, you know. But uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, he's the the, the um, co-founder of uh, of uh, a company. <laughs> I'm so tempted to call to call your company Batshit because uh, it's it's Batch.sh. That's the that's the name of the company. Um, but yeah, I will I will hold that. 
<laughs> I will hold that in. Uh, no, we're, we're I, on good terms. I it's all think good. you already said. I think I, yeah, I think I might have already how, jumped how the gun on that one. How do we feel about maybe asking him to change the name of the company <laughs> just for you? Just, no, but mean? it's such a cool, it's such it a cool, do, I, do, I do hope you own the batch.sh domain name yes. though, Daniel, because uh, that would be awesome if you did. And uh, you're nodding, so I'm, I'm going to say oh. yes, you do. Um, so yeah, uh, you're going to talk about talk to us about re reliability nirvana. What is this? Place like I'm not my interest is peaked, man. Like, tell us about reliability nirvana. Take it away, Daniel. Thank you very much. That was an incredible intro. As a side note, uh, I I am not that amazing, but <clears throat> it is true. I am quite passionate about uh, distributed systems and distributed tracing and all things that are related to uh, essentially high throughput stuff. Um, I do own Batch.sh as well. Um, only because batch.io is not available um, and batch.com costs too much money. So, all right, let's get into this. So, uh, the first thing I want to begin with is I want to say like, a big thank you to the GopherCon organizers for putting all this stuff together. That's super amazing and for really giving me a platform to talk about this stuff uh, because I am super passionate about it. And uh, I think it's really important. So, thank you. I've been trying to get into GopherCon for a long time to actually have uh, to talk, to be, have the chance to uh, present about stuff. Um, and now, on the fifth year, I think I finally got in. So, yes, I did this. So that means that you can do it too. So, well, that's said. Let's jump right into this. So, the obligatory "Who am I?" slide that everyone should, uh, everyone has. So. First things first, I am from Portland, Oregon, a sunny, beautiful Portland, Oregon. Uh, it's not sunny, side note. Um, I have been working in, in back end for about 15 years, give or take. Uh, I've been writing Go for about six years. I've been really lucky to have the chance to just work in Go pretty much uh, <laughs> the last, last uh, five plus years um, and barely touch any other languages. It's really cool. Um, I really like working on distributed systems, and I was previously, I've spent uh, well, a lot of time at data centers. I've been at New Relic, Envision, DigitalOcean, Community, uh, which is a, a startup that deals with SMS stuff. <clears throat> and most recently, I co-founded my own company called Batch.sh, <clears throat> which focuses on uh, essentially uh, observing data streams, that's really what it's about. And like streams of data that uh, may appear on various complex uh, message buses and so on. And a cool fact is that we managed to get into YC, which is pretty awesome. Uh, kind of came out of nowhere. And a final tidbit is that I am actually from Latvia. So now you can say that you know somebody uh, that's a distributed systems engineer that is very cold, by the way just like it is in Latvia. <laughs> All right, cool, let's get started. So uh, I'm gonna start with a small disclaimer here. So this is totally not a hypothetical talk. Uh, this is, there's really no theory in this. This is about stuff that I've done in production. It's real and it's stuff that I am doing right now in production. So um, that's, that's something you, you can take away from that. Um, the other part is that I'm going to try to keep it real, uh, as in just mention the things that are actually hard, the things that are actually not so hard, and I'll put it right out there. And then ultimately, I really want to make sure that you level up after uh, hearing, hearing my talk. In general, there's nothing worse than, I think, uh, listening or having somebody talk at you for 45 minutes and you having to walk away. Thank you. You having to walk away with not having learned anything at all. So the goal here is that you walk away with something. So <clears throat> let's start with what are we trying to solve? Well, what we're trying to do is we're trying to take reliability to the next level. Um, and by next level, I mean how to improve a system that is already pretty good, right? Um, so if we look into that, the first thing that might come to mind is, of course, you know, utilizing microservices. So you are going to split up your monolith. <clears throat> you realize that like, oh, it's much easier to actually manage this entire beast if you have microservices. Great. If you have microservices, you want to be able to actually reproduce them somehow and deploy them and do something with them. So you would probably utilize containers and some sort of orchestration like Kubernetes and so on. Great. Makes sense. 
then you'd actually want to make sure that you're able to deploy this stuff in a reliable fashion, right? So you would use blue-green deploys or canary deploys or some sort of another deployment uh, strategy. You also might utilize a service mesh, and a service mesh is going to enable your services to talk to each other uh, easily and be able to discover your services easily. And then you might also add circuit breakers, basically patterns that will ensure that your code is able to deal with network hiccups and so on and so on. So you might be saying from all of this, like first off, is this the talk where this dude is just going to talk about all these things again? <laughs> and no, I am not going to talk about all those things again. Uh, I am actually going to say that um, we could just do better than that, right? Um, there's uh, where all those things right there are already good. Uh, it's just the fact that uh, we could do a little bit better. We can just add some things and just adjust it a little bit. And I would even go so far as to say that we could probably remove some of those things as well from that uh, from that entire stack, which would reduce our complexity in exchange for some complexity. So the thing that I'm talking about is event driven and the concepts of event driven. So uh, since everybody's super smart and everybody is able to pick this up really quick. I am going to try to do this in about like five minutes or so. It has never worked out to be five minutes, but I'm going to try anyway. So event driven is an architectural and system design pattern. Uh, think basically like a microservices pattern, right? Uh, in event driven, event driven consists basically of three actions, which is emitting something, consuming something and reacting so to something. And you might actually not react to anything like after you even consume it. So it doesn't necessarily mean that if one of those happens and all the other three actions have to happen as well. Now I mentioned, I, I say the word event and really it's synonymous with a message. And that is synonymous with essentially a unit of work. I think it was Honeycomb, speaking of distributed tracing, Honeycomb uh, wrote an article, I think like, two or three years ago, and it's, it's super awesome. It talks about uh, what, is, uh, what is the difference between a log entry and an event. And the thing that it came down to was that essentially an event is uh, actionable, right? And they define it as a unit of work. And that's really, that's all that it is about. It's something that you can actually guarantee being able to perform an action off of, right? Where a log entry might be more of like an informational thing. So the event uh, must be, or the events and where they're coming from must be the source of truth. All events must be communicated through an event, uh, event bus or a message bus. Um, and that could be, I mean, uh, the definition of an event bus is really kind of loose. We could be even using Redis. It might not be the best choice, but the point is some sort of a method to actually send messages through. Um, all the services must be idempotent. And that's really just a big word for the fact that we just want to make sure that um, that our service is able to deal with duplicate events. And we want to make sure that our service is able to deal with out of order events. Which is, uh, if you add state into the, all of this, it's not really that terribly complicated. So, <clears throat> And then uh, we also must be okay with eventual consistency. This is kind of a, uh, this is a big one because uh, getting everybody to be on the same page and agree that it's okay uh, that we cannot guarantee consistency, it's kind of a big, big deal. Um, the whole point of that really is, right, is that you are, you are trusting that the system will eventually become consistent enough for everything to operate correctly. The uh, most important part of all this is that your single service, I think from all of this stuff, all of these points are important, but the one most important point is that, uh, your service should only care about its own state and nobody else's. That's it. It shouldn't even know about anything else that is happening on the system at all. I think that's a, a really important like building, uh, building block of this entire thing. Uh, all the stuff is quite easily achievable, but the moment that this is, the moment you violate this rule, you kind of lose the benefits of actually even doing anything event driven uh, to begin with. So. <clears throat> So what are the components and event driven? So of course you have an event bus. That's where all the messages are going to be passing through. I would suggest in this case for an event bus to use RabbitMQ. Uh, it is not written in Go, it is written in Erlang. Um, however, it is still very, very good. Um, and specifically, it has an extremely versatile routing config. 
uh, meaning that uh, instead of having to update your code to do some sort to implement some sort of functionality, you can just utilize uh, stuff that's already built into RabbitMQ. Uh, it is medium fast. It does about 20,000 messages a second, uh, for about like two to four kilobytes in size, I think. Um, and uh, it is extremely reliable. I have used RabbitMQ for many years now, and there is practically no babysitting uh, associated with it. Some, some cons that, uh, about RabbitMQ, though, are that it is not distributed, and I don't think it ever will be. But it does have various failover options and high availability options to a point where it's OK to have this idea of introducing, essentially, a single point of failure. But that single point of failure is extremely unlikely to actually fail, which are generally the famous last words. But you know, uh, for the most part, it's OK. So uh, the second part is caching in a config layer. And really, it should be also kind of like a state layer. Um, and this is a piece that uh, you never hear folks talk about at all when we're talking about event-driven or the various like umbrella architectures of event-driven. This is what I think enables uh, building really stable and really scalable systems to begin with. Um, so a config layer is essentially some sort of a way for your service to retain its state and be able to get its state back after it, the service has been restarted or it comes back from a crash or whatever other sort of thing. And that config layer, or still all the, all the components that we're talking about here, they need to be centralized dependencies. And so you want them to be extremely, extremely reliable, right? So uh, in this particular case, I think there is really one massive contender, and that is etcd. And etcd is uh, distributed. It's a distributed key value store. And the biggest thing about it is, is that, or the best thing about it is, really, is that it's extremely, extremely rock solid. It just works. Um, I have used etcd for an extremely long time. And I've had clusters of sizes of 5 to 9, I think like 11 nodes or so. And with uh, links, between all the cluster nodes having an excess of 200 milliseconds, milliseconds of latency or so, and it still survives without a problem. The other part is that, yeah, it's written in Go. It is used by Kubernetes right now. Uh, it has been used now for quite a while. It is medium fast, meaning that it's about, it can do about 20,000 messages a second as well. Um, but again, the most important part of it is the fact that it's, it's essentially, it's so ridiculously stable. So. Uh, with that said, that's actually all the components that you need to build an event-driven system. It might not be amazing, but it's going to be enough. So with that said, you, there are some bonuses that you can add into all this stuff as well. So you can have a long-term event storage. Uh, and that's essentially a way for you to say, I would like to see or uh, keep a history of every single event that has ever happened on, on um, my entire system. And for that, you would need to put it into something, right? Like store all of these events. And unless you're running your own object store and you're comfortable with running Ceph or you're comfortable with running uh, Minio or something like that, I would just suggest for the mere mortals to use S3 because it's really cheap. Uh, it is quite fast. It is quite reliable as well. Uh, there's really no reason not to use it. And on top of it, it, ex it's, it gets exposed in so many different ways. You can uh, have uh, like use Athena to access it and so on. But of course, you also need some way to actually get all of these events into the object store in the first place. So you would have to potentially build some sort of a way to like some sort of a method to archive all of these events that are coming there. So you could use all kinds of stuff. You could use Debezium, you could use Spark, some sort of Spark jobs, um, or you could just build something. And in that case, I would totally suggest to just build something. It is much easier because you could just, uh, you're probably going to have some sort of custom logic in there that you're going to want to, to, want to basically expand this thing. And generally, it is pretty simple uh, to begin with. So um, I have now worked with practically, I think, every, every supported message, message broker library in Go. And they're all pretty good. They all work really well. So there's really no reason to say like, oh, I'm not going to do this in Go. Uh, I'm going to do this in Java or something like that. Instead, you don't really need to do that. It, uh, there are plenty of client-side libraries that do all this stuff. So cool. Congratulations. You have now learned event-driven. That was not five minutes, I'm pretty sure. Uh, it's probably more than that. So. 
All right, so how does all of this actually translate to improve reliability? Well, the first thing here is that uh, we are talking about essentially async. Uh, everything is async. Everything is becoming async at that point. So what you're gaining by just doing things the uh, event-driven way, you gain automatic recovery. That's actually built into your code purely off of, based on the fact that you have written a consumer that is going to consume your messages. That means that if your service is down at the time, when it comes back, it is going to just automatically consume all the messages that it has missed. That's it. It's as simple as that. It doesn't know that there are messages that are missed. It doesn't know that it was down. You haven't added any sort of additional uh, logic into your code or anything like that to actually know that, oh, I need to recover now. No, that this all comes by default just from the fact that like, well, your service came back up and now it's consuming everything. So. The second thing is that uh, your failure domain has now been reduced dramatically. You now have a situation where, uh, if we look back at the, one of the previous slides where we were talking about um, the service should only care about itself and nobody else, that means that you, your service is no longer talking to service B, C, D, or E, and so on and so on all in your microservice stack. You only care about yourself. That means that you have practically no dependencies except these centralized dependencies, right? Uh, like of RabbitMQ and etcd or whatever. Um, so basically, yeah, it's less things to fail. There's true service autonomy. The fact that uh, from an organizational point of view, you are no longer depending on another team and thus the reliability of team B or C does not impact you in any way, shape or form, right? Just because uh, service C has a poor response time or something like that. Your SLAs are not going to be affected by it. There's also going to be less infrastructure. So when we're talking about a service mesh, uh, specifically for the fact of uh, to add uh, the functionality of uh, being able to uh, discover where all these other services are at, you no longer care about other services. You no longer talk to them. You're just talking to an event bus, so you don't actually have a need to discover anything at all. Uh, so, and on the same page, you no longer need to actually even care about uh, the uh, some sort of encryption methods to that you know to enable talking between services. That stuff is gone. You no longer need it really. So we could just take that out. And finally, the biggest one of all of these is the fact that. Uh, you have a dramatically lower attack surface because now you have the ability to basically put in an ACL, which is going to, uh, into you, like you know your network stack or whatever, that says that nothing can talk to anything. <laughs> you could basically put in a deny all for all outbound traffic that is on your inter for your internal network for for your even external network, and say that well there are only two places that the services can talk to, that is the event bus and that is you know my the caching layer of etcd or whatever else, and I think that's amazing. That's uh, that's what I have done um, for for quite a while now, and it's just an easy checkbox that you can get right to say like yep we are significantly more secure because we do not have to punch holes really ever to say like, oh, service A actually can talk to service, you know, G or whatever. So, so let's talk about what this actually looks like. Uh, as in, we're going to look at some code. Obviously, this is not production ready code, but it generally gives you an idea as to like what this will actually look like. And it'll prepare you for when we do a brief demo of some of these concepts to begin with. So <clears throat> from the top, what we're looking at is we are going to be setting up an event bus. And the event bus is going to return an instance of the event bus. In this case, it's going to be rabbit. You can see right here that there's already an import there. Um, after, after that is done, all the event bus, by the way, that all that it is is that we're just defining where we're going to connect to and what kind of messages we care about. Um, after we, get, we receive an event bus, we're going to call on the consume method and we're going to pass to it a consumer func. And consumer func is essentially going to be executed every single time that a message actually comes in um, or uh, comes into RabbitMQ and RabbitMQ uh, passes it to our service. Finally, we're also going to run a producer in here as well, which is essentially just going to periodically produce some messages. So what does setup event plus look like? Pretty simple. We don't have to go into each one of these, but the, the idea is that we're using this Rabbit library. Um, it's a wrapper that we wrote uh, for RabbitMQ. It's, it actually wraps the AMQP 
uh, the, I think it was uh, Stradway, yeah, Stradway AMQP. <clears throat> it wraps that library uh, and adds reconnect support and some other like uh, quality of life things. So we're using that to connect to local host and we're basically saying, because of these binding keys we're saying that if any producer writes any sort of messages to the events exchange, then forward it or forward a copy of it to my queue. And that basically means, right, that this because we have a consumer set up here, that RabbitMQ is going to forward a message from uh, is going to forward a message when it comes into my queue, which is ultimately going to fire this consumer func because we have this that here. So what does the consumer func look like? Consumer func receives a copy of uh, AMQP delivery. AMQP de delivery has a bunch of different metadata about the message itself. It'll have the body, it'll have various headers, uh, all, all kinds of things related to, specifically to RabbitMQ. The thing that we care about the most though is the body, right? the actual payload of what was sent in uh, by somebody that produced a message. So in this case, we're going to assume that the body is going to contain a map string interface. And all we're doing is we're just essentially unmarshalling that, uh, uh, JSON unmarshalling that body to that. Then we are performing, uh, we're just checking to see if uh, the type key exists in this map that we, uh, that we unmarshaled. And if it does, then we're going to perform a switch on the message type and uh, see if it is new order. If it is new order, then we execute some function somewhere to do something uh, with the contents that we unmarshaled. Um, in this case, process new order, we don't really care what it's even doing. The point is that it's now it has the chance to do something with it because it has identified what kind of a message it is. Finally, there's the producer. So the producer, all, all it's really doing here is that it's running in a forever for loop. And it is generating some JSON with a random UUID for the user ID. And then the only line that matters here really or is, is it's not really even complex, but uh, the only line that matters is the publish, right? And the, all the publish is doing is just writing to this uh, routing key that we don't, it doesn't matter what routing key we're even using, foo or whatever, because when we configured the event bus in one of the previous slides, right? Um, in, in here, because we have a pound here, it means basically it's a wildcard. So we can write any sort of a routing key and it's going to end up going to uh, to RabbitMQ and have RabbitMQ forward it over to my queue instead. So, fantastic. So let's do, now that like we generally understand uh, what it's supposed to look like, let's do a demo of building a fairly simplistic event-driven system. I have all this code available on GopherCon 2021 under the BatchCorp org. Uh, it's all in there and there's a pretty decent readme explaining all this stuff. So. Without further ado, you now have the ability to look at this mesmerizing, incredible uh, diagram. And what you can tell here is that uh, I got carried away with an Apple Pen with an iPad. It is pretty sweet. Um, and I started enjoying coloring things. So once you uh, get past that point, um, what it's really like showing you here is that what we're going to do is uh, we have two services. We have the orders and the notification service. And those are going to be listening to RabbitMQ. There's going to be a producer, some sort of a third party that is going to pro uh, produce an event. And once it, is, uh, once it goes into RabbitMQ, an important thing here is the producer is not talking to notifications or to the order service. The producer is going to be talking just to RabbitMQ. RabbitMQ is going to forward the new order message to orders and to notifications. And the two services are going to do something with based on that message. In this case, it says, uh, you know, hypothetically that orders is going to be talking to a shipping service and notifications is going to talk to Slack uh, to send some sort of a notification and so on. For our case, there's really no reason for us to talk to these outside dependencies. We're just simply going to uh, send some sort of metrics out. That's it, just to be able to visualize the fact that something is happening. So um, also I'm going to, the way I've set up the demo is that uh, so that we do not have two separate code bases altogether for the services, we are just going to pass in an NVAR, which is going to specify the name of the service to begin with. Um, <clears throat> so that way we can just run uh, an arbitrary number of different, different services, so to speak, uh, just based up, just by providing it a different name. So the first example is going to be a no thrills example. So let's just do all of that really quick. So <clears throat> I am going to go into here and this is our code here. So 
I'm already in GopherCon. There's a Docker compose file. And you'll see that a Docker compose has RabbitMQ, etcd, and it has a Graphite StatsD setup. Um, we're not going to be using etcd yet in, in this first case uh, of the demo. We're just going to be using RabbitMQ. But we will be using Graphite StatsD. All it is is just basically a combo Docker container that has a StatsD server, which is meant for aggregating metrics, and Graphite to actually visualize all that stuff. So you can basically think of it as uh, a simpler Grafana plus Influx, InfluxDB. That's essentially all it is. So, all right, so we're going to start that up really quick. Let's do that. <coughs> Let's do that really quick. Uh, if I had an M1, maybe this would be a little bit faster, but it is what it is. All right. <coughs> Do that. And while that stuff is starting up, we can already start looking through some of this code as well. So this is the GoForCon 2021 repo. We are under the service directory right here. Okay, so let's start looking through main. Um, it will look fairly familiar, right, uh, to the previous example that I was giving. So the only thing here is that uh, we are going to be looking for the service name NVAR. The service name, if it's not provided to us, then we're just going to bail out, right? And instead of just setting up the event bus, we're just going to have something a little bit more generic. Um, we're going to be setting up all of our dependencies. So we'll set up the dependencies. After we set up the dependencies, we're going to do something similar to what we saw in the, in the screenshots of the code, which is we're going to launch off of the dependencies. Uh, we already can tell that dependencies is going to create an event bus. So off of the event bus that's in dependencies, we're going to launch a consumer in a dedicated Go routine. And we're going to tell it to do the same thing, execute something, or execute this particular function right here, um, the consumer function. So, and the final part is just a forever loop, right? Or a way to ensure that main doesn't really exit. That's all it is. So, um, <clears throat> so let's take a look at setup dependencies really fast. So setup dependencies, we instantiate depths. We're going to create an event bus, same thing as before. We're going to be listening to basically, uh, or we're going to listen for anything uh, that is, is written to the exchange called events. And RabbitMQ then is going to forward that to, <clears throat> to a queue that we registered called service name dash Q. So in this case, orders dash Q and notifications dash Q. Great. After that is done, we instantiate a stats D client. That's essentially the client that we're going to be using to uh, bump basically some metrics. Have to do this sort of a thing purely for the demo, really, because uh, the metrics do not show up immediately in, gra in Graphite. So uh, it's easier to just simply say, like, all right, here, here, there's some in here. So we're going to do a little bit earlier. And finally, we're creating state. But because, again, the first part of the demo doesn't actually utilize state, and we're just going to skip over this and what it's actually doing. It does get instantiated, but it gets instantiated with a no op state. So even when it gets called, it's not really going to do anything at all. So <clears throat> back, to, back to main. So in main, then, the first thing that we do is we actually start up consumer func, or, or the next thing after setting up the dependencies, we say that, like, OK, you need to execute consumer func. So what is consumer func? Again, very similar to what we had before, uh, but instead of you know, just unmarshalling into a map string interface, now we actually have an event structure for it. So there's some sort of an envelope. Uh, for the sort of event that we are expecting. Now, in many cases, this could be protobuf, this could be Avro, this could be all kinds of encodings. It could be JSON. Um, it could be really anything. Uh, in this case, for the demo, uh, we're just assuming that it's going to be JSON. And the JSON is going to contain an ID, it's going to contain a type, and it's going to have args. The message type is really defined right there as a string, and there are a couple of message types, which is new order and uh, band user. Same thing as before, we're going to unmarshal it, and then we're going to do a switch, uh, switch check on it to see if it's a new order. If it is a new order, we're going to execute process order. So what does process order do? We do not care about what it's doing with this uh, state stuff because, again, we're not making use of state yet. So it doesn't really matter. It's just, we can completely ignore it. 
thing we should not ignore, though, is this is the part actually that is. Uh, this is really the the magic of what's what's happening here, is that we're just going to bump a metric that's essentially it via our stats decline, and the metric name is going to be service name, new order OK. That's it. Um, after that, well, we do we do add this thing into state, but again, because we're not using state yet in this first example, it's going to be a no op, and it doesn't really matter. So let's start up these services. We're going to need two of them. Right, so let's start up this first one. Let's go into here. It's going to be service name equals to oh, uh, service name is orders. I cannot type because it's really cold in here. Make uh, no, 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 make. All right, that's one of them, and let's do the second one as well. Uh, And service name equals to, uh, this is going to be the notification service. And let's just run this thing. Fantastic. Now that it's running, uh, let's go over to Graphite. Uh, we should have, have it running as well. So let's take a look at Docker, what's running in here. So. There's RabbitMQ running, etcd is running, and Graphite is running as well. So we should be able to just go to that really quick and just see that it is available. So let's take a look at this. We're just going to go to localhost and take a look at the metrics that we have in here. So we have two metrics, or four metrics rather. So the notifications metric is here. We're going to want to see that. We're going to want to see the order. Yeah, the orders. Yep, metric as well. <clears throat> Let's change this view to have the last five minutes. And just to ensure that we actually have, like that we can see this stuff pretty decently, let's take a look at, uh, let's change this to a stacked mode as well. Okay, cool. So now <clears throat> we're finally going to write an event. We're going to be the producer. I'm going to use a CLI tool called Plumber. Uh, it's a CLI utility that we wrote ourselves, uh, for ourselves really, and it's essentially like a curl that is used for, uh, for being able to read and write to various message buses. So if you want to write to like Kafka or if you want to write to Rabbit or Nats or whatever, it doesn't really matter. And it supports protobuf, it supports Avro, flat buffer, all kinds of other stuff. So that's what we're going to use for the producer. So that's what we're going to do. So we're going to use plumber write. Um, we're going to say it's going to be written to Rabbit. We do not have to specify the address because it's going to localhost anyways, but we will have to specify the exchange, which is going to be events. We're going to say that input is going to be, let's see, we know that there's got to be a type in there. So it's going to be new order. All right, and I think it had an ID as well in there. So let's just call it one, two, three. All right, and we're going to write it to a routing or using a routing key called foo because, again, it doesn't really matter. It could be go for con for all we care about. All right, so let's do that. Let's submit this message, and we can see that, great, these services automatically responded to them, or they, they picked up the messages because, uh, that because RabbitMQ forwarded them over to their queue. So if we go here and we perform a refresh, we can immediately see that, okay, cool. This, these messages came in. So similarly, if we were to do this a couple of times, if we were to uh, send a couple of these messages or a few of these messages to it, um, all of them are going to come through. Fantastic. So if we go back to this, and we would say now that we want to have, uh, if we want to improve this a little bit, well, um, do we need to do anything actually? And the answer is really no. If we want to add some sort of recovery to all of this, the recovery stuff is already built in, right? So that means that we could, at this point in time, we could just simply take down one of these services. So let's say we'll take down the notification service. And if we emit some messages to it, naturally what's going to happen is that, oh, uh, hold on, silly keys, there we go. If we emit some additional messages to it, um, the order service is going to pick it up. 
right? And the notification service is not going to see it. That's why we see only that the order service is right here. So, but the only thing to, what we need to do to in order for uh, to for the notification services to recover is to simply start up. And we haven't actually added any code for recovery or anything like that. We just simply need to uh, just start it back up. So let's do that. If we just simply start it again, the first thing that it's going to do is that it will just process all the messages because it's essentially a consumer and all those messages are sitting in its queue. So if we were to just look at this again and refresh it, there is a notification service. So by doing basically nothing, we have managed to implement uh, automatic recovery into this entire thing. So the final part though is that like we don't actually have a fully, a fully well-designed uh, event-driven system yet. For it to become or get to the next level really, we need to have some sort of state. So at this point, we're going to be introducing NCD as well. Um, NCD and some sort of localized state. So what that is going to look like, let's just look through through code really quick on what it all means. So <clears throat> if we look in here, the setup dependencies, one of the parts that we do is that we instantiate new state and we pass it the service name. Cool. So if we go in here, we're going, we can see immediately that we need to pass the enable state nvar uh, to ensure that it doesn't create a no-op entry of new state. So one of the first things that we do is we create an etcd client. Uh, this is fairly standard code for just talking to etcd essentially. Um, and then we're going to instantiate uh, state and we're going to pass the etcd client and we're going to instantiate a couple of data structures as well. These uh, like the entire purpose of, of of uh, the state package is essentially to provide some way for you to uh, keep state in memory and be able to periodically flush it to somewhere. And the reason you're flushing it to somewhere is so that you can actually, uh, on startup, read all that stuff and, well, populate your internal cache in memory. That's all it is. So. Uh, that is the reason why we're seeing the, the cache, the cache data structure and the flush data structure. Obviously, there's some mutexes in here as well because there's probably go routines involved that are going to be reading from the same place. So mutexes are going to be necessary. Um, so the first thing that we do after instantiating state is that we import all the cache. That is the piece that I was saying that, that after we have, uh, after the service starts up, the first thing that it should do is it should go out to etcd and say, hey, tell me everything that you know about, like that you know about me. Um, and you're getting all the information. So if we look at that, import cache, all it's doing is it's performing, it's performing a recursive, uh, with prefixes essentially, a recursive lookup uh, for anything under that prefix to, to give you uh, all the data. So in this case, we're going to go through the response and we're going to populate our cache with all the message IDs that we've seen in the past, right? Um, if we go back to here, after that, we will start a flusher. And the flusher is also really simple. The flusher is simply a go routine that gets executed, and it has a ticker that runs every second. Every second that it runs is going to, is going to go through the flush data, uh, data structure, and it's going to flush it to, or it's going to put basically something in etcd. That's that's all it's doing. And then it's going to delete the entry from flush, so it, it knows that it doesn't uh, it doesn't have to flush anything anymore. This is being used. The flush data structure is being used when you perform when you perform an add, like when you're adding something into state. It's going to put it into into the local in memory cache, and at the same time, it's also going to put it into the flush data structure too. And uh, so that basically the flusher can, can get rid of it. So <clears throat> what you end up with in the end then is that in main, finally, when you get to the consumer function and we're processing the order, we the first thing that we will do once we receive some sort of an event is we're going to see and uh, we're going to check to see if we know anything about this ID of this event. Um, and what it's going to be doing is it's just going to go into state and say like, hmm, do I, do we, do we know about this ID? And you know that even if you crash or something happens to you, that's the, that data is going to be in etcd no matter what, right? It's already going to be there. So by the time that another service comes back up, uh, its cache is going to be populated with everything that was already there. And 
if it is not in there, uh, if it is not actually in our cache, then we're going to imp like then we're going to bump this metric again, and we're also going to add it into our state so that the next time that this uh, the request comes through, then it's most definitely going to uh, it's going to get uh, it's going to hit this part right here. So what we can see here is that. If, the, if we are aware of this ID, then we're going to bump a different metric, which is going to be new order skipped, right, based on the service name. So what does this all look like if we are just going to start up these services right here? So if we do, I do not want to type this again. So that is the, come on. Fine, I'll type it again. So that's the order service. And we will also need to do enable state equal oh, state equals to true. Great, and we're going to do this one too, and then it's going to say equal state equals to true. All right. Now we have both of these running. We can see that state was state tracking was enabled as well. So now what happens is that. If we're going to execute this and we take a look uh, over, over here, what we'll see is that great, both of them have received it, both of them have actually done something with this metric, uh, or both of them have done something with this, this message. So if we were to do it again, what we're going to see now is that if we, we just need to also graph these other metrics as well, new order skipped and new order skipped. We can see that the next message was automatically rejected, or in this case, it was we we bumped this other metric, right? Because uh, no matter how many we we're, we're going to send, <clears throat> it's basically not going to reprocess them again because it already knows this ID in the first place, right? Um, and because of the stuff that we added into etcd, we can now basically shut down both of these services, start them back up, and do the same thing again, and. The first thing that's going to happen is that it's going to see that this message has been already checked or has been already uh, processed, right? So there's basically no green or blue in there at all. Cool. So that right there concludes the third part of the demo. So let's continue this stuff. So I'll quickly briefly talk about the libraries that you just saw in here, the stuff that I think is Super useful, really. So for RabbitMQ, uh, there is, of course, the Streadway and QP library. So it is super solid. And we just wanted to have some sort of a way to put uh, everything that's in that library and make it just a little bit easier to utilize. So things like automatic reconnects, uh, creating consumers, creating uh, uh, publishers, all that sort of stuff. We just wanted to make it a little bit easier. Um, for Kafka, even though there is no Kafka demoed here, I figured that it's a good idea to actually talk about Kafka as well. Um, for Kafka, there are two big libraries that are available. It is the Sarama library and the, and the Segment.io library. And both of them are really good at specific things, uh, meaning that, the, for instance, the Sarama library is really good at managing Kafka or performing tasks that are related to management. So things like, for instance, uh, topic control. Uh, on the other hand, the, the Segment.io library is really good at creating high throughput uh, consumers and producers, and it works really well. Uh, we need both of those things, so we created another wrapper called KNG, and that's what we use uh, at, at our company. Finally, so, or rather next, is etcd. etcd is the, the standard client for etcd. It is fantastic. It works really, really great. Something I should have probably mentioned on here as well is that uh, if you're doing event-driven, you're probably doing a lot of async. And if you're doing async, you will want to have distributed locks or something like distributed mutexes. And the etcd client provides uh, an extra concurrency package that has things for uh, creating distributed locks. And that is super awesome because you uh, don't really want to implement it yourself. And because etcd is based on Raft, you can essentially piggyback off of that. Then for CLI debug stuff, you can totally use Plumber. I think it works fantastic for that. That's the reason we wrote it. We wrote it for ourselves to be able to work with event-driven systems a little bit easier. Um, and also because we utilize Rabbit and Kafka at the, at the same time for our entire system. 
So for UI de debug, uh, again, there's no Kafka in the demo, but CoughDrop is essentially a web-based UI for Kafka uh, for being able to see, to view topic contents, for being able to uh, manage topics, like meaning add, add them, delete them, that sort of a thing. There's also etcd manager. Um, it's a fairly old project at this point, but it works really like remarkably well. It's also a web uh, web based UI um, for etcd because otherwise you'd have to use a CLI to actually manage all your keys and so on. And again, something that I did not even talk about during this talk is uh, gRPC, but I figured that it's it's worth uh, mentioning as well. Uh, this is basically like Postman but for gRPC, and it's super awesome. It works really, really well. So for local metrics, something that you probably saw in the, in the demo is that there's StatsD and Graphite, which is essentially uh, like an influx plus Grafana, uh, except significantly lighter and way less powerful as well, but uh, for just being able to quickly show metrics and be able to do something with them, I think it's fantastic. And finally, there is an example service and a template that I, uh, that my team, everyone uses for all of our services. It has support for Kafka, Rabbit, etcd. Um, it has all the caching state stuff already built into it. It's fully tested. It has Docker support, and it has a, I might say, a very beautiful make file that has an awesome help output. So we use this for all of our services. We have about 20, uh, probably 25 services or so running in production. And every single one of them is based off of this template. Uh, so, uh, and we constantly keep it updated and so on as well. So <clears throat> that is probably the best uh, example of an event-driven application I can go with. So really quick, let's talk about reality. So to do event-driven, uh, the, I guess this is more like the hard parts really about event-driven and what makes it hard is that, uh, so first things, first is you need to understand your message bus tech really, really well. Uh, you need to get everybody to be on board and that means that you're going to be doing a lot of convincing. You're going to need to convince your leadership, your architecture teams, your engineering in general. Um, you're going to be responsible for essentially evangelizing this entire concept as to like why this needs to be the next, uh, next way to do things. You're going to be writing lots of example code, all kinds of flows, docs, and so on. <clears throat> you will need to accept that the, the event bus is your source of truth. So, of course, it means that, uh, it doesn't mean necessarily that the event bus m m be, must be the uh, exact uh, place where data originates actually, it still can be a database. But the point is that once an event actually goes on the event bus, that it, it, at that point it becomes the source of truth actually. You need to embrace eventual consistency. You need to embrace and fully understand how to implement item potency. And as a side note, instead of leaving it to all the developers to do on their own, you should probably provide some sort of a boilerplate method to how to do item potency um, how, or how to implement it. And that's where the etcd stuff comes in with some sort of state, uh, state management uh, functionality. You can most, most definitely anticipate more complex debug um, because things like distributed tracing are not entirely going to work. Uh, you're going to have to do some greenfield implementation yourself, right? Uh, meaning that you're going to have to add something on top of events to include this information. You can most definitely uh, anticipate writing more complex Go. Um, and then I specifically added a red, red, uh, red arrow here because by far all these other ones uh, pale, I think, in comparison to getting everybody on board. Uh, it is totally an organizational, potentially partly political part that you need to get everybody to agree that this is the way to do things uh, from, from here on out. And that is not necessarily easy because, uh, especially depending on the size of your organization and so on. So let's talk about the reality of Go and what does it actually look like in Go. So if you haven't done Go routines, you will most definitely have to do Go routines because you're doing things asynchronously. So you're going to want to make use of, well, pretty much like, the most well-known feature of Go, which is you're going to launch Go routines. You're also going to want to learn 
uh, you're going to want to know how to actually share your workloads. And um, you would utilize, you know, weight groups for this, you would utilize channels, all that sort of stuff. You will also want to control your go routines, like meaning uh, the life cycle of a go routine, be able to shut it down, get it to sleep, get it to not do anything, that sort of a thing. You're going to make use of locks and mutexes, that is for sure. Uh, in most cases, localized locks are going to be fine. In some smaller cases, you're going to want to have a distributed lock. For that particular case, having an etcd lock or having a mechanism in etcd to perform locks is super awesome. You're going to be you're going to want to be comfortable working with channels. That's a really big thing. Understanding the reason of why you would want to use a buffer channel somewhere and how is it going to affect performance versus why you'd want to use an unbuffered channel somewhere. Uh, select is a big one, right? Uh, for select, you're going to want to care about things like how do you how do you perform a blocking select or a blocking read from a channel or how do you perform a non-blocking read from a channel and why is it a good idea or a bad idea in a particular case. And then tickers and timers. Essentially we're talking about time.sleep. It happens all over the place even though it sounds really bad like a go-to. It's basically it's basically one of your weapons. Uh, you, of course there's tickers and timers themselves as well, but the thing is that, yeah, don't be ashamed in using that time.sleep if you have to. So uh, I think the most important thing from all of these though is, like uh, all of them are quite important, but <laughs> the one thing that I continuously still run into over and over is that I wish that I made use of context.context .context somewhere because at some point in time you uh, decide that, oh, you know what, I want to actually instrument this function and get some sort of metrics for it or whatever else, and you had to go back, add context all over the place, um, and it's just like, it's just a pain really, so it's much nicer to not have to do any of that stuff. So, who should be trying event-driven? So, the cheap answer for, for that, uh, kind of a cop-out answer, I guess, is the fact that uh, anybody that's okay with eventual consistency, but I think the, the answer goes significant, can go significantly deeper. So I think anybody that's doing uh, already uh, handling async workloads, that's a big one. Uh, anybody that's dealing with high throughput, uh, and that means like high throughput as in resources or bandwidth, Anybody is dealing with uh, big data. In big data, you're doing so much async to begin with, you have to do batched work to begin with, that it just simply makes sense um, for that event-driven could be introduced as well. And if your shop is super comfortable with concurrency, uh, with concurrent concepts and parallelism, uh, then it might be a decent fit as well. So specifically, we're talking about uh, fintech, gaming, security, data science, communications, uh, analytics, and travel, and there's probably many, many other ones. I put an asterisk to all of these because every single one of them has a case where, well, like some particular play area that it does not make sense to do event-driven at all. So, and that will go for the next slide the same way as well. With that said, still it ultimately boils down to the fact that are you okay with eventual consistency? Uh, but there's, well, there's, there's a bunch of other, other uh, issues that might come in. So who should absolutely avoid event-driven altogether? So if the idea of eventual consistency really scares you and it's, uh, your business can absolutely not function without it, which is uh, extremely rare, uh, by the way, as a side note. In most cases, um, most businesses can operate with eventual consistency. It's just that they cannot operate it with that concept across the entire stack, right? Like meaning that they could operate with eventual consistency for let's say 70% of their stack and it would be totally fine. With that said, if you're not comfortable with that um, and you need exactly one semantics and you absolutely cannot lose any data, uh, then in that case, it might be a decent choice uh, or, or it might be a, a reason to avoid <laughs> event-driven altogether. Um, and this comes down to really to banking, high-frequency trading, human resources. But again, there is an asterisk in there because uh, it, there's, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's, uh, it needs to be avoided completely. Uh, just some particular areas like, so for instance, uh, for uh, human resources, 
you may not want to utilize event driven for calculating time off. Somebody will get angry at some point in time. Um, but at the same time, sending a reminder email about something, probably okay. So the takeaway from all this is that event driven is not really a silver bullet, right? Um, and it's also totally okay to have some parts that are still remain completely synchronous. It's not that big of a deal if there are some parts that are synchronous. Uh, it's just the fact that if you utilize event driven, you will likely not need some of those parts and you will improve things as a result. So while you probably have learned a lot right now and you are almost an expert and event driven, uh, you still may want to do some evening reading with a cup of tea. There have been a lot of articles written uh, about event driven and event driven like architectures and so on. And there are some random links in there uh, with some, some good material. So <clears throat> my observations here really are that uh, this is like a, one of the final slides here is that event driven is not new. Event driven has been around for a really long time. It is uh, just that it's become more accessible than ever before. Event driven is uh, now actually more doable uh, because compute has become cheaper and so has storage. And our, I think, our comfort level with complexity has dramatically increased, like to a point where. Uh, for example, like Kubernetes, uh, uh, imagining Kubernetes 20 years, uh, 20 years ago would be crazy. It's so complicated, all right? And now we are totally okay with it. I remember when Mesos and the stuff before Mesos ca even came out as well, uh, these papers that were written about this, this concept of orchestration, and I thought that it was really complicated. I don't think so anymore. I think it's actually pretty straightforward at this point. And I think the same sort of thing is happening with event driven. Um, so uh, I guess what I'm saying is that uh, essentially, if you want to achieve higher levels of reliability and higher levels of scale, you are eventually going to do asynchronous. And if you want to be able to contain that chaos that happens and you want to have some sort of rules around this, you need to create some sort of guardrails. And the guardrails are, well, this event-driven concept, this event-driven architecture though, that provides all the guardrails. And I'm going to finally leave you with one bit of, a, I guess, of a prediction of sort, is that I totally foresee that in the near future, we're going to get much more comfortable with event-driven. And event-driven concepts are going to be uh, just as common essentially as microservices as well. Same sort of thing that happened with sysadmin starting to do DevOps and having to migrate to that, that point. So with that said, you have achieved reliability nirvana. Yeah, all right. So my final slide here is really is just uh, if you enjoyed this talk, if you like the, the stuff that we talked about here, like uh, if you like event driven systems, if you like architecture talk and so on, come talk to me. I am on the Gopher Slack. I'm also on the, the Discord for GopherCon. Um, or just, yeah, ping me on email, the good old fashioned communication device. So that said, back to our hosts. Awesome. Thank you, Daniel. I am feeling the glow. Yes. Uh, yeah, I've reached out. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm there with you, man. Somebody so. screenshot. <laughs> yeah. right, right. Can I go again? No, 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 no. That oh, honor, that honor, <laughs> that honor goes to you, my friend. You now have a new profile. Yeah, pick. <laughs> yes. If you haven't been in the peanut gallery, you missed out on one of the most unfortunate screenshots of my life, of, of my face, at least, of my life. So. Do check that out. Do check that out. Yeah. It'll be pretty easy because I think in the next intermission we're going to swap this out back yeah. here. Yeah, we'll be. I'll slide <laughs> over, and then it'll just be you. I'll be haunting this conference from here on out <laughs> with that face. Oh man! Uh, so I just want to take right, okay. take a moment to thank all, all of our sponsors again for making all of this happen. Uh, make sure to attend their uh, virtual meeting spaces. Go check out the sponsors page. Many of them are doing giveaways and, and other types of uh, events and announcements surrounding the show. Um, I also want to like give a huge shout out again to Microsoft, Capital One, Salesforce for all coming together to help make this possible in this studio and live being able to live stream this to everybody and caption it uh, for free. So this has been really, really great. This operation, all the equipment, the space, 
to make the speakers comfortable, making all of this possible. It's, it's really been amazing so far, and we're only on day one. Yeah, we'll have to get some either behind the scenes pictures or drag a camera out there so you can see the whole crew that's on the other side of these windows out here signaling us through the glass. <laughs> I must say they could have sprung a little more for a fajito. It's a little <laughs> Yeah. You might see yeah. us with hats and it's a little see, you might see us if, with hats. If you see everybody looking cold, there's apparently a thing in here where it's the AC and the in just in the studio is very cold and yeah, facilities yeah, yeah. hasn't come to fix it. Yeah. Fortunately I would rather cold than hot, yeah. but mm. if by the end of the event you see us getting closer and closer <laughs> and kind <laughs> of huddling bundling, together, huddling yeah. together, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so um, next up, uh, something very near and dear to my heart is going to be Go Time. So we have a couple of segments with Go Time this week. Uh, the one coming up is called Go Beyond Work. So we've got a panelist with. Uh, a few of the speakers from this year uh, to talk about like go beyond work and the types of things that people might be using uh, go for yeah. for hobby related projects and things like that yeah and I think this is you know I think go time shines in a lot of ways but one of the ways that I see here and I really like that they do this is we're not just talking about you know industrial strength enterprise software all the time and this is they're highlighting what are people doing when they're tinkering for their side projects and what have you? And I like I like that, you know, kind of normalizing the fact that we've got side projects sometimes. We like to play around. It doesn't have to be too serious. It's how many of us got into the language, exactly. right? Yeah, exactly. You know, like it, it takes you a while and then you go build something at work and then you ask for forgiveness and yep. you hope they let you build more stuff in it. <laughs> yep. You said go build, huh? Oh, <laughs> hashtag dad jokes. All right, so that's two. All right, we got a dad joke <laughs> on air. <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm really looking forward to that. And, and yeah, we've got some speakers from this year, as, like you said. So that's going to be really cool. Yeah, and if you're not a listener to the podcast, I recommend you actually go listen to this, you know, uh, what are they up to, like 400 plus episodes now? Um, so there's always great panel discussions between kind of a rotating set of panelists. They've got really interesting guests that come in and talk about their use cases of Go, projects that they're building, how it's again being used inside their company. There's, you know. We and should also re remind folks about Go for Say. That's uh, mm. coming up on Friday, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah. tomorrow will be an AMA session with the Go team, yep. uh, with Go Time as well. And then Friday will be the game show, which there have been a lot of answers coming in. So there's been a number of respondents. So I'm mm. hoping for nice, nice, some good nice, stuff. Nice. But there's, I think we haven't hit the cap for the number of answers that they can have. Mm -hmm. So I think now comes the trolling. We, we, need, we need more of that. Well, before right. we switch over, though. What Aaron. is the most common command ran? Cargo build. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we shall not end on that. No, oh, at, no. Aaron, Aaron, Aaron. All right, all right. Yes, so sir. with that, <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, we'll hand it over to the Go Time team. You all want to do it with me? Uh, one, one, two. Three, it's, it's go, go time. time. Let's do it. It's go time. Hi everyone. It's so fun that you are joining us from GopherCon Europe, uh, GopherCon US, not Europe at all. I'm not saying that as the organizer. You're all aware here. <laughs> uh, another year of GopherCon. It's so exciting to see everybody online again. I hope you had a wonderful first day and I hope you had lots of fun in the workshops uh, yesterday for whoever attended. Um, my co host for today is Angelica. Hi. Hello. Uh, joining from the overseas of New York. <laughs> yeah, but soon to be flying to London next week. Oh, exciting. Finally. Exciting time to fly. Yeah. And we are joined by three wonderful gophers who have amazing side projects that are written in Go. 
And we have Sebastian Spank, who is a software engineer at InflexDB. And also, you know what, we'll tell about your wonderful projects right after the intro. We'll keep it interesting. Uh, for those who have not attended the talk or your talk has not been aired just yet, because there's a few more days of GopherCon ahead of us. And we have Daniela. W wait, Sebastian, where are you joining us from? I'm in the Microsoft studios here. So I'll so, do my talk here tomorrow. Oh, wow. Nice. Because everyone knows where the Microsoft studios are. And so it's in Washington. Yeah. And so, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Washington. Cool. Um, Daniela Petrucalek, you are joining us from my side of the overseas, from Europe, but not from the EU. Yes, uh, I'm currently based in the UK. Uh, I'm based in Bardemove. Uh, it is the south coast of England, basically. But yes, <laughs> Europe. Team Europe, yay. <laughs> yay. And you're a product owner at JPMC and you're a Google developer expert for Go. Yes, yes, yes. That's uh, as people say. <laughs> <laughs> and we have Linus Lee joining us. Uh, Linus, you're an independent software engineer and you're working on creative tools. Welcome. Yes, I am. Thank you. Um, I'm also in the Microsoft Studio. I'm, uh, I'm across the hallway from Sebastian, but it doesn't look like <laughs> it through the magic of, of studios. Um, yeah, it looks yeah. completely different in your backgrounds, but the sound quality is amazing. <laughs> um, well, it's great of you all to join. Uh, we're here to talk about your fun projects. Right, Angelica? We are, we are. But before we dive into your kind of fun projects, we want to hear a little bit about kind of when and why you started using Go. Where did it all start for you? Maybe uh, Danielle, you could dive in. How did sure, Go sure. come into your world? Uh, it's a fun thing that uh, I, I usually like to tell the story that, that I came for the community and stay uh, for the community because uh, I started with Go, uh, it was a few years ago, uh, when... We uh, see what you did there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a few years ago. Uh, anyway, uh, it was uh, basically in, in, back in, in the days I used to work a, a company in Brazil and they were heavy users of Go. And uh, I was getting engaged with the community, like in other languages, like PyLadies and other groups. And they, actually, they asked me to help organizing a, a women's group and, uh, to, and uh, basically a women who go chapter. And I didn't know what Go was about. <laughs> to be honest, I was just helping to organize the community. And then uh, I got the opportunity to go to GopherCon Denver. Uh, and, and then the magic happened. And I was simply in love with the language. And, uh, everything I I did, uh, after that, I was trying to use Go in some way or another. So attending the same GopherCon that you're attending now, this is all how it started well. Yes, definitely. So it's, it's a very like emotional thing to be back here and, 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 and contributing to this community, this amazing community. So yeah, it has a special place in my heart. Wow. Well, for all of us, how about you, Linus? How did Go come into your life? Yeah, so I, I actually started um, out in the web world. I learned to I learned to program doing JavaScript and and um, HTML web stuff, and then Go was sort of my way to figure out how to do lower level, I guess I guess backend programming. Um, I had like dabbled with things like Python and Ruby before, but I wanted something where I could have I could have a little bit of a lower level control over like what my data structures look like and um, and things like that without having to learn, I guess the only option back then, the only viable option was like C and C++, which is, um, great languages on their own, but more complex than I was so that my, I could fit into my brain at the time. And Go was sort of this like nice middle ground where I, there was things like the garbage collector and it was dynamic enough where I could wrap my head around it, but still let me write programs that I wanted to, that were fast enough and small enough and things like that. And so that's the way that I got into it. And I've, I've since stuck with it because it's, um, for all the good things that it offers. Awesome. How about you? Sebastian, how'd you uh, come to us? Yeah, well, it was love at first sight. I mean, the moment I saw that gopher Beautiful. mascot, I was like, let's do it. Like, this is it. Me <laughs> this too. Is the for I me. had no idea what it was. <laughs> well, and I was like, I right. just, that gopher. <laughs> I just, right. That was all, that was all I needed to convince me. I mean, before I was working with Python and C++, and it's kind of the same thing where it's just like, I felt a bit much doing the C++ and C stuff. And then Python was good, but it felt a bit messy and I really liked Go's opinionated way of doing things and yeah so 
then I started using it and it's been, I've been working on it professionally now, but uh, before it was just project stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. And no one really wants a Python plushie. Gophers are so much nicer. <laughs> <laughs> indeed indeed right one of, one of my before i came to the conference one of my i was talking to one of my coworkers, and he was um uh he asked him you're going to this gopher con thing what is what is a gopher con about and i was like oh you know it's, it's for all the people who love gophers and we talk just talk about <laughs> gophers for four days <laughs> oh my gosh but not showing off or anything but here's the one from singapore I was going to ask. That was what I was gonna, just about to ask. I was going to be like, I've not seen that purple one and I want it. It has a tail. It has a tail from the famous um, um, fountain in Singapore. Mm. It was gorgeous. Um, okay, awesome. So we've heard about your start. So, um, yeah, are you all still working in Go now? And how long actually have you been doing this? I can take a stab at it. So I've... I've been using Go in one form or another for at least like two to three years. I think that's when my, I, I wrote my first kind of Go projects. Um, I've written I've written Go professionally a little bit. Like I've squeezed into I've squeezed it into some projects here and there that aren't like what you'd call like production products, but that are like sort of infrastructure, like testing services or things like that. Just because it's like a nice thing that you can build and it doesn't. One of the nice things about Go is that we value uh, stability a lot. And so if you write a thing and it doesn't go, you know, maintain daily. For a few months, it doesn't break over time. Um, <laughs> but but most of my usage of Go has been on side projects, on things like the thing that I'm going to talk about today, um, but also other things like little chat clients that I've written and it comes to learning learning exercises. Yeah, I, I can go next. I think, uh, unfortunately, I feel like I almost like uh, I'm. I, I'm, I'm I'm trying to think of the best word way to say this, but I, bar I barely wrote any kind of Go code in production. Uh, so I, I, I spent about, I don't know, well, one year uh, back when I was working at GoCardless, but that's about it. And most of my career uh, in code, so in terms of Go development, is uh, basically side projects and things I like to do and, and tutorials and things as you, <laughs> as you know a little bit about. But yeah. Uh, haven't been doing a lot of Go, unfortunately. I was trying to find my way into uh, working with Go, but uh, yeah, for some reason, it didn't happen. That's that's super interesting. That is unexpected, but that's cool. Uh, Sebastian, how about you? Yeah, I guess I had the good fortune of being able to work with Go now professionally for the past year at uh, Influx State, working on the Telegraph project. And uh, it's been fantastic because before that, it was also just kind of dabbling with it and just whenever I could for projects. And um, technically, for half a year, I professionally, of air quotes, worked with Go, but just because I was just doing it on a project that nobody else wanted to work on. But <laughs> who knows where, who knows where that, what that ended up with. But now, <laughs> uh, yeah, doing it professionally with Telegraph. And it's been fantastic. Open source project with Go. It's a, uh, everything I could dream of as far as a career. Yeah. Okay. So speaking of career, Sebastian, would you like to tell us about your fun project Ooh. to go? <laughs> hey, awesome. Did you 3D print that? Um, for everybody who is uh, listening in but not watching, I have a little uh, 3D printed gopher that I received uh, from a colleague in previous company. And uh, he 3D printed it. His, um, I, I don't think he planned to print gophers. I don't think his team works in gophers in Go. Uh, but he he is a fan of the mascot, so that was like a nice gift. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I should have brought some myself. <laughs> but I <didn't> print it. <laughs> but of course, you got nothing to show off here. I guess I have to wait for my talk tomorrow. Got some screenshots of them. But uh, yeah, I guess my project. So. One of the things, so during my during quarantine, one of the pro craft projects I started was 3D printing. And the first thing I did was I created a thermal detonator prop from Star Wars and then used Tiny <laughs> Go to make like the light, LED light shine and play some audio. Mm. So that was pretty fun. And then I kind of started looking at other ways I could involve Go with 3D printing. And it was, uh, yeah. So they've got like this whole thing called Octoprint that helps monitor and remotely, con remotely control your 3D printer. And I was kind of looking at ways to, to extend that using Go. And uh, but yeah, it's been fun. It's kind of like, you know, it's the 3D print. It's not like I'm writing the firmware for the 3D printer or anything. But uh, as far as Go is concerned, it's kind of like building up around it. 
and also 3D modeling gophers to 3D print as well. So <laughs> that's you know, the main the main thing I was doing there. Yeah, and, that's not uh, an obvious choice to choose go for 3D printing uh, for for the modeling. Uh, yeah, which is actually pretty cool. I wasn't aware that you could do it either because uh, I was mainly using like Blender and open source product you know, common open source projects for 3D modeling that use user interfaces. But there is a package out there that you can uh, create 3D models using Go. And yeah, it's pretty cool. It's just like primitive shapes kind of glued together. So we'll show a screenshot of that tomorrow. But it's, yeah, get end up with a very round looking gopher because it's just a <laughs> sphere <laughs> of other uh, primitive objects glued on it. But yeah, it's all written in Go. So a gopher written in Go is possible. With um, uh, the, and the open source package I use is called, I uh, forgot the user's name, but it's like SDFX, I believe. But so if you look that up, you can, uh, yeah, model your own gopher with it. And you yeah. were, go ahead. And you're, you're talking about um, spheres and just building shapes out of spheres reminds me of when I built, um, where I was looking at building ray tracers. And sphere is just the simplest shape to write a ray tracer for. And so you start just building scenes out of only spheres and everything. Like your ground is just a gigantic sphere with an infinite radius. And you're building like raindrops on a giant sphere. Um, what does it what does it actually look like to build a model with with Go? Are you like outputting it to a file? Or are you talking to an API for the printer? Yeah. So what you output is an STL file. And it's like the standard format file where you kind of do in 3D printing. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just like a bunch, it's a file format that describes the geometry like a bunch of triangles, but it writes out, the, I, it's like magic, but it's, they use like signs, something called sign distance functions to find the primitive shapes mm -hmm. in the code and then output that to the STL file, which you can then uh, slice into a G code for the 3D printer to print out. And uh, so how yeah. many times did you have to reprogram it before you actually got a beautiful gopher? Because I would assume <laughs> you had a few interesting looking shapes that yeah, may have resembled a gopher, <laughs> but uh, may not right. have been a gopher. <laughs> <laughs> Making its eyes and its pupils look <laughs> not like an actual <laughs> gopher shape is, uh, is tricky, but I, I think I got, I got something that looks like a gopher. You know, it's not, it's not you got your iconic mouth and teeth, and then you're like, bam, it's a gopher. You're done. It's a sphere with, you know, eyes and a square. <laughs> but that's all you need. The uh, yeah, the beauty of the gopher transcends all shapes. It just, yeah. <laughs> I, mu I must say, I really admire anyone that can do 3D modeling. Uh, this is uh, <laughs> such a thing that my brain can't process. That's why when I, I go to my hobbies, I only do 2D things. Because my brain just can't process the third dimension. I really admire that. I'm uh, looking forward to seeing your, uh, your talk, how it works. Yeah, I did cheat and use Blender to uh, make it sexier looking than the spheres. But <laughs> yeah, it's uh, definitely my first thing I've ever 3D modeled before. Usually I'm also just working in the 2D space. It's definitely more comfortable. <laughs> Did you use Go because it was the best language to do this or because you write Go anyway? Or did you think about using other languages, try it out before settling on Go? That's a good question. No, I, I chose it because I wanted to write in okay. the language. Because, uh, I mean, technically, Python is, uh, is for Octoprint, the software I mentioned written in, and mm -hmm. it's kind of like that's the ecosystem. And that, there's a lot of good community work around it, but I was like, no, I'm going to go against the stream doing Go, <laughs> regardless <laughs> if I if it's the best choice or not. I'll find out at the end. And, I mean, it's it's pretty nice to work with, the you know, just all the benefits of using Go binary that you can uh, send around easily and, yeah, don't have to worry about Python versions and setting virtual environments. So... <laughs> Yeah. Interesting. You can cross compile to all the different 3D printers. <laughs> right. <laughs> Is there uh, anything yeah. that using Go um, allows you to do that you wouldn't be able to do with a Blender? I guess you could sort of programmatically generate a bunch. Like if you wanted a grid of spheres or something, you could programmatically generate it. But yeah, what, what have you experimented with that you that would be hard to do in Blender or another piece of software? Uh, I guess. So I, I'm. 
I am a pretty much a novice with as far as 3D modeling is concerned, but so I, I was, I couldn't figure out. So the reason why I used Blender to like finalize the gopher, cause I couldn't really figure out how to make like a nice, like hourglass shape for the gopher, you know, like that perfect mm. body. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it wasn't just two uh, spheres attached to each other. Uh, but I guess, I mean, I guess the benefit of using Go for it is the fact that it, you can now just send that piece of program to somebody and they can uh, adjust it and easily shareable. Uh, I mean, right, you could send your Blender files, share those as well. But yeah, I felt like the learning curve was also a little bit easier. The fact that it is just Go and just defining shapes while using the user interface, interface for Blender is, uh, is tricky. There's definitely a steep learning curve there. But it's true. Yeah. Have you used it before? Have you done 3D modeling? I have personally not. I've, I've looked at it. I've, I had some friends. Um, my, my roommate in college was uh, like a mechanical engineering major, and he, uh, he dabbled in it. He would make some stuff for me occasionally. Um, and I always thought it was cool. But again, because of that like learning curve, where you look at someone's computer when they're doing it, and you're like, I'll never be. That looks like a professional power tool kind of interface. And that scares mm -hmm. you off a little bit. But if it's just a Go program, maybe, maybe I'll give it a shot. Yeah, I definitely recommend it. I feel like I need what? to go buy myself a 3D printer now. Give it I a go. I also recommend that. <laughs> 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 yeah, and they're surprisingly consumer uh, consumer friendly as far as the price okay. and the setup is concerned. You'll need space, I suppose, is the biggest thing. And uh, patience. Just put it right in the middle of my lounge will be the centerpiece. <laughs> or just continuously churn out gophers. <laughs> yes, that's, <laughs> that's the ideal setup. That's how it works in my house. <laughs> I think that you alluded to earlier um, from another question was like the debug cycle, which I imagine is a little slower than just running the code. Like, it, do you, I guess you can run it and then look at the model inside Blender or something like that. Um, but do you ever have like a hardware debug cycle where you print it and you're like, oh, this is this oh, looks yeah. bad and then you have to rewrite the program? I kind of missed that question. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I don't know if there's a better way of doing it than just building it and running it and being like, well, that's, <laughs> it's a couple millimeters to the left, shoot, like scoot it over. I, I'm a big advantage of using Blender Fuser interface. You can just scoot it over and you can right. see where it's supposed to land. But, you know, in the world space, I was definitely just guessing the coordinates. I was definitely going to mention that in my talk where it's like, these numbers are made up. <laughs> like, this was just me <laughs> hoping for the best and, and they ended up in the right spot. Mm. So, Try yeah. an error. Right. I, I had yeah. an uh, interesting experience with that uh, when I was uh, writing some games. I also do a lot of guessing in terms of positioning things. So in the end, I ended up using uh, Steve Francia's, uh, I don't remember now if it's Viper or Cobra, the one that, uh, that, that uh, uh, library that help, that helps load configuration dynamically. So it's basically mm -hmm. every time I had something I need to set up a, a, a different thing in the screen. I used a dynamic configuration and I was reloading JSON files on the fly and you just could save it because the render was just updating the screen every single frame. I was just the, kind of automating my trial and error just uh, with dynamic configuration. That might, I don't know <laughs> if you thought about something. Uh, I'm not sure how fast is rendering, but in my case it was just one frame. So that was pretty fast. Yeah, it was pretty quick in the sense that there was like the slice, I was using the slicer the program to, to get it to the 3D printing format. And I just, you can reload it in there, but it felt pretty hacky, but <laughs> yeah, sorry. What were you gonna say? I was gonna say, let, let's hear more. Let's go from, from 3D to 2D. Um, yeah. Daniela, I would love to hear a little bit about, you talked about some of your, in the weeds, how you got it working, how you tested it, but like, what is your project? And uh, how did it, how did it come to be? I would say, pre requisite and I said this to the group before, um, I have a very, very special place in my heart for this project because when I was but a young gopher, not even, when I was but a young newbie dweeb looking at the computer science world for a language that fit, I went to Gotham Go and saw you do your talk on this side project. And it got me so excited. I went home and spent the entire weekend building it. And that was, that was one of the main things I was like, this is my language. This is so fun. I'm ready. Let me be a gopher. <laughs> I'm ready. I love. I love this attitude, and I'm really ha uh, happy that uh, it had this such an influence. Because, uh, yeah, uh, 
start uh, getting from the start uh, the beginning since people don't know my project yet uh, basically I wrote this uh, tutorial which I call Pac-Man from scratch or Pac-Go for short because not a man is a gopher maybe <laughs> uh, so uh, and the idea is to build uh, the rebuild the classical game of Pac-Man uh, only using Go and the standard library not in, no external like fancy packages and in order to abstract the drawing function because this is, tends to be the most complex thing in games like how how you render to screen and i didn't want to expose people to this level of complexity uh, we ended up using like the terminal as your screen and since go supports unicode you can actually print emojis in the terminal so mm -hmm. the entire board of the game is rendered using emojis and uh, using some clever tricks uh, with nc escape sequences you can put colors and draw walls and things like that and, and there are some things that uh, go makes really easy to to do like especially for instance you want to uh, separate your uh, input handling from the main program you can use a go routine and channels so uh, this, things like this in other languages i tried to do this before like c and others kind of you need to learn threads you need to learn synchronization all this more advanced concepts, but Go makes it really easy for a beginner to have a look. Oh yeah, maybe you don't even fully understand what a Go routine is or a channel is, but it's enough for you to get started and do something. <laughs> uh, and the whole idea of this project was to give the community something uh, in terms of tutorial, like a starting point, a bit more interesting than building APIs, because I know APIs <laughs> we ended up doing this for, for work, but why not having something more fun that has visual feedback like so you can see things moving on the screen i don't know for me it's magical and yeah uh, but maybe that's uh, because also uh, the only reason why i'm in this industry now is because i love games and i always want to work with games and that was kind of like my oh yeah uh, i i never worked with games before but this is my opportunity i'll make something with games and go and yeah that's how it started <laughs> Yeah, and I think the beauty of it is exactly what you just said. For people who are learning Go, whether from another language or completely it's their first language, you go through that phase where you're like going through all the like Go tutorials and you're trying to do this little, little like app and you try and print Hello World. But then you hit this ceiling where you're like, I, what, what do I do now? I know the basics. I, I want to build something that feels like an accomplishment, that feels exciting, that feels like, oh, this is something I want to like show my friends, show my family, be like, look. I can code now and this is fun it's colorful as you say it gives you that visual feedback and it gives you as a beginner that feeling of accomplishment and like I, I did this I made it through that tutorial and I accomplished this thing um, and I think the beauty of how you framed it is that you've really paid attention to making sure it is truly step by step and it really does guide any everyone through why you made a decision how you did it you provide the code so you can look through. Um, I think it's wonderful. I'm like waiting for your next game to come out. Like, <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I've been a bit uh, busy with life and things, and <laughs> but, but <laughs> definitely there are more things uh, coming on uh, on your way. Yeah, stay tuned. Uh, I, I did actually a go a talk at GopherCon UK about my next project, uh, which is now it's a card game. Uh, I, I'm rebuilding uh, an old 80s card game that uh, it was very uh, i don't i can't even say it was popular where i came from it was just like the game we had when we were a child and we played that game so i couldn't find an international version of it so i only had like a, a scan of the the cards that i i used to reference the game but basically i'm rebuilding it but now i'm trying to be a bit more professional if I can say that, I definitely I can say that. Nothing close <laughs> to being a professional, but I'm using uh, this library called Abitan, which is a proper game uh, uh, game development library within Go uh, by Hajime Hoshi. Uh, uh, this this guy is amazing. Uh, really, thanks for writing Abitan. And yeah, so this work in progress. Uh, it's not very pretty now, but I have a functioning uh, prototype and. The code is open source, uh, but I didn't advertise that much because the, the game is ugly now. <laughs> it's not very beginner friendly. I was just kind of like a proof of concept, trying different things, learning everything uh, as it goes. 
as it goes. I did that again. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard not to say it. It's yeah. very easy to fall into the pattern. So, I mean, as you've been iterating on this on this project, as you've been building, and as you've been delving more into like the world of kind of games and programming for games, is Go a good language for these kind of projects? Or was it that you already liked Go and it, it was fun? Or in fact, is Go interesting, good to play with, but there are other languages that may serve the gaming function better? I think Go is, uh, yeah. Go is a very good language with some asterisks, like some side mm -hmm. notes, maybe. Uh, because uh, the traditional language for writing games, like uh, from if you are old school like me, is like C++ and C and things like that. Uh, and in terms of Go, is uh, I tend to see Go as an improved version of those languages because it abstracts so much. It, you, can, you don't need to worry about so much about memory management. You still need to worry a little bit about memory, but not as much. Uh, as you had to do in the past with these other types of languages. Of course, they also evolved, but I really like how Go is pretty straightforward, has a simple syntax, a cons very consistent uh, across all different features of the language. So it makes almost that gives almost that feeling of a scripting language. Like it's very simple to do simple things. And this is, I think that's the beauty of it. So it also becomes very productive. The problems come when, uh, because Go is traditionally a systems language, it's not very popular in the gaming industry. You don't have a lot of library support and things like that. You have the, the basics you have, like you have as SDL bindings, you have AB10 and a few other gaming libraries, but it's not widespread. So you don't have a large community that can help you support it. But essentially everything that you need to build a game, you have there. So I think that's kind of like, I love the language and I think that's almost like, um, as, as Sebastian uh, said as well, but maybe uh, Go was not the best option, but th that was the language I want to work with. And so that's kind of why I decided, but I think overall, I think that you can do good games with Go and even AB10, they are just recently publishing their first game in, uh, on Nintendo Switch. So you can see it can be used for like real games, like real commercial games. Awesome. Daniela, uh, I'm super curious as somebody who is known, who knows nothing about game development. When you say gaming libraries, what kind of tools do they give you? Like, what does it? What, what do you need in a gaming library? Uh, a lot of things, <laughs> actually. But uh, I'd say the most uh, basic ones are how do you handle inputs? Like, uh, in a, when you're writing a game, you don't really want to care if you, the player has a keyboard, or, uh, a gamepad or mm -hmm. anything else. You don't want to worry about specific drivers for different types of inputs. You want mm -hmm. the game library to give you this for free. And you just know, want to know, key was pressed and you'll do your mappings into the, the thing. And the second thing is drawing to the screen. Uh, another good example, you don't really care about the low level part of drawing to the screen. You just want to say, plot my pixel there and that's it. Or uh, so like relative ten percent down from the beginning of the screen, kind of. Yeah, and that, it, it, and I'm talking only about like two D and three D gets way more complex, but like scaling operations, rotation, mm -hmm. all the kind of transformations you can do in, in an image, and also sound. Sound is a huge thing. Like uh, I don't want to write like a, a music player. Uh, I should get this for free from my gaming library, things like that. So. Maybe sometimes you you have some kind of artificial intelligence process uh, that you can just write an AI as in a script and the, the engine will load that script as a, a, and control your enemies and things like that. So uh, this is kind of support. So you can focus really on the content creation because what makes or breaks your game is really not the, necessarily the code, is the art. Uh, is the sounds, is your assets. Mm -hmm. I, like, I like to say it's, it's all about your assets. Yeah, that resonates with me a lot, actually. I've tried to, um, occasionally I've come across, I'm not a big gamer, but occasionally I've come across little like Steam games that I thought were really beautiful and well done. And, and at times I, I've had the thought of, oh, maybe I should get into, try to build a game of my own. And uh, the thing that I always bump against is I can write the logic. I can probably learn to use one of the game engines and try to make something that's interactive and do the things that I, I, I want to do. But the things that, make a game, the things that make a video game really compelling is all the art and all the sounds and the design and like 
that requires me making 3D models, which as we discussed is difficult uh, and doing art and, and having even just building a storyline behind it and all the character design and things like that. And that's a, that's a whole other, other art that's outside of yeah. software. There, there's a huge like iceberg of game development that's uh, about, uh, if you think that the presentation is just like a thin layer, but you have assets like in terms of art, sound effects and music. It's also either kills your game or make the best, uh, you'll give a, like a, amazing results. But also the whole part about game design of how your, your game mechanics work, like what are the winning scenarios? What, uh, what are your objectives? How can you make that thing rewarding for the player so they will be engaged and really enjoy playing your game? How can you uh, balance your game? So you're, you're like, this is, has a, a decent amount of challenge plus reward. So these are the hard parts. And also my brain is kind of, I, I'm, I'm really bad at this and I'm trying to get better, but also partnering with the right people can uh, definitely help a lot in this. I have a great idea for your game, Daniela, to make it really rewarding. You can use Sebastian's work and 3D print the cards. <laughs> mm. I think that's a great, uh, great idea. <laughs> you know, you always feel paper cards in the hand, and once you'll feel like more chunkier, like reminding like a phone, it will be very interesting. You know, you have to pay more attention when you do that. <laughs> Revolutionary. <laughs> well, talking about something that's very challenging, engaging, and rewarding, Linus, let's hear yes. a little bit about your awesome project. Yeah, so my project is a is called Oak. It's a toy programming language. Um, so what that means is it's it's a pro it's a programming language that you can use to write things like web servers and, and little apps and command line interfaces and things like that. Uh, but it's a toy language, so it's not something that you're going to use at work or to to build a production service uh, for lots of reasons. Um, but it's it's a dynamically typed scripting language. It looks a little bit like JavaScript. It works a little bit like Lua if you've used it. Um, but it's a Go program. So it's a, it's a language that's written in Go. And what that means is that when you uh, run the Oak CLI to start up a REPL or to run a file, that thing that is running the file is a Go program. But the, the program source code that it's running is written in a, new, in a, in a language that I made up called Oak, um, if that makes any sense. It's a little bit sort of recursive. Um, but yeah, and so part of it was designing the actual syntax and semantics of what the language is going to be able to do, how it works, what are the types, what are the values, what are the things you can do, how do you define functions and things like that. And the other part is actually implementing, in, in Oak's case, the interpreter that actually takes the syntax of the program you've written and does the thing that the program is supposed to do. Um, and also incidents with the other things like telling you errors and, and concurrency and a, a lots of other things um, that, that you might encounter as, a, as an interpreter. How did you come up with the idea to do this in Go? Like, did you say, I want to learn Go and I want to learn Go by creating a new language? It was a mix, actually. So before Oak, there was Ink, which is the, the <laughs> conceptual predecessor to Oak. They're both, they're very similar languages, but Ink was the first language, the toy language that I made. I made it after ha having gone through like a tutorial, like how to make a basic list interpreter. And I wanted to make something that was a little more usable and looked frankly, like had the syntax that I wanted. Cause everyone always, when they first learned programming, they're like, oh, I wish. I, I really like this language, but I wish this keyword said something different or like the symbol was a different symbol. And it was my chance to like play, play God uh, with my own language. And um, to do that, actually at that point, I, had, I was mostly proficient with only like uh, the really dynamic languages like JavaScript and Python. And so I needed to learn a, a compiled language that, that was a lower level to be able to build an interpreter that was actually usable. And um, Go is not the typical language that you would use for such a task. You usually use like C++ or uh, more increasingly common is like Rust or, or other languages like that. Uh, but I, as I noted before, it was harder for me to wrap my head around those at the time than it was for me to, to learn Go. And Go was uh, low level enough for me to be able to build an interpreter. And so Ink was my first Go, like learning Go project. Um, and, and simultaneously, I was also trying to learn how to build a programming language. That's super cool. Did you, has anybody made anything real cool out of your programming language, Ink? Um, oh. <laughs> I have. <laughs> so, um, and then other people have used some of the stuff that I've built. Um, actually, uh, one thing that's relevant for the Go community is uh, if you guys are familiar with the Go by Example website, mm -hmm. where it, it sort of walks you through Go and uh, tells you, gives you kind of different examples of how different parts of Go works. 
Um, so a guy uh, named Andrew, uh, man, his name is escaping me now. Uh, but um, Andrew something. He he. Uh, we we've talked on the phone before, but he made a an ink by example site. Um, and just as Go by example is written in Go, and Go compiles the website, ink by example is written in ink. Um, <laughs> and so it compiles itself. And Ink has its own syntax highlighter and, and sort of code formatter and things like that. And so the website uh, looks a lot like Go by example. It's inspired by Go by example, but it's it's a website for Ink that someone else made that isn't me, which was super cool to see that there was like another user for the language. And then on top of Ink, I've made a bunch of my own personal apps like Twitter clients and notes apps and things like that that I use day to day. That's super cool. I guess the next you mentioned is... uh, uh, Lua in your uh, opening statement. I, I was just wondering because Lua is very common to uh, in the game development community write for AI scripts. Would right. you see your language uh, 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 could be used for the same type of use, like writing scripts for AIs or things like that? Yeah, that's a great question. So toy, a lot of the domain of toy language is actually for embedding in other programs. And Lua is a great example of that. I think there are some specific things about Lua that make it really great for embedding in a game specifically. Um, the things that come to mind are like uh, Lua is a really small language. Uh, it's written in C. It's it's pretty readable, and so you can. Uh, it's fairly easy to embed in terms of just like the technical work involved uh, to embed it into another program. The other thing that makes Lua unique is that it has features of the language and of the interpreter that make it easy for you to fit it into another larger program. So Lua has, I forget what it's called, but it has like a type that is supposed to be like an opaque type that just wraps something else from the hosted from the host program. So if you have a game and you have like a like a C struct that represents a character or an object or something, you can just wrap that and expose it to Lua with some APIs. Um, it's also fairly easy to define foreign function interfaces for Lua code to be able to call C functions. Uh, and I think that's what makes Lua really great for game development. Oak in theory, in theory has those things, um, minus the CFFI, but uh, because it's embedded inside Go, Anything that that includes Oak has to also include the Go runtime, which makes it a little heavier and is more opinionated. How can the community contribute to this these languages to Ink and to Oak? You looking yeah. for documentation, code contributions? Yes, for sure. Um, Ink is actually so one of the reasons I made Oak was that I I made Ink and then I used it for a couple of years to build stuff. And it was usable because I, I I made stuff with it. By definition, it was usable, but it was not very good. Um, the language is kind of tough to use. The interpreter sucks a little bit because of the particular ways. Um, when you when you learn to build an interpreter in school or in a course, there are specific things that, that you spend a lot of time on, like parsing and compiling. And there's things that you don't spend as much time on that are actually, turns out, are really important and hard to get right. And one of those things is like error handling. Um, what, if you if you're trying to getting other trying to get other people to use your language, most of the time they're going to be spending initially is going to be writing incorrect programs and getting errors. And um, to do error reporting correctly, you have to gather a lot of information about the runtime of the program, like where it's happening, what's causing it, and be able to give you, give users really helpful errors. And um, none of the tutorials cover that properly. And so that that's like mistakes like that I accumulated over time. And eventually when I wrote Oak, I fixed a lot of those. So Ink isn't as usable as Oak. And if you want to check things out, I check out Oak. Um, I'm still sort of tinkering away at it as a solo project. But if you want to try it, you're welcome to try it. Um, and then if you have any like problems you find with it or, or bugs, filing those would be super helpful. Um, if you have opinions on how Oak should work differently, I have my own opinions, and the point of Oak is to manifest them. But if you have your own opinions, that's a Go project. It's not that complicated. You can probably read through it and come to my talk to figure out how it works. Um, and it's only a few thousand lines. And so you could fork it, uh, make it into your own, change all the keywords and all the syntax, and make your own language out of it, too. That's awesome. Tempting. How about Daniela? If people want to help, want to get involved, want to live the, their best pack Go life, how do they do that? So I have the, 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 the GitHub uh, repo for PackGo, like it's github.com, my user dennycat slash PackGo. And uh, we already had a lot, actually a lot of contribution from the community. Uh, I think I, I built into step eight and uh, there, I think we now we have step 10 or 11 or something like that. So people definitely uh, were inspired and started creating new content for it. It kind of it's a bit abandoned now, uh, from my perspective. Uh, I wish I could have supported it better. So uh, things like Go modules, testing, and, and uh, are some topics that we're not covering in the, in the 
traditional uh, workshop that I think if people are willing to contribute, that would be amazing. Like a chapter on Go modules, a chapter um, on testing, things like that. That would be great. Sebastian, how do we contribute? How do we help? How do we get involved? Yeah, I guess I'm mostly thinking of using Oak to write a Pac-Man game now. So, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, yeah, I guess I've got my Gopher model uploaded, so you're welcome to download and 3D print that. So that helps me of just seeing more Gophers out in the world. But then, uh, so part of the thing I worked on was a plugin for the Telegraph project that I'm working on now as a full-time maintainer uh, to interact with Octoprint. And that's just an open source repository. You're welcome to whatever you want with that's written in Go. But uh, yeah, maybe extend it, add more features to it. Awesome. <laughs> cool. Well, that's inspiring and also gives us all ideas on what can we do in our free time. Um, OK, time for unpopular opinions. <laughs> Okay, so you know the rules. You have uh, the stage to tell us what is your unpopular opinion. It does not have to be about your project, about tech, about anything at all. It can be about anything. And we will then go and ask on Twitter to see if your unpopular opinion is really unpopular or yes, popular. Uh, Linus, would you like to start? Sure, I'll take it. Um, I, my unpopular opinion is that it, it's actually probably a more popular opinion, but it's, it's phrased, the way that I'm phrasing it, I think is, is um, important, which is that I think it's an accident of history that we don't expect every computer user to be able to program. Um, I've been watching a lot of, uh, this is going to uh, reveal my age now, but I, I've been watching what I consider to be older TV program, programming about computers, um, computer programs that were coming out in the like uh, mid uh, and late 80s and early 90s. And it's kind of astonishing how all those programs sort of expect the user to buy the program and then like use macros or scripts to program it to fit their use case. Uh, things like databases or word processors, or there's tons and tons of support for just, you buy the thing and then to make it useful, you program it. And to a certain extent, all these consumers of software are expected to program a little bit and know how computers work and customize it. And it's, it's a little sad, I think, that we don't, um, we don't expect that of users anymore. And we expect them to just take the product and, and use it. And I wish... I wish there was more software that uh, expected and taught people to think um, in terms of programming and, and try to customize their software to work the way that they wanted to. Okay, Sebastian. Yeah, I guess my unpopular opinion is I think that if your open source project has a, a hand-drawn logo on it, then it's a good open source project and it can be <laughs> trusted. <laughs> so cool. just, you, can, you can judge it by the cover. <laughs> hey, Daniela. Okay, I think my unpopular opinion will make me the most unpopular person in GopherCon this year. Uh, but, uh, yeah, uh, sorry guys, but I don't think Go really needs generics. Oh. <laughs> da, da, da. oh. <laughs> what a mic drop to the end of the show. Thank you, Daniela. We have, we have intentionally, we knew you'd say that, maybe. That's why we asked you to go last, yeah. But that's a, that's a brave choice. To wrap this up, thanks everyone for your interesting insights and sharing about your fun projects and for talking about that at GopherCon. And thanks everybody who tuned in. Enjoy the talks and see you around the Discord. Yeah. Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you to our awesome yeah, host, Natalie. Awesome as always. See. All right, thanks everybody for uh, the great <laughs> panel discussion yeah. with the GoTime like, team and panelists. And we're looking forward to the rest of the content <laughs> they have for the rest of the week. So what's interesting is I want to tell a little story here. Linus was talking about how... Can I, can uh, I do a quick update on the studio status? It is now this cold. Oh, yes. It's, it is Sorry, getting colder yeah. in here. <laughs> <laughs> Next thing you know, we're you're going to see a little heater, like yeah. a little space heater, you know, hanging out here. Also a little huddle. You know, send, marshmallows. send marshmallows. Yeah, send it's, marshmallows. It's getting, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Sorry, Derek. Please continue. <laughs> so um, Linus was telling a story about how he was talking to people who had no idea what GopherCon was and, like, what is this? And he's like, oh, it's a story 
or it's a conference about people who love gophers. So one of the years, I want to say it was 2015, uh, we were in the Denver Convention Center, and we had most of the convention center, but there was another kind of event taking place in parallel in some of the other rooms. And they actually got really mad with the convention center because they couldn't believe how insensitive they were to schedule them aside like GopherCon, Gopher. it turned out it was the Cattle Ranchers Association, and they weren't pleased with what gophers were doing. Gophers. <laughs> <laughs> and That's we had to explain this has nothing to do with actual oh, gophers. gophers. <laughs> right. Oh, my goodness. Oh. So how's the peanut gallery channel going? There's some good stuff going on in there. I mean, can it live back up to the weird uh, screenshot of me? Well, I think maybe, because we now have a screenshot of you doing Oh, this. yeah, doing your... Mm, um, right, yeah, 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 that's true, that's true. It looks you can get more a, like you're I'm doing a doo-doo. A doo-doo, <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, a dada and a doo-doo, okay. Yeah. We can get a slideshow of those later. <laughs> yeah. We also have a new channel, uh, the Engineering Quotes channel. So my favorite one from there is an anonymous quote from a senior engineer that's a, this will be easy, and then there's a narrator. Uh, if we can get Morgan Freeman, we will. But I don't know his schedule. Uh, the narrator will say it wasn't, you know, to follow up on that. I, so, yeah. I think you should attempt the Morgan Freeman voice. <laughs> I, don't I don't think we go don't anywhere think. today until you get it down. Okay, I got to go and go to the voice warm-up and everything, and I'll get back to everybody <laughs> with that. So, yeah. All right, well, should we head over to our next speaker? I think we should. No. All right, well, we've got Akhil uh, Indurti. He is a software engineer at Comcast, and he's done a ton, a ton, like, I mean it, like a ton of stuff with static analysis and Go. Um, here, a couple of things here. He's written a bunch of static analysis that's been integrated into Command Vet, so the standard Go tooling. Uh, he's contributed to the standard library. He's contributed to the compiler. Uh, and a lot of the work that he's done has also been large-scale refactorings at Comcast for his team. Uh, and that's, you know, a huge use case for static analysis, right? You can do these refactorings fairly quickly and reliably without having to, like, rerun the whole test suite and all that because you can analyze the code. With that, Akhil, take it away. Thanks for the introduction, Aaron. Um, uh, I'm Akhil Indurti, a software engineer at Comcast. And uh, I'm going to talk about how to write a static analyzer in, for Go code. Um, so this presentation is going to go over uh, what static analysis is, why you would want to write one, uh, what makes for a good static analyzer, and how do I actually go about writing one. And the analyzer we're going to be talking about today is uh, one that checks that after you've uh, opened a connection or a file or something, uh, that you've ch uh, handled an error and then you've closed it afterwards. And then there are some uh, discussion of false positives that you might encounter along the way. So first, what is static analysis? Um, uh, the idea is to check that some arbitrary property holds about your program. Uh, and, and you want to know that without running it, hence the static part. Um, uh, so answering questions about your program without running it, uh, examples of static analysis tools that you might have run before, the Go compiler itself. Uh, the front end of the compiler is, uh, uh, will parse and type check your program and report errors about like, the, the syntax of your code or if the types are consistent. Um, uh, you run this all the time. And there's uh, GoVet, or Command Vet, which integrates a bunch of static analysis tools into it, like uh, checking, for example, that your format string is correct. Um, there's Static Check, which is a large suite of tools that uh, is very popular in the Go community, and that uh, is in many uh, project CI pipelines. Um, uh, if you tech, uh, step away from programming uh, and, and consider, uh, like, uh, uh, anal analysis tools in general, uh, you might consider like a spelling grammar checker for a, doc a Word document to be uh, uh, like a sort of static analysis tool, or grappling over uh, like some text for some pattern to be a tool. Although they're not as semantically focused on, uh, on a code base or a particular language, they're still checking for patterns and things. Um, so the types of questions that you might want to ask about a program Right? Are my types consistent? So if I declare a variable of type int and I try to concatenate to it a, a, concatenate to it a string, uh, well, that's going to have inconsistent typing. Um, um, uh, it, and, and so your Go compiler will complain about that. 
uh, is there a data race in my program? So this is something that's pretty hard to verify statically uh, unless you, know, you introduce a ton of annotations. Uh, but if, uh, if you use something like the Go race detector, uh, which will introduce instrumentation so that when you run your program, it it'll like, uh, catch these issues at runtime, then you'll be able to find these errors uh, a lot of the time. Another thing you might want to ask about your program, am I leaking connections? So if you have like some web server that's constantly op uh, opening and closing connections to a database or some, uh, or some network device, uh, you might be like uh, uh, creating tons of connections uh, at, like, at runtime. And uh, it, you want to make sure that like over the course of your program running for uh, uh, many hours or days, that it's not slowly leaking more and more connections. How do you check that uh, without deploying to produ production um, or to a, a, like a, a long-term testing environment? Um, uh, or are you using the proper units for arithmetic? So uh, sometimes you might uh, like multiply a time.second by a time.millisecond or add those things. And uh, in, in, according to the Go's type system, those are just integers. They, they don't have separate types. And, uh, and so uh, like, uh, one thing you could do here is to introduce some static analysis tool that checks that, uh, hey, uh, you're, the arithmetic that you're doing doesn't really make sense. Um, uh, so why exactly would you want to write your own static analysis tool? There's uh, plenty of static analysis tools uh, out there, uh, like in static check and, and go vet. Uh, uh, like, uh, first of all, why would you want to like uh, use one of these uh, outside of your compiler and, and testing environment uh, in the first place? Um, so, I guess if we, we should first talk about like uh, how you catch issues in, in a project or a program. Uh, you'll often go through this pipeline of you compile your program, uh, you uh, test it, uh, in uh, either do unit tests or integration tests. You might introduce logs, um, uh, uh, metrics, and traces to uh, uh, to uh, ingest information about like uh, uh, related to like sending alerts, um, and you might use that information to like uh, debug your program. Um, static analysis uh, comes in very early in this pipeline, like around when you compile it. You could argue that static analysis might come before you compile your program because you know you're, uh, in your editing environment you're often getting a bunch of errors from your editor, um, and uh, and so like why would you? Uh, need additional tooling outside of what your compiler or your uh, testing tool provides. Uh, well, the advantage of static analysis, uh, or the disadvantage of unit tests, I should say, is that like, it's often easy to miss, miss edge cases. You might uh, be checking that a property holds for everything, for all of some input or data set, and you might not be able to test exhaustively test every single item in that data set, so you may end up uh, uh, hitting an edge case. Um, uh, uh, an issue related to observability is often that like it can be hard to trace back issue to to the uh, source in your like actual program because it's further in um, uh, uh, like it, it happened way later when you deployed it and if you notice that uh, that uh, picture before uh, the further along in the pipeline you were the the redder things got and that uh, and that was meant to signify that like it's often more expensive to fix an issue when you've are already deployed a program. Uh, and so, it's a stack analysis can be a, a pretty cost-effective way in terms of like uh, dollars, I guess, uh, to catch things earlier. Although, like, uh, there's something to be said about the amount of work you have to put in to, uh, to satisfy a static analysis tool. Um, um, so, so rea and really, you should just think of static analysis j as just one ad additional thing in your tool belt. And if you can uh, write a static analysis tool, that can often uh, pay off if you have a, a pretty bespoke situation in your, uh, I I on your project that uh, you can't find anywhere else. So uh, let's talk about what makes a good static analysis tool. Um, a good static analysis tool will provide some meaningful results uh, to, to the user. That is, uh, for many definitions of meaningful. Uh, meaningful meaning like you're, uh, you're getting an error that uh, is actually like real, so that it's not a, for example, it's not a false positive. Um, uh, you're, uh, you're, uh, the issue is something that occurs common, commonly enough that it's not just like a one-time thing that you could just fix by looking at it. Um, it could. Uh, hopefully, it hopefully uh, catches something that you probably don't want to see later on. Some uh, probably some uh, big issue, uh, 
and, and a lot of these uh, uh, good qualities I'm talking about apply to alerts as well, so there's a nice correlation there. Uh, here's an example of a uh, uh, false positive that you might see. For example, if you use GoVet and you uh, use fump.println and you pass in like uh, percent percent %t, this is a, a false positive, uh, it will show an error to you because uh, it can't uh, actually check that you're, uh, 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 you're not using the format string uh, with a percent %t in it. Uh, which is for um, percent t is for true and false for for for, for boolean arguments, um, and uh, and uh, and so some static analysis tools, if you use uh, static check for example, will allow you to suppress these uh, uh, these errors. So you might be able to put a lint ignore uh, comment above your code to uh, tell it, hey, ig ignore this uh, issue. It, it's not something that's actually real. Um, so uh, we know that we don't want false positives and uh, to, we want to provide meaningful results. How do we actually write a static analysis tool? Uh, so in our case, we want to find something, uh, write a tool that uh, uh, checks for errors and closes connections, um, or uh, checks that we close connections. So uh, before we like, go into like, uh, like some the, the Go packages that might allow you to do this, uh, let's uh, try to use some sim simpler tools that use pattern matching. Uh, for example, there's a very popular tool, SEMGREP or RuleGuard, which are written by members. Uh, well, RuleGuard is uh, written by one of the members of the Go community, um, who uh, uh, where you can write a pattern uh, about some Go code, and it, and you can just sort of run it uh, on a huge uh, code base. So you don't actually have to write a bunch of code to get it to work. So uh, this is a pr pretty nifty way to do things. For example, if we have this test program that opens a file, you know, handles some error, and then it calls close twice, um, uh, RuleGuard will allow you to use these uh, dollar sign uh, patterns to uh, uh, like uh, to check that like there's a not a uh, to to refer to variables in your program. Um, for example, uh, if I wrote a thing that checked for uh, double closes or a close that happens more than once. Um, I could uh, write this uh, pattern that has uh, uh, that checks that I've assigned something to a closer and error, uh, and then there's this underscore thing that says, "Hey, I don't care what's on the right-hand side of this assignment," and then some this wild card thing that says, "Hey, zero or more things in between uh, that last assignment and this close call." Uh, th th that's why there's a star there, and then then there's an actual call to close. Uh, and, th and there's another, and that pattern is repeated. There's a zero or more uh, statements followed by a closer dot close. Now, uh, now the reason why there's a dollar sign in front of closer and error is that it's not actually the name. You don't want to, uh, you don't want a variable named closer or error. You want a variable, uh, whatever variable it is. Uh, that's why there's a dollar sign. Um, and uh, then you might, uh, you can add, add additional constraints to it. For example, that the uh, variable. Uh, that is referred to by closer, the identifier closer. Uh, it actually um, is. Uh, it implements uh, I/O closer, the I/O closer interface. Um, and and then if you encounter this situation, then you can uh, say that hey, we found a double close. Um, and and so running this on that test file will uh, return an error like this. Uh, uh, now, if your situation is a bit more complicated and can't be. Uh, uh, captured by a pattern matching tool like this, then you might want to go into looking at the Go analysis uh, packages. And this, uh, this, like the analysis framework, is 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 the way that all the st uh, stat the static analysis tools uh, are typically built in Go. Uh, static check, command vet, um, uh, Go please, they will all use uh, uh, the analysis tools, um, the analysis framework. And uh, really, it's just a struct that you have to fill out. Um, and you declare some package and you have some struct that is of type analyzer. And the, the main important uh, part of the struct that you have to fill out is the run method, as you can see at the bottom here, and, uh, or, or the run function. And the run function, it just takes this uh, thing of type pass and returns an interface and an error. Um, and, and so that's the main part. This other stuff is related to documentation and what other uh, analyzers you want to have run before it. Um, so in our case, uh, this, this close check that we were talking about, uh, let's uh, declare a variable in some package that I called close check. And this struct that we're going to fill out has the name, documentation, this run method that I haven't actually written yet, 
and uh, and I'm going to require something. I'm going to require that it uh, that um, an inspect.analyzer has run before this uh, this analyzer has run. And that's a key thing to remember is that we don't want to have to you know parse type check our program before uh, we run our analysis stuff. We want the program to already have been uh, uh, parsed and type checked, and we want to just look at the uh, like the uh, like the typing information that's already been reported by the type checker and take advantage of that information. Um, so uh, by saying that we want the inspect.analyzer to run before or that we require it, we're just saying that that should be uh, 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 that we want like the type information, the parse tree, and all that stuff. Um, okay. So like, let's think of a strategy. We, it's, it's usually good to have an idea of what's the kind of uh, pattern that you're looking for or what are you trying to test. So in our case, we want to check for some assignment uh, where I say L value here, but really I want the left-hand side of the assignment to have some closer, whether that's a file, a connection, whatever it is, um, and, and an error. Uh, and, it, if, and if there's an error, then you know, we want to uh, make sure that we handle that error before we call close on the connection, and, uh, and that we call the, uh, when we don't you know, close the connection more than once. Um, so that's the strategy we're looking, or the pattern we're looking for. So we start off by run, writing this run method. Uh, here's some like basic boilerplate you'll probably need for most analyzers you write. Uh, it's that uh, uh, at the top you want to uh, actually get access to the inspector. Uh, the inspector is some uh, is this object returned by the inspect analyzer that we wanted to run before our analyzer ran. And so the inspector, once we get it. Uh, uh, it's going to have all sorts of information for us, like the type information and uh, the parse tree and, and such. Um, there's another thing we need to pass it, which uh, we, we need to declare. It's, it's called a node filter. And the node filter is just an array of the kinds of nodes we're looking for in our syntax tree, so that we don't actually have to walk the whole thing ourselves and, and, and say, hey, we want, we want to look at like a, a block or a statement or, a, or an expression. Here we can just say we're, we want to look at all the assignment statements uh, and then start from there. So uh, that's what this node filter is. And then at the end, I just have a, a return for the types that we're, uh, variables of the types we're turning. Um, OK, so assuming we have all that, um, the, inspect, the inspector uh, 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 has a couple methods on it. One of them is a uh, width stack. There's also a traverse method. Uh, there's a bunch of just methods that it has that where it runs over your, uh, a program uh, in, in its uh, syntax tree. Um, and in our case, we want to just um, uh, use with stack. And the key thing about with stack is it'll pass in the entire stack of nodes that, uh, or path of nodes that lead up to your current node. So if your current node is uh, like an assignment statement, you probably want to have access to the block that it's inside. So if I'm assigning uh, like connection error equals uh, open a file, um, uh, I want to know that the, uh, the outer scope that it's part of so that I can check that, hey, I've closed something or I've, checked that I've handled the error after it. So uh, that's why I'm using with stack. So uh, you could probably do some other, uh, a regular traversal, you know, keep track of state yourself. But I like with stack because I can just directly access its outer scope. So you know, I passed in the uh, node filter that we created before and this, uh, this function, which is the actual thing that it's, that's called on each assignment statement. Uh, so this function takes in a node, a push boolean, and a stack. Um, and I've already discussed what the stack is. The push is really because it's uh, the traversal uh, goes down the stack and or down the syntax tree and up the syntax tree. Uh, we want to uh, uh, just look at the uh, program when we're going up the syntax tree. We don't want to look at the assignment statements twice. So uh, uh, we don't really care about this boolean here. We just want to make sure that uh, we we check the Boolean that, hey, we, want to, uh, we just want to analyze it on the way up. So we check if we're pushing, uh, and we just return true uh, then to say that, hey, just keep going. OK, so uh, ignoring the push part, we t get the statement that, uh, in, from, from inside of the node that we're given. Um, this, this node represents like some node in our syntax, uh, syntax tree. And we check that it's an assignment statement. Uh, here, I'm not check uh, handlings, uh, anything in the type assertion, because I know for a fact that it's an assignment statement, because that's all that's in my node filter, which is I just want assignment statements. So I can just say, hey, I got, an I got a statement here. I check that the statement uh, is a, 
uh, is a defined has a defined token. Uh, so if you look at the documentation for an assignment statement uh, uh, in the, uh, in the Go AST package, it'll show you that. Uh, there's some token uh, associated with the assignment. It could either be a regular equals sign or it could have a colon equals, as we know from a, a, a regular Go assignment. And the, and the colon equals is actually a short variable declaration. Um, and we, we only want to look for those. So we're gonna, if it's not a short variable de declaration, we'll just return false and say, hey, stop going down the syntax tree. This is not what we're looking for. Um, so now that we actually have an assignment, we want to check that, hey, uh, we. Uh, there's a, there's a closer on the left-hand side, and there's possibly an error on the left-hand left side. So um, uh, let's do that. We have our assignment statement, and we're going to iterate over the left-hand side of it, which is left LHS is just another field on, uh, on, on assignment statement. And for each expression on the left-hand side of the assignment, uh, we're going to first check that, okay, it's an identifier. Uh, so uh, already we're in a situation where, okay, what if you're assigning to some variable, uh, some uh, thing in an array, or uh, then this would probably not handle that, uh, right? Um, and so you have to ask yourself, is that such a common scenario in my uh, code base that I want my analysis tool to cover cover it, or is every case uh, place where I'm creating a connection something uh, a situation where I'm assigning to some identifier? Um, so in, in our case, we only care about uh, ID identifiers that are being assigned to here. So uh, if it's not an identifier, we just skip it. And then here is where we're actually using information create, uh, reported by the, uh, the pass. So we're, uh, uh, the pass has a field on it called types info. And we're uh, accessing types info and definitions. And we're basically accessing all the type information for that identifier. Uh, and so first, we're saying, OK, uh, uh, grab the uh, uh, type information for this identifier and call it type, um, and then check that the this type implements a, an I/O closer. And notice here, I haven't actually shown you how to grab the interface type for I/O closer. And also check the uh, uh, check that um, whatever that type is that it implements error. Um, so uh, as we're iterating through the left hand side, one of these variables might be a closer, one of them might be an error. Okay. Okay, so here's how we're actually defining the closer and the error type. So there are multiple ways to go about this, but we actually want the go types definition of this, uh, this interface, which is a little bit complicated uh, to get. Um, for errors, it's, it's not, not terribly complicated. We just go to the universe of types in Go, and we look for something called error, and uh, we get its underlying interface. And that's the error type that you see at the bottom. For closer, uh, you can try to use like the packages like the uh, importer importer package to actually get the IO closer type uh, embedded in, in your binary or embedded in the package information. Uh, but uh, a, a probably simpler way to do it is to just define it yourself because interfaces you can just define yourself. So uh, we will define an interface using the types package. This is kind of like using reflect where you're saying, okay, this type, uh, this interface is c consists of a bunch of functions. And this function uh, doesn't take a receiver. Uh, it has no parameters, but it returns an error. And the error return type, because functions can return multiple, uh, multiple values, um, you need to, it's a tuple, so you create a tuple. And inside that tuple, you have a variable. And that variable uh, corresponds to something of type error. So it's a lot of like, uh, like it, it's kind of gross, but it, uh, like, it's, it's done here. And it's not variadic either. Um, and that's all. And then you say you call complete to say here build it. Uh, so that's how the closer type and the error type are defined. Um, okay, so we have our closer type and error type. We uh, we defined them and we uh, like we looked for them on the left hand side of an assignment. A and so now we we grab uh, we uh, want to grab the outer scope of uh, of our uh, uh, of the assignment so that we can actually check that the connections are closed, that the errors are handled. So we, we grab the scope by saying, OK, uh, well, the stack gives us the, uh, ensures us that the last element, the thing at the length minus 1, is an assignment statement. That means the thing at length minus 2 is a scope. So uh, uh, well, it should be, because uh, you can, in Go, you can't have uh, like statements outside of um, uh, some scope, uh, just by the definition of the language. Uh, so we want to grab that uh, scope at length of the stack minus 2. We got the scope. Um, and, uh, and, and now we probably want to figure out, uh, we probably want to only start looking 
for all the error handling and uh, connection closing code after where our assignment shows up. So we can just you know, get the index of the assignment by just iterating through this list of statements inside this block or inside the scope and saying, OK, if the statement is the thing we're looking for, if, if it is the assignment statement that we uh, uh, got earlier, then, then assign this index, uh, that to assign index and break out of it. So we got the assign index. Now, um, we, uh, we actually want to do, uh, have the logic of you know, checking to see if there's a close after uh, we've uh, uh, created a connect, uh, gotten a closer, um, or created a closer, rather. Uh, so assuming that uh, closer var is not nil, uh, if closer var is, is nil, then this analysis pass won't even be running. So we, uh, we need to make sure that it's not nil uh, when, from when we uh, uh, iterated over the left-hand side earlier. Um, uh, we say that we haven't found close. Now uh, let's iterate from uh, it, from uh, assign index uh, to the end of the list of statements in our scope, and see if any one of those statements corresponds to a close operation. And and I haven't actually shown you how to implement the close operation here, uh, or checking that uh, statement is a close. But we just want to. Uh, Check, uh, assuming we've written that function out already, we'll, uh, we'll say, OK, is this statement a, uh, a close? Um, and then uh, we pass in the identifier, the closer var. Um, and and if, if so, we say that we, uh, we found it. So now we actually have a situation where we can report an error if we have not found a close. Uh, this is the first instance where we report an error to a user. Uh, there's a method on the analysis pass uh, type uh, called report f. And so we're going to pass in, uh, we can pass in a position. All of these uh, objects that we get from the AST have positions associated with them. And so we can just pass in one of those uh, positions. In, in our case, we can say, uh, we want to probably say something like, uh, this, because there's no close called on this, we want to get the position of the identifier uh, that uh, corresponds to the closer variable. So we'll say, hey, um, uh, here's a token position. V the close method is not called and pass in the name. Now, uh, let's see if we can improve this somewhat and make it more robust. Because we probably, yeah, it's important to check that we closed uh, some uh, connection. But we also want to uh, uh, must possibly check that um, we haven't called close uh, multiple times. So uh, let's, uh, instead of uh, keeping a Boolean, we'll keep a counter saying uh, num closes is 0. And then every time we encounter a close, we increment that counter, uh, num closes plus plus. And so now, uh, uh, we can say uh, at the end of that uh, block, uh, if num closes is 0, so do the same thing as earlier. We say that, hey, you have not called the closer. Um, um, uh, otherwise, if it's more than one, then you called it multiple times, which is also probably not good, uh, and, and point that out to the user. Um, you could al also imagine extending this to maybe handle defer, which is not much more complicated. It's just handling another kind of statement here. Uh, and you probably would just extend the isClose method. Um, um, now let's add the, our error uh, handling uh, logic here uh, to check that we handled an error right after we created the, uh, uh, we did the assignment or the short variable declaration. Uh, so we, we assert that the thing after uh, the, uh, the assignment is an if statement. Now you could be even more robust about this because in Go there's multiple ways of doing control flow. Like you could assert that it's a switch statement or a, or, or any uh, or like a or an if statement with a uh, like a like a predicate at the beginning of it. Uh, but uh, uh, you also have to ask yourself: Are those ki the kinds of patterns that I expect to be seeing in my code base? Are people using switch to check for errors? Likely not. So you can probably just do what uh, fits your situation the best and say, okay, if uh, if it's uh, not OK, so if this is not an if statement, or if, if it does not contain the identifier uh, corresponding to error variable, so if the if statement does, uh, condition does not refer to the error, then we're probably uh, not handling the error. So we can report an error uh, for that. Now, there's an, uh, you, here's another situation where you could probably uh, uh, check, if you wanted to check that we're actually returning out of the function or exiting some uh, area of control, you might want to use something like a control flow graph that is another analyzer you can run, or like the SSA package, which is another uh, uh, other analysis information you can get. Um, so let's go back to the uh, is close um, uh, uh, function. How do we check that uh, we um, 
that the statement that we have uh, is calling close on some identifier. Um, uh, in Go, you have uh, uh, when you call like a method on something, and that's just a statement by itself. It's actually an expression statement, uh, and so every single construct in Go has a corresponding node in the syntax tree. So instead of running through the uh, every node in the syntax tree, it's probably best to uh, think about like which of these nodes do you actually care about. In this situation, we're looking for uh, a call a call expression. We're looking for a method call to close, um, and so we grab this me uh, these method calls. Okay, uh, 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 corresponding to uh, we grab the uh, like if if it is a, a statement an expression statement and it's a call expression inside of there, uh, we check that it's uh, a call expression be uh, on this identifier, and we uh, we we check that the the selector the selector expression the identifier associated with it is the same as the one we passed in, and we also check that the uh, method's name is close, and so this should be good enough to check that you're actually calling close on that method. Um, uh, now, in the case of uh, contains ident, or checking that like some node refers to your identifier in some way, uh, remember we use this uh, to check that our, like uh, our error handling code in our error condition uh, refers to our error. That's why we wrote the contains ident function. Um, here, we probably just want to do a general generic traversal over that node. Uh, the AST package has a method called inspect, or a function called inspect, and it will uh, just call uh, uh, your function that you pass in on every single node uh, down the tree. Um, and so uh, you can just pass in your function and say, hey, if the node that we're looking at is, um, uh, is, uh, is the identifier that we care about, in our case an error, the error variable, um, then, uh, then we found uh, that identifier in, inside of, uh, it's contained inside this node. Um, otherwise, we haven't. So that's what this function really just, just does. It's just checking that inside some tree that you have this identifier. Um, OK, so now if you actually ran this, uh, you would see uh, uh, something. Uh, well, first we want to package it up into some sort of tool. Um, uh, so it, uh, for Go analysis, you can use something called a single checker. Uh, there's also like a multiple checker uh, version. This is what command vet does. But if you want to use a single checker, this basically creates a command line tool for you as long as you pass in that global variable corresponding to the analyzer we talked about before. Um, so in our case, we, would, uh, uh, we write this uh, checker at the top. And we, uh, 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 after compiling it and running it, we run it against our, our, our test program or our test package. Um, and it'll be able to tell us, hey, you call this a close, method, a close function method uh, multiple times. And, and you could try running this over uh, arbitrary code, and it will be able to report uh, with, uh, with uh, and, and likely catch like if you've called close multiple times or uh, or if you haven't handled an error, unless you're doing something really weird, like checking uh, for an error but not actually returning, or uh, do, uh, uh, or something like that. Um, uh, but but now you know how to actually extend the, your analysis tool to handle those cases as well. So uh, I, I want to uh, uh, conclude by saying, consider writing static analysis tools. It's not uh, t uh, like uh, terribly difficult if you. Uh, like, f first of all, just try looking at the uh, the pattern matching ones, like rule guard or semgrep. Semgrep, you just write it in a YAML file, and it'll be able to uh, like uh, uh, test those patterns against your, against your code. If you, uh, but using the Go analysis framework is also pretty useful uh, 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 because like all of the work has been done with you uh, regarding like type checking your program, parsing it, and all that stuff. You can just use these uh, previous analyses that have been done to build up your own. And it's usually something like uh, ch uh, like check some uh, uh, property holds for some value in your, uh, for some node in your tree. Um, and, and in terms of writing a good static analysis tool, try to provide meaningful results. So uh, make sure that there's not too many false positives. And if there are, try to adjust this tool. Otherwise, you, uh, programmers won't want to look at it, and they'll just uh, you know, ignore it. Um, uh, and, and try to find something that will uh, hit a lot of cases in your code base. Um, and, and with that, I will say that like, the code for this uh, uh, code and slides will be up after the talk is over. And uh, I'll pass it back to Eric. Thank you so much, Akhil. That was great. Uh, I, I learned like a lot there, especially at a higher level, uh, just how many different routes there are into getting static analysis done on your code. 
you know, he mentioned SEMGRAP, he mentioned the Static Analysis Toolkit, there were a couple others in there too, and that's really cool to see that that kind of ecosystem is so big. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's something that I've used a lot of static analysis tools, but yeah. not something I've actually investigated implementing on my own. So I think this is something I'm going to have to yeah. play with. And it's always good to, to see go. how. For go. <laughs> <laughs> you keep yanking my chain. <laughs> Listen, uh, yeah, as I was saying, uh, in Go, it's, it's, always, it's always good to see how, how easy uh, the, the, the tool chain and obviously the Go standard library makes it to, uh, mm -hmm. um, to actually be able to uh, write. So uh, these kinds of tools. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I love that you're rocking the gloves. I am rocking. The, hey man, no shame yeah. in my game. Y nope. You know what's funny is all of the people in the peanut gallery channel commenting about like temperature outside in <laughs> geographical locations across the country and world. Yep. But I don't think you understand. It's colder in here than it is outside. <laughs> yep. That is true. Yep. That is true. We don't know what's going on. There's. They're taking heat out of this room somehow because <laughs> it's not getting any warmer throughout the day. Which yeah. is quite interesting because if we if we do a studio shot at some point, like there's nothing but giant lights yeah. everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Indeed. people Indeed. lights packed in here. Yeah. I think they're messing with us. They're like a so. bunch of complainers. Mm. Uh, we'll show them. They said I thought this was a conference about rust, so they turn <laughs> up the AC. <laughs> oh man. I mean I would much rather be cold than sweating, so sure. you know. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Well, um there's also another part of the peanut gallery I thought was Wait, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. We have some extra time, it seems like. So uh, uh, Akil, where's Akil? I was gonna have him have oh. him help me out with my Comcast bill. Oh. Um, <laughs> sorry, 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 yeah. I think, yeah, he, he reports to the CEO, I think. <laughs> directly. <laughs> directly. I mean, the same, the same way you can call enough. Satya on a cell. Exactly. You know? Yeah, I got <laughs> like, Hey, man. Yeah, hey. hey, what would you I've got, a, I've got a problem with the, with the um, MS Word. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his, that's his version. Our, ours is like, you know, your printer's broken or something like that, right? Oh, yeah. 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 But there is an interesting thing in the peanut gallery. Um, there's a new challenge. There's a swag contest. I don't know if you guys saw this. Oh, I did right. not. The swag contest is, and this is unofficial, uh, so that is to say there's no swag if you win. Uh, but the, the contest is to implement the You can have the this that I hold yes, in my hand. Yes, this wonderful this. air, <laughs> the pr prime air. Uh, it's to implement the worst possible use case for generics. Oh, man, here we go. So here we you, you know what's funny? I mean, joke's on them. They, you know, for me, I'm just going to assemble all of this. <laughs> I'm going to write a book with all of them, call it Anti-Patterns and oh, Profit. Yeah. And prof you know, that's the old, you know, I want to, what is it? There's nine standards. I'm going to make a standard to, <laughs> get, to standardize ten. all the standards. Yeah. there's ten. <laughs> yeah, so like, you, you're going to, peanut gallery, go at it, do your thing. And then Eric is going to take gonna capitalize. all of them and make them, by definition, the worst. <laughs> yeah, goodness, yeah. goodness. So who do we have up next, Johnny? Up next, we have uh, Linus Torvalds. He's now doing Go full time. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> no, We're integrating no. Go into right. the uh, Linux. Uh, we program. have we have Linus here. I We're I just don't think it's that Linus. I mean, it's <laughs> not. It is not that Linus. <laughs> but the Linus we do have, Linus Lee, thankfully, um, is here to talk to us about uh, what happens when uh, toy languages grow up. So uh, yeah, and he spent I'm, a lot of time spent, like working on his own language. Yeah, he it's spent a lot, really and we're we're gonna have some some questions for him yes, after we this because you know I mean I, I want to know more about this. It's called Ink, and I think that we're probably gonna have to add a day to the conference for Ink Day. Ink Ink Con. Hear <laughs> <laughs> it here first. This is Ink Ink Con. <laughs> Somebody's <laughs> registering <laughs> a domain. <laughs> you know it. <laughs> <laughs> and what we got, like, goforhealthcare.com, go for enterprise, go, like, main compliance. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we got inkcon.com. Yeah. Wow, wow. I think uh, um, Eric keeps trying to um, you know, rebrand this conference, you know, turn it into something that it's not. Yeah. I'm, not I'm not sure where that's coming from, bro. <laughs> you know, you have some Suspicious. deep, dark place in, in, inside of you. Away from him, <laughs> Satan. You know, um, anyway. You I, love, I love all languages. <laughs> 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 uh, all right, so. Without further ado, let's get into this. Mr. Linus Lee, tell us what you got. Thank you. Today I want to talk about programming languages, and specifically toy programming languages. So languages that you might not use at work to build things like databases and servers and your production-grade services, but things that you might build for a side project or to solve a very specific kind of niche problem. Um, I've spent 
uh, the better part of the last year, and actually the last couple of years, building various little different toy languages and uh, with Go. And I want to share a little bit of both what the process was like, what I've built on top of it, and then also how you might go about implementing your own toy programming language. Building a language is, is a little bit like this XKCD, where you start out with a problem that you might want to solve. Maybe it's about uh, building a database, or maybe it's about solving a particular audio kind of engineering issue. And you, you start with a problem, and you say, you know what, I'd, this problem would really be great to solve if I had the language that's just perfect for it. And you start working on the language. And of course, a language isn't something that you build overnight, over a weekend, over a couple of weeks. It's a month-long, year-long kind of project. And so it consumes all of your time. And that's a little bit what happened with me, too. But I do think that building a language is a really fascinating way to learn about different parts of a computer you might not come face to face with on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I want to share what that process was like for me. In a previous version of this talk that I gave earlier this year, I talked a lot about a language called uh, Inc. It was a language based on uh, built with Go. It's a dynamically typed scripting language. It looks a little bit like this, what you see on screen. And uh, I, spent it, I spent the last two years using this language, using the interpreter and the compiler that I built for it, to build things like notes apps and Twitter clients and various kinds of personal tools that me and a few other people use. And Inc was my first programming language that I built uh, on top of Go. And so while it was useful, it also contained a lot of little design mistakes and learnings that I had to, to get over over the last two years. And so earlier this year, I started working on a second version, a sort of a successor to Inc, if you will, called Oak. And so most of the rest of this talk will be about Oak, the language, how it works, breaking down exactly how I built it using Go, and then some things on top of it that I built uh, using Oak that might be interesting to talk about. When you're building a toy language, uh, you're not really trying to replace something like Go or Rust or C++, because those are powerful general purpose languages that you're meant to be used, that are meant to be used to build um, anything from lower level programs like databases all the way up to web apps or even more complex high level applications. With a toy language, you're more targeting at a specific problem, or maybe you're scoping it down just to be able to do the things that you care about. And I would say those things are in the scope of little languages. Uh, little languages are everywhere. There are things like the Bash scripting language that you use in your shell, the JSX templating language, like configuration languages like YAML or TOML, um, or even one of my favorites, the Google WAFS language, the Wrangling Untrusted File Format Safely language which is a fully featured language that you can use to write parsers that are memory safe, that you can use to parse untrusted files like media files that you get on your phone or network payloads that you might get to your server. Uh, my favorite example of little, lang little languages of all time is the awk programming language. If you haven't heard of it, uh, there's a book called The Awk Programming Language written by the authors of the language. It's, uh, it's a pretty short read. You can read it over an afternoon and learn the whole language because it's so small. But it, it's one of those things where it's designed so carefully and so thoughtfully for a very particular domain. In this case, that's processing text files and streams of text files in a Unix pipeline kind of context. And all of these are examples of languages that are targeted at a specific kind of solution. And it's sort of a language-based problem-solving approach. Rather than writing a, a program in Go to, say, process files or, or write uh, configuration, you're using another language to do it. And I think little languages are an interesting approach to solve problems. And maybe if you write a toy language, little languages are an interesting way to think about what your language might be uh, targeted at solving a, a problem about. So why might, want you build, why might you want to build a toy language? The biggest reason for me is fun. Not only it's the fun in building an interpreter or compiler and being able to understand exactly how a programming language works, but also once you have a language like Inc or like Oak, you can build things on top of it. The notes app that I use day to day is written in Oak. The Twitter client that I use to check my Twitter is written in Inc. And once you, not only is it the fun that you get from just building your own tools, but once you're building it on top of your own language, you're working with the syntax that you defined, with the semantics that you defined, with the tools that you built, uh, with the details into the language that you've baked in just because you wanted it there, and you don't really have to care about scalability or, or availability or anything like that that you have to consider for production grade languages. And so building tools on top of your language can be really fun. I also think building a toy language is a great way of learning about different parts of a computer that you might not be in touch with in your day-to-day -day work. Things like memory models, things like the process model, or asynchrony and concurrency. How does your language deal with problems that happen when two threads try to write to the same memory location? Or what, does, what happens when you have to read a file and you want to do it concurrently? These are details that programming languages that you use day-to-day -to -day today have worked out for you already, because they have to think about it when they're designing a language. So you don't have to think about it as much as you would if you were writing your own language and you have to define these behaviors specifically and exactly so you can then not only design it, but implement it into your language to be correct. 
So I think it's a great way of learning about these different types, uh, different areas of a computer. And then sometimes, very sometimes, occasionally, toy languages or personal project languages can become production grade with languages like Clojure or like Python having started as sort of personal projects that have now grown into uh, production grade languages that, that large companies use to build their production products. If you've taken a university course uh, or if you've gone through another kind of tutorial on how to build a language before, you might have come across uh, material on how to build an interpreter or a compiler. And while that's what gets a lot of attention in the programming language world, how an interpreter or compiler works, how to do type checking, how to do parsing, I think there's a lot more to building a language, especially a language that, that's practical that you want to build stuff with, than just the interpreter and the compiler. And so even if you've taken a university course or encountered how to build an interpreter elsewhere, I hope to, through this talk, share a little bit about what else on top of it do you need to build to have a practical language. Things like, for example, if you have just the interpreter, the Go spec and the Go compiler doesn't actually tell you how the Go language interfaces with the rest of your computer. How does it do things like writing files or processing network requests? Those you have to define separately in standard libraries that you have to write for your language or foreign function interfaces, interfaces to the rest of the system. And those are things you have to explicitly design as well. Another important part that gophers know a lot about is language tooling, things like code formatting and profiling for memory and CPU usage. How do you deploy your software? These are things that typical programming language tutorials haven't covered that I have to sort of discover for myself, and I want to share with you a little bit of how at least Oak handles it. So I want to dive a little bit into the interpreter because I think it's the most technically sort of interesting part of Oak and share a little bit of how it works. But before we look at the interpreter itself, Let's look at what actually what Oak actually looks like to run. So Oak is a programming language written in Go. And that's a little bit weird, but what that really means is that to run Oak, you just start, type in Oak, enter, and like Python or like any other interpreted language, you get a REPL. Um, and because it's an expression-oriented dynamic language, uh, pr programs can be as simple as just numbers. So if I type in the program 100, it evaluates to 100. I can add numbers together. I can add more numbers together. I have strings in Oak, so I can say hi, I can say hello, go for con. You can uh, concatenate strings together. Oak also has floating point numbers, so pi. Um, Oak has composite types as well, so Oak has lists of numbers. And lists and objects in Oak are actually heterogeneous, so they don't have to be all the same type. So you can have a list that contains numbers and also strings and also things like booleans and keywords. And all of these are, are just values that you can work with in Oak. There is no concept of pointers or uh, slices or arrays. Everything is just lists and values and objects, which are defined sort of the way that you would see it in JavaScript, for example. And lastly, Oak has first class functions. So for example, we could define a function called double that takes a number and returns two times that number. So I can then say double the number 10, we get 20. Um, I can double it and then pipe it, which is a little fun syntax, uh, to double it again. That's how you would do it. And then because Oak has first class functions, you can use functions as arguments to other functions. So Oak has a standard library function called std range that just gives you a list of of numbers up to that number. So we can generate a list of 10 numbers, or 100 numbers, or 1,000 numbers. But let's take a list of 10 numbers, and then let's map it through the function double. And all this is doing is taking the list, and then for each element of the list, doubling the number. And so Oak has first class functions. Uh, it has numbers, strings, the typical sort of values that you would expect in a programming language. But all of this is, again, a Go program. So Oak uh, is just phi which it. Uh, it's about a 7 megabyte Go binary. And so when we look at how the Oak interpreter works, what we're really looking at is what is the Go program that takes the source code, the text strings that I'm typing into this REPL, and how does the Go program understand it, what it's supposed to do, and then actually execute what the program is meant to be doing within the program. Oak's interpreter, like most other interpreters or compilers, works in a sort of a pass-based way, where we start with initially a representation of our source code, which is the representation of a program that humans can read and process the most effectively. And we progressively transform it down to other representations of a program that the computer can more easily understand. So to a computer, the source code of Oak is just a string. It's very opaque. There's, there's no structure to it. 
And then we're going to go to token streams and syntax trees, which I'll explain in a little bit, that contain more structure so that the computer can look at it and understand what the program is supposed to do. So let's look at the token stream and the syntax tree and what that, what that looks like in practice. This is a little playground that I made um, recently to be able to look at, type in any OAP program, and look at the token stream and the syntax tree representations of a program that correspond to the program that I'm typing in. So let's start with a very basic trivial program. Um, with the number number 100. The number 100 is a program just evaluates, that just evaluates the number 100. And the token stream is a representation of a program where every symbol in our source code has been singled out. And the token stream is just a stream of these tokens, each of which are a symbol that means something in our language. And so for example, uh, in this Oak program number 100, there is uh, two tokens. We have the first token at position 1, 1, which is line 1, column 1. It's a number literal, and it has the value 100. And then there's a comma that's automatically added by the tokenizer in the same way that Go has automatic insertion of semicolons at the ends of lines. That's something that I borrowed from Go. Um, but really, there's only one meaningful token in our language in, in this program here, which is the number literal 100. If we add to it the number 200, now we have uh, three different tokens that are meaningful. We have the number literal 100, we have the plus operator, and we have another literal 200. And you'll see that. The tokenizer, one of the abstractions that the tokenizer peels back uh, is the white space. So no matter how many spaces I add here, uh, there's only three, three tokens. So as you'll observe that as we transform it down more to a machine understandable representation of a program, some of these abstractions that we don't need, like, like white space, will be removed by these progressive steps. The other thing that's interesting about our token stream is that it's just a flat list. There's still no sense of nesting or hierarchy. So for example, if we have uh, 1 plus 2 plus 3. Let's put that inside a list. There is, semantically, there's nesting in this program now, where we have a list value, and we have numbers that are being added together in sort of nested expressions. First, you add 1 and 2, and then you add 3 after it. All of that's inside a list. But our token stream doesn't actually represent any of that nesting structure. We're just looking at, again, a list, a flat list of symbols. We have a bracket. We have a number literal. We have operators, other numbers, and then right bracket to close it off. And so the syntax tree is when the nesting structures uh, come in to, uh, to our program. So let's look at the syntax tree together with our token stream representations of our program. So now we start again with a number 100. Again, this is just a program that evaluates the number 100. And we have a single token that represents the number literal. But our syntax tree now adds additional information for the computer to be able to understand our program. So now we've gone all the way from just a binary blob of a string to, OK, we're looking at an integer. And that integer has the value 100. If we add another number, the token stream is still a flat list of just number plus operator number. But somehow, in the, in the path between the token stream and the syntax tree, we have to go from this flat list to a tree that says, OK, now this program is a binary expression. It's adding something together, this plus. The first thing that we add is an integer with a value 100. And the second thing that we add is integer with a value 200. And so you can see we're adding a little bit more structure. We're adding a little bit more nesting. And we're getting closer to something that's structured enough for the computer to be able to understand our program. If we add another number, you can see there's even more nesting. So now there's a binary expression nested inside another binary, binary expression. And uh, let's look at a more complex example. So we can use the print line function from the Oak standard library to have a program that prints hello world. And in this program, uh, there's a lot of structure. There's enough structure here for say, a program to be able to tell you exactly what this program does. So at the top level of this program, it's a single function call, right? So our syntax tree says, OK, here's a function call. The function that we're calling is the result of a property access. We get the identifier std, and we get the identifier print line, and we access the print line property of std, and then we call that function with the argument string hello. If we add other arguments, our syntax tree will tell us, yeah, here are other arguments integers 2, 3, and 4. And so again, going from the program to the token stream to the syntax where we're adding structure, we're removing arbitrary information we don't need, like white space. And the last important thing that the syntax tree step does, or the parsing step does, is it detects syntax errors. So for example, if I remove the parentheses at the end here, well, now we don't know when our function call ends. And so that's not evident in the stream because it's a flat structure, and we're not really giving a lot of attention to the nested structure of our program text. But in the syntax tree representation of a program, we have to know when our function call ends to be able to tell you what the, the arguments of this function are. And so when we can't find that parenthesis, our parser is saying, 
hey, there's a syntax error. There's an unexpected end of input. Or if we have a, a symbol that we don't expect, it'll say there's an unexpected token. So a lot of the rest of the interpreter work is going to be implementing the transformations to go from the source code to the token stream and then to the syntax tree. So let's see how that works in practice. To go from the source code to the token stream, we'll get, we're going to uh, have a pass called a tokenizer. A tokenizer in, in Oak is a single function defined on the struct called the tokenizer. Its job is to go from the source file representation of a program to a, a slice of tokens, a list of tokens that we can work with. And while it's doing that, it also keeps track of each token's original position. So if you look back at our tokenizing, tokenization step or token stream, you'll recall that each token has some position information about which line it's from and which column it's from. And that's important because whenever there's a runtime error for, say, being able, fa failing to look up a variable, we have to be able to tell the user, here's where your error occurred, or, or a language will be undebuggable. So our tokenizer does that by keeping track of the file name, the column, and line for where we are while we're parsing our, our source code. And to parse our source code, we also need a slice of runes uh, and an index into that slice uh, to go along our, our list of characters and, and, and tokenize it. In practice, the way that we do it is a big switch case. So this tokenize function that I abbreviated here is go going to go through our string, which is a program. And for every character, it's going to say, what is this character? Maybe if it's a plus sign, it'll say, the plus sign is a valid token by itself. So we're just going to take that plus sign and say, this is a token that's the plus operator, and ship it off to our list of tokens. If it's, say, a letter, we'll say, maybe this is the start of a variable name. So we'll parse the rest of the variable name, look at it. If it's a keyword, like if, we'll consider it a keyword and ship it off as a token, an if keyword token. If it's a more general variable, we'll just say this is an identifier. If it's a string literal, it'll start with a quote. So if we see a quote, we'll say, OK, the rest of this token must be a string literal, and we'll parse it until the next quote. We'll slice that string off from the rest of our, our source code and consider that our token. And so it's a big switch case, looking ahead a few characters to see uh, what the next token is going to look like, and aggregating all together into a single slice of tokens that represents our token stream, which is what we see on the left side here. The token stream within the Oak interpreter is represented as a slice of tokens. And each token is just a struct that keeps track of the type of the token it is. So is it a comment? Is it a comma? Is it a parenthesis? its position, which we saw earlier, which is just a column and a line number, um, and this payload, which is the string value of the token for the tokens for which that is relevant. So things like string literals, numbers, comments, those need to know not only what type of token it is, but also what exactly is the value of that token. What's the value of the string, or what's the value of the number that this token represents? And this is, this is where that payload goes. And on the left here, you can see a shortened version of all the different kinds of tokens that Oak has. So comments. Uh, comma, dot, all the parentheses and delimiters, operators, keywords, as well as all the literal values that our language supports. We need a token type for each of them. Once we have the token stream, the next step is to go from this token stream to the syntax tree. And that's the job of the parser. If you've worked with parsers before, um, you might understand that Oak's parser is a simple recursive descent parser. What that really means is that the parser looks a lot like a, token, a tokenizer in that it keeps a, a track of a slice of tokens. Uh, which we got from the tokenizer. And then we have also an index that points into that list of tokens to see exactly where in the token stream we are as we're parsing along and, and popping out uh, syntax tree nodes of our tree. The actual parse method on the parser is recursive descent. And all that really means is that for every token that we see, we're going to check, OK, what is this token? And then what, what syntax tree node might that be starting? So let's say if it's a number, then we're just looking at a number syntax tree node, like an integer 100 or, or something like that. If it's a keyword, like the function keyword that starts a function, we might say, OK, actually, we need to parse a function. So we can invoke the parse function method that, that's defined on a parser. And the parse function method is going to look at the next thing after the function keyword. Let's say maybe that's like an argument list, and say, OK, now we need to parse an identifier. And so we're going to call the parse identifier method, and so on and so forth. So it's parse methods recursively calling each other to be able to parse whatever comes next in our list. And we keep parsing through our list of tokens until we get to the end and we have all of our syntax tree nodes in our program. And what results is the syntax tree that has the structure that we saw earlier in our demo. The syntax tree in Oak, the Oak's interpreter, is uh, represented by a single type, which is actually an interface type. 
rather than a concrete struct type as before. One thing that's interesting about this sort of series of transformation is that as we go along further in our, in our steps, we get more structured information. And so when we were just looking at the token, every token could look about the same, because every token is really just a type and some extra string value. Whereas now we're at the syntax tree stage, and each node needs to know a lot more information about itself. So the information that a string literal node needs to contain is very different than what a function literal node could contain. A function looks very differently than a string. And so each of these different types gets its own struct. String literal has just a payload of what the string literal contains as a string. A function might have a name, a list of arguments, and some extra body. An if expression contains multiple branches that it needs to know about. Uh, and so all of these are represented by different struct types, and they're all wrapped up in an interface type that we call AST node for abstract syntax tree node. Once we have a syntax tree, now we have enough information to be able to run our program, in a sense. And so it's time for the evaluator. The evaluator is the thing that actually runs our program. It's a method defined on this thing called a context, which I'll get to in a bit. But all it does is it takes, it looks at every syntax tree node, every bit of our syntax that's now in a hierarchy, and says, OK, what is this node telling your program to do? For example, if it's a string, we just generate a value that represents that string and passes it off to the next thing. If it's a function call, we might look for that function and then call it. If it's a, a branch of an if expression, we might evaluate the condition and then call that branch if it's true or false. And you'll see there's an extra bit of scope here. And the scope is just uh, the information that encodes what variables are in our current local scope. And so the eval expert function is actually responsible for traversing through our tree and going through and actually running the program that the tree represents. Let's take a look at what all of that comes together to, to be when an oak program is actually running. So again, the oak, the oak interpreter is just a Go program. And so in this Go program that, that is running an oak program, uh, we have a big global interpreter state that keeps track of all the state that's relevant for the running oak program as a whole. Things like, what are all the open files that our oak program has opened? What are all the open network ports? Um, it also keeps track of a global lock, which is just a mutex on the global interpreter state. And this ensures that even if multiple concurrent uh, functions are being called in Oak, only one bit of the Oak program is running at any given moment. So if multiple files are being opened and multiple requests are being served, one convenient way that Oak gets around the problem of data races is we just ensure that at any given moment, only one part of the Oak program is being evaluated. Only one eval expert function is actually running through our source tree or our syntax tree. And that means that we don't really have to worry necessarily about multiple parts of our Oak program writing to our variable, our stack at the same time, or complexities that arise from parallel execution. So in the global interpreter state, there's a lock, as well as all the information that, that the program globally needs to keep track of. In an Oak program, o an Oak program can import other Oak files. This is the way that Oak sort of does module management in the way that you might do in Lua or in JavaScript. And so within the global interpreter state, there is multiple uh, contexts or multiple files that we might have open. So in this case, we might, start by, we might have started out by running main.oak. But main.oak might have imported library.oak, which might have in turn imported math.oak. And in each of these files, there's a separate chain of variable scopes. Because if you think about it, a variable in one file shouldn't be able to access other variables from a scope in a different file. And so each of these files need their own chain of variable scopes that, uh, that the evaluator can look, look up variables from. So let's look at what that looks like in practice in our source code. The global state that we just talked about is represented by this engine type right here. Uh, this is the mutex, the interpreter lock that makes sure that all the, that at any given moment, only one Oak program, only one bit of Oak program is running. We have some other sort of synchronous bookkeeping stuff. We have a file map for keeping track of which file descriptors correspond to which open files that we've given to our program, as well as some error reporting, bookkeeping, things that I won't cover too, in too much detail here. But within this global interpreter context, every file gets this thing called a, a context. Uh, it's a little bit confusing, but this context type keeps track of, OK, for every file, what are, uh, what's the local scope, what's the global scope that corresponds to that open file? So if we start to define variables in our Oak program, then all those variables will get stuffed into this context uh, data type. It has a pointer to which global context that this context belongs to, which engine it belongs to, this root path thing, which is bookkeeping for being able to do imports nicely. And then uh, it embeds a scope type, which is this, the, the Go type that represents 
the local scope of variables. And so um, in every scope, there's a map that just maps variable names to the values that they represent. So if you define a variable A that has the value of number 2, then it's going to be a map that has the string A, and then it's going to map to the value that corresponds to the runtime representation of the value 2 in our program. And each scope has a pointer to its parent scope, because a local scope, if the variable doesn't exist there, looking up a variable in the local scope might involve looking it up actually in its parent scope. So you can see how all that comes together to form a runtime state that looks like this, where there's a global interpreter state, and then each scope is sort of chained to its parent scope until you get to the global scope for each file, and then all of that is wrapped up in a, in a little context that corresponds to each file. So now, going from the source code to the token stream, to the syntax tree, which has enough structure for our interpreter evaluator to run in this runtime, this is all we need to have an oak interpreter. With all these parts coming together, we can now take an oak, oak program, give it to the interpreter, and have it do something that we want, like adding numbers together, or creating objects and, and running through objects, or looping through lists. All of that's possible with just this basic infrastructure. But there's a lot more to Oak than just in, in, its interpreter. For example, with just the things that we've covered here, Oak can't write to your terminal yet. It can't save a file. All of those things are outside of the realm of just the core language, and they're things that you have to build into the runtime separately as things that you can call out to. I'm going to highlight three things that are outside the interpreter itself, outside the language, that I think are really important for Oak and for languages in general that I found interesting to implement within Oak. The first is concurrency, how Oak handles concurrency. Um, this is important because if you want to open files or re respond to web requests, one thing that I use Oak for a lot is writing web servers and web applications. And for that, you need concurrency because otherwise you're going to, be able, you're going to have to block on every web request, which is unideal. And normally, when you're implementing your own toy programming language, to do concurrency correctly, to have multiple threads of execution running at the same time, you would need to implement your own event loop, your own little local state that keeps track of which requests are in flight, which functions are paused or, or unpaused. But Go makes this really easy for Oak, because for every request, for every file that we need to open, for every asynchronous task, we can just spawn a new Go routine. And we can tell the Go routine, do this task, read a file, or write to this network, network uh, port, and then once it's done, run this bit of Oak code later. So when we, when we give Oak a callback that says, uh, write this file and then call this callback when it's done, we can implement that pretty literally within Go. And Go's uh, Go routine and its runtime, a Go routine system and its runtime makes that pretty easy for us to do. We don't have to implement any sort of asynchrony ourselves in the interpreter. Oak also has a growing standard library that I wrote from scratch for doing things like string manipulation, uh, formatting strings, um, dealing with cryptographically secure randomness, and dealing with uh, setting up HTTP servers and the like. And the standard library uh, is important, one, because it enables you to write actually useful programs like web servers, and two, because I think it's a good way to test your program if you're writing a toy language, test your language if you're writing a toy language to make sure that it feels good to use under your hands, and also set some conventions, things like naming conventions, things like how, how complex are, can functions be, how does it feel to have a really long function really versus a really short function? And these things are things that are not built into the spec of the language or the interpreter. They're things that you have to sort of conventionally define as you use it. And writing the standard library was a good way to uh, exercise my muscle in, in actually feeling out how the language is supposed to feel to use. And then lastly, language tooling. This is something that Go does really well, and I wanted Oak to do this really well too. And so I have a little more to say about language tooling, specifically that Oak has self-hosted language tooling. What this means is that Oak's code formatter, its bundler, its compiler, JavaScript compiler, its testing and documentation tools, all of it is written in Oak itself. So for example, this is a screenshot of Oak format, Oak Fimt, which has directly inherited the name from GoFimt, and it, uh, it formats Oak code. You can give it a file, Oak program file, source file, and it'll format it and spit out a, a, another Oak program that's indented correctly and all the, sp all the spaces are um, normalized and correct. And it's written in Oak. Go has something similar where GoFimt, GoDoc, GoTest, all of these things are written in Go itself. right? And the value of writing this, these tools in the language itself, self-hosted language tooling, is one that in, in, improving the language actually improves the tooling itself. So if Oak gets faster, OakFimt, OakBuild, all these tools are going to get faster alongside Oak. If Go gets more secure or more memory safe, all of those benefits are going to be inherited by the tools too. And I think that's a great benefit of of writing self-hosted language tooling. Not to mention, you're exercising the language, so you're making sure that it works correctly and there aren't any bugs. 
The other underrated benefit of the way that specifically Oak and Go do it is that for both of those languages, parts of the language tools, the functions and the basic data types that you need to be able to use to write things like parsers and linters, they're built into the standard library. And for Go, that means there's libraries like Go Types, um, Go AST, the Go static anal analysis tools that you saw earlier in the conference. Those things are part of the Go standard library or part of so the more popular packages that come with Go, like Xgo tools. And what that means is that it enables sort of an ecosystem of tools that are compatible, and it, it makes it really easy to write things like linters for your code or things like um, code formatters on top of that, that initial foundation in the standard library. So this tool that I showed you earlier for showing a token stream and a syntax tree that, that results from an Oak program is actually written in Oak. This is a web app written in Oak itself, both the front end and the back end. It's compiled Oak down to JavaScript. And all of this output is generated by an Oak program that is using Oak's standard library support to be able to parse Oak code itself, which is a little bit kind of recursive and mind-bending. But what this means is that uh, it's really easy to write Oak programs that work with other Oak programs. And language tools are fairly straightforward to write, because I don't have to write Go code anymore to write these tools. I can just write Oak code that knows how to parse other Oak code. So within Oak, there's a few different tools that I've written so far uh, for code formatting for auto-indenting code, a bundler that takes a bunch of different Oak files that import each other and producing a single file, sort of like Webpack for the front end, and a compiler that compiles Oak code to the web to be able to write tools like this because I like writing web applications. Um, and Oak has similar enough semantics to JavaScript that compiling it to JavaScript is, is not that difficult. And then in testing and documentation tools, Oak test and Oak doc are not written yet, but that's something that I'm hoping to stamp out in the near future. All this time, having written Ink a couple of years ago and then now working on Oak, um, I've come away with a few takeaways about writing interpreters and programming languages in Go itself. Most of them positive. Some of them things that might, not be, might mean that Go is not the best language for a job. But overall, Go gives you all the basics. It gives you good enough performance where you can, if you design your interpreter correctly, uh, you can compete with slower languages like Python and, and Ruby. It gives you easy cross-platform support because if you write your runtime in Go, then Go's cross-platform support is there to make sure that that language will work on all the platforms that Go supports. Go also gives you a static binary executable when you build your language. This is actually much more important for an interpreter than it is for maybe a web server. Because in a web server, you can have multiple different files that you need to run your program, and you can just put it all in a Docker container, ship it off to, uh, to your server. But when you're writing a language like Oak, you want to be able to give a single binary to your user, to an Oak programmer, and say, this is all you need to write your own program. Just run it on your source code. You don't want to give them 100 files that import each other and say, OK, set this up on your computer, and then you'll be able to run Oak. So the fact that Go compiles to a single binary is actually really, really important for how Oak is practical to use as a language. Oak also gives you enough, just enough control over the runtime in-memory representation of Oak values, of things like, how is an Oak floating point number represented? Or how is an Oak list represented in memory? And it turns out that's important to be able to get any kinds of performance tweaking that you want to do in your language or to be able to do things like um, make sure that your language doesn't consume too much memory when you're running your programs. And then my favorite part of using Go for writing Oak, specifically for the language type of language that Oak is, has been inheriting Go's state-of-the-art runtime. So Oak is a garbage-collected language, just like Go, and uh, that means that Oak just inherits Go's low latency garbage collector. And because of state of the art, Oak also has that state of the art garbage collector. Go also has great CPM memory profiling tools. Um, if you haven't checked out Go's pprof support for looking at what functions are costing you CPU time and what variables and what values are eating up your memory, I suggest you check it out because it's been fantastic to be able to work with. Whenever I have a memory leak in Oak, it means that I don't have to write a memory profiler for Oak. I can just inherit Go's tooling and run it on the interpret run the Go memory profiler on my interpreter. And that'll tell me which kinds of values are, are eating up all my memory in my Oak program. The runtime also has a downside, though, which is that because it has all this great support for these tools and instrumentation, uh, it inheriting Go's complex runtime means that sometimes doing some things in Oak uh, can be impractical. For example, one thing that Oak can't really do that well, or at all at the moment, is interface with a graphical interface. So usually the way that you build a GUI is by interfacing with a uh, a C library, like SDL2, or an OS-specific library, like Coco on Mac. And to be able to do that, your language has to call out to C functions. And the w because of the way that C Go is, and because of Go's sort of thick runtime layer between the rest of the operating system and your Go code, it means that calling out from Oak 
into a C function, uh, calling an oak function that calls a C function, and passing values in between them uh, is kind of tricky, something that I haven't worked out yet. And so sometimes Go can't quite be low level enough. So depending on what type of abstraction you want to work out with your toy language, Go might not work for you. But I have found that for oak, Go has been good enough for me to get to build the types of apps that I've wanted to. If you're interested in building interpreters or compilers in Go, or just in general how programming languages work after seeing this talk, uh, the first resource that I recommend is Torsten Ball's Writing an Interpreter in Go, Writing a Compiler in Go. Um, I've heard a lot of great things about this book. I haven't read the book yet, but I've heard lots of podcasts and talks about it. And uh, you can find them at interpreterbook and compilerbook.com. And they, both of these books walk you through building a practical toy programming language called Monkey uh, in Go and every, every, source code, every bit of source code line by line. I think it's a great practical way to learn how to write your own language. The way that I learned it is through Crafting Interpreters, which is an online ebook. There's also a hard copy, but again, written in Java, but uh, walks you through the same sort of conceptual ideas on how an interpreter works. There's a few other resources on the slide, but the, the three other ones I'll highlight are TinyGo, GoForLua, and Auto. All of these are Go interpreters, Go-based interpreters that are targeted at a real production language that people are using to build real products. So these might be interesting to look at for looking at how a Go interpreter might implement something a little more complicated and a little more real world, a um, little more like the real world, like a JavaScript interpreter. My favorite part of working on a toy programming language in Go has not necessarily been the writing, the interpreter, or the compiler, or the parsers, although that's, that's educational and I'm learning a lot. My favorite part is actually in having built a language and then now being able to write side projects with it, write things like my notes app with it, or write things like a context manager with it. Um, uh, Ramsey Nasser, who works on the Clojure compiler for, for um, the CLR, he says languages represent different ideas on how to capture human creativity on a machine. And I think this is the thing that makes building languages and side projects really special. It means that when you're solving your own problem, instead of using other, what, the rules that other people have defined to solve your programming problem, you can define your own words. You can lay out your own vocabulary for how you think about a problem, for what these like, primitive values and rules that you work with are, and you can define your own constraints by which you try to um, build things that you want to build or solve problems that you want to solve. And I think that's a really powerful part and the really motivating part of trying to build your own language. And so if you're more interested in writing programming languages and how Oak has done it. There's a blog post where I talk a little more about programming languages and writing them at linus.zone.pl. I have a website at thecephas.com where I talk more about software and also other things. And then the Oak project itself is open source. It's just a Go program, uh, after all, at linus.zone.oak. So if you want to go and check it out and fork it and, and, and build your own variations on top of Oak, you can go there and read the source code. It's not that complicated, only a few thousand lines of Go. And I hope after this talk you'll be able to make sense of it and all the parts that go into it. And with that, thank you. I'll pass it back to the crew. Thanks, Linus. That was an amazing talk. It's actually something I've really been interested in for years, and I keep telling myself I'm going to make an attempt at writing a compiler and interpreter and never get around to it. Linus, if you've got a few minutes, I'd love if you come over here and chat with us a little bit. Maybe come take yeah. a seat over next to Aaron. We'll get him to slide over here. Yeah, come love on to. down. So uh, it turns out we're going to have to cancel InkCon, it sounds, and start planning OakCon <laughs> instead. About the domain InkCon, you're, you're out of luck. <laughs> so, yeah, all right. All right. Oh, yeah, additional yeah. body heat. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome yeah, right. to the party. It is chilling this Where were you yeah. for the whole rest of the day? <laughs> oh. <laughs> So um, you mentioned a, a number of books. One of them that I read years ago that I thought was interesting is the Nan to Tetris book. Mm. Uh, have you read that one? That elements. I have not, but I've definitely systems. heard about it a couple times. Yeah. So if you've not seen that book, it's actually uh, I think a series of two Coursera courses, and it starts at kind of like Boolean logic, and builds up that into like building logical gates and NAND gates, and then how you can combine those to get to like an ALU for a processor, and then how do you build an assembler on top of that. And then it gets up into building a compiler, a VM, <laughs> and the book is like this big. <laughs> I kid you not. It's, so it, it's very like abstract. It doesn't go into a lot of the details about like how do you actually implement this mm -hmm. thing. But it does provide like some test suites for, you know, this is what the output of your assembler should be given this input and things like that. So mm -hmm. it's kind of a fun project as well for people to get started. Yeah, definitely. In general, diving deeper into the low-level parts of a computer has been, um, certainly writing a language has helped me get a better understanding of it. And in general, I think one of the, I've developed an appreciation for sort of having that uh, transparency 
into the rest of your computer, like what really is going on when you're writing Go code below the Go compiler itself? Mm -hmm. What's the operating system doing? What's the CPU doing? Um, although that the talk that I just did didn't cover it, as you get more deeper into this programming language world, I think a lot of um, fun is in, in, is in being able to understand what's going on in that lower level. Yeah, that's uh, learning a little bit of hardware was also another one of those eye-opening things. And you're like, wait, what do you mean that it, the the chip can be interrupted in between instructions? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, you realize it's not as pretty as you kind of always assume. You're trained to assume. Yeah, and, and even assumptions we make about time, right? You're like, oh, well, I'm going to sleep for one second. <laughs> like, and when you find out what that really yeah. means, yeah. Right? you're like, well, it could be a second, it could be six days. Like, yeah. Right, it's the minimum. It's a recommendation. Yeah. Um, I think my favorite version of that is uh, synchronization between cores and a multi-core CPU, uh, where really what's happening is that multiple cores are just sending signals, signals to each other in the hopes that like, they get there in time for the other core to get the information in time for the cache coherency to, to work. And like, it mostly works out, but there's no like, physical guarantee that it's going to happen. <laughs> it's just that, you know, statistically, so, so UDP. it'll work. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, yeah. Uh, same thing, like I used to work in video space. Well, I still work in video space behind Learn TV, but uh, working on like video multiplexing and stuff on like linear feeds, um, you actually have to look at CPU ticks. Because you wow. can't really look at time, and because you can slowly like drift, and right. so you end up having to like kind of drop frames and things like that to get back aligned mm -hmm. based on you mm -hmm. woke back up at this interval and you thought one second passed, but right. it was really one point zero one <laughs> seconds, and over a month that becomes yeah, right. right for audio and video, yeah. And then at that point, you're also having to worry about things like the operating system interrupting you because your program might you know other things might be going on like like the CPU is scaling down, or maybe you're getting like a notification and the CPU needs to handle it. And yeah, it could happen anytime. Because yeah, like, at the end of the day, time is just, oh, well, here's the frequency of the CPU. Right. And <laughs> everything is a lot. This many everything. cycles <laughs> has happened. So we yeah. think that's how much time passed. Right, right. Well, so I mean, right there, everything is a lie, right? Oh, yeah. There, I guess <laughs> it doesn't apply to everything. <laughs> this, this computing, the world, uh, yeah. everything's a sham. <laughs> but but you know we're talking about when we say full stack, we're talking about the full stack here, right? So there's a lot of pieces that that you know starting at the bottom of the laptop all the way up to the screen. It's a mm. lot of a lot of stuff to keep in your head. So you know a lot when, of assumptions are made the whole. <laughs> yeah right. right. So so how do you keep that stuff straight? Like when you're building a programming language, and where would you start? That's a good question. I don't think I have a good answer to that, actually. But I think, well, so first of all, um, I think it only, at any given moment, you can, there's only sort of a, a window of window into that tower of abstractions that you can keep in your head. Mm -hmm. So if you're an assembly programmer, you're certainly understanding what's going on at the hardware layer much better. But then you're totally not understanding, for example, like if I send this network packet, where is it going to go? Like that, that's a whole, that's out of your sort of window that you're keeping in your head, right? Or if you're writing out the like, JavaScript layer, you're, it's impossible to think about the assembly that, that, that's being generated. And so um, I think you have that window. And it's, in some senses, I think full stack is more about like, is expanding that window a little bit in both directions. So for example, when I'm working with, when I'm writing Oak programs, the window is extended a little bit into, when I'm writing my program, what is this actually running? What is the actual assembly code that's running on the machine? Uh, what's the Go code that's running to support this program? But I'm not thinking so much beyond it. I'm not thinking so much under it. There is that window. But I, th I do think thinking about growing that thinking about growing that window is helpful. Mm -hmm. So right. one of the one of the sort of uh, the things that we value right we, about Go itself right is the fact that it makes a lot of things um, easy to wrap your head around right. Uh, it, but it took a lot of work right uh, under the hood to to provide sort of this, this uh, these abstractions right that we use as sort of the end users of that of that product right to to be able to sort of uh, um, write the programs you know at, and to to be as readable as they are right. So but. We know that, you know, even based on what we're talking about now, we know that there's so much, uh, you know, effort and, and ugliness, you know, sometimes that, that goes into providing this sort of this nice sort of end user. So you're product. saying they're beautiful on the outside, they're but They're beautiful ugly and on ugly on the inside. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know where I'm going with that, right? So uh, I'm, I'm curious if, if you experienced some of that tension, right, when you were sort of, you know, coming up with Go and says, well, as a user of Go, right, uh, so you, because mm. you're in a unique position of basically being the one who's creating it, and you have to actually use it to actually build stuff in. Right. Uh, what's that pull and tension like for you? Uh, so Go, I think, at least for the parts, the things that I've used to implement Oak, Go has been really great about it. 
Um, I've only touched the beautiful parts, and I haven't dive, had to dive in so deep um, into the more complicated things. But uh, the things that I have looked at, I have looked at how, for example, Go implements the map, its, its own built-in map type, or the Go GC. And for the, for the GC especially, and a little bit for the map as well, there are some, I wouldn't say ugly, but I'd say some details that you have to worry about for the GC people to work. Uh, and, and for things like the GC that have to work concurrently, and for the map that has to be really efficient with the hardware, you have to worry about things like, well, on certain CPUs, caches are this size, they're this big, therefore this data has to fit in this, this area of memory. And for that, we need to like, pack these bytes into this, this shape. And, and digging into that, how other more production grade languages implement it, has peeled back the curtain a little bit. And I have, it's, um, I wouldn't say ugly, but I'd definitely say they're worrying a lot about the details. And so now every Oak program needs essentially needs to include the Go runtime inside right. of it, right? Right. Okay. So that's like one assumption that's that's made, unless you really wanted to go all out and build an right. assembler right. in there. Yeah. And it, there is actually so what, if you look at um, like university courses or other materials and like building a compiler, a lot of them will focus on okay, let's build the runtime from scratch, or like let's build, let's compile all the way down to assembly. And the trade-off that I chose to make is. If you do that, then you're going to spend months and months writing the runtime. And if you want to go from that to like, I want to send an HTTP request, you're going to spend forever mm -hmm. covering all of that space. So I've chosen to sort of build on top of the Go runtime. And that means that I can real, maybe I'm not implementing my own garbage collector, but I am writing a thing that I'm using day to day with it, which to me is a little more satisfying. Yeah, I mean, the, the great thing about that is you also benefit from any advancements to the exactly. runtime. That the exactly. Go team makes. One of my one of my favorite examples of that has been I think with Go 1.17 there was a linker change that made all Go programs like seven percent faster. And I was like, okay, this this really is a vote. Oh, because seven percent faster because it goes seven percent faster. Well, Do you take credit the, for that? The, the Do you put <laughs> this <laughs> release <laughs> we've made Oak seven percent faster? <laughs> exactly. Thanks to the Go contributors. Well, there yeah. you go. Plus with, me. With, with, you were talking about the Windows. You know, like you got that for free, but your window had to get a little bit bigger just mm -hmm. to understand. Eh, okay, well, it is seven percent faster. If I'm going to take credit for this, like I better understand <laughs> you know, what happened and, and why, you know, why they did it, and all that kind of mm -hmm. thing too. Yeah. And so, how would you compare um, building your own language in this way, a compiled language, and stuff, versus uh, how a lot of people predominantly will create like DSLs and things like Ruby because of the kind of the dynamic nature of the, the language? You know, is there an advantage to doing it this way, or is it just another approach because you get to run an efficient runtime? Mm without bringing the like, Ruby interpreter along for the ride? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it's a spectrum. So for example, in Oak, the, um, for the like, object implementation, the map implementation, it's like a, an object in Oak is like a, just a map with string keys for JavaScript. Um, it's just using a Go map under the hood. I could probably write my own type for it. That's something like, might be a little bit more efficient, depending on like, what type of, like, maybe I can benchmark it and find the right use cases. Uh, but I'm leaning on Go. and. That's on the on sort of further down one extreme. The other extreme is I just sort of like make a go with DSL uh, that that it just has a simple syntax for like string key uh, objects. And with things like Ruby DSLs, especially, I think it's a spectrum of like how much do you, are you leaning on your host language, or how much are you defining a world for yourself. And um, I would say defining a world for yourself is maybe a little more fun. But certainly, if you're writing something practical, it's totally possible to to define to especially with more flexible languages like Lisps or Ruby to make a DSL that. Uh, maybe has all the syntax that you want, which is more what the effort, effort is going to at that point. It's like API design, but you don't have to worry so much about implementing a parser or implementing a runtime or things like that. I guess that the other advantage would be just kind of the advantage you get from going to a statically typed language, right? It becomes right. easier to actually compile time check things. Right, you know, right. Static analysis might actually be slightly easier to kind of do on your Go program versus... Exactly. Yeah. So. Yeah. Talk, let's talk about the GIL for a little bit, the global interpreter law. Yes. You said that all of a sudden I had flashbacks. Oh, Ruby, oh, look at this, Python. So the, the, I think in, in your summary, you mentioned that basically using the uh, global interpreter lock meant you, you didn't have to worry about you know, uh, multiple threads, maybe mutating the same variables, and you didn't have to worry about data races and contentions of that nature. That was something deliberate. Uh, that was a deliberate choice on your part. Is it? Is it, is it in your mind, is it something that you're you're eventually going to get to, whereby you want to make it uh, um, thread safe, or is this sort of uh, the, the the design philosophy of Oak is to 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 basically rely on on a gill? It's a good question. Um, I have a lot of thoughts on this. Uh, I think so. Within the Python community, gill has been a hot topic. There's actually recent really interesting work um, to remove the gill from from Python as well. There's like a Google Doc white paper going around. 
Um, if you're interested in it, you should definitely look it up. It's really well written on removing the gill but keeping the performance, basically. Um, there's two parts of the gill um, for, for both Oak and Python, I would say. One is the performance and the technical aspect of it, of like, this was simple to engineer. The other part of it, though, is that having a gill means that there's, like, uh, if you start writing something, that's going to run to completion before the next chunk of work runs, and work can't be interrupted. So if you assume something at the beginning of your, your function running, that thing's going to hold true um, until the end of that function being called, until the task being done, which simplifies the, the way that you think about your program, especially in concurrent programs. And so with Oak, the thing that I think I'll probably keep it, uh, just because Oak doesn't have to, I haven't encountered a case where that's a performance bottleneck yet. Uh, and the benefit that I get from that is that programming in Oak is simpler just for me to think about because I don't have to worry about variables changing out from under me because there's multiple threads of execution running, even though um, maybe I'm losing a little bit of performance mm -hmm. as a consequence of it. My follow-up to that is, is an Oak program still faster than a Ruby or Python program because it is relying on Go? It is not yet because of the interpreter design. So one of the things I mentioned earlier was, was um, Go is fast enough to build an interpreter that can compete with Python. And can is the keyword there. Oak's design is uh, the interpreter that I talked about in the talk is what's called a, a tree walk interpreter. So it builds a syntax tree, and then it walks the syntax tree, evaluating the expressions. And that works. That's sort of the most basic type of interpreter. You can make it simple. It's easy to understand. But if you want to go faster, you have to go down a few more uh, levels, even deeper into that the chain of transformations. You compile down to bytecode, which is what both Ruby and Python do. And I think if you de design efficient bytecode and if you write a good VM for it, a Go, uh, Go VM for a bytecode interpreter for a language can probably compete with Python or Ruby. Mm -hmm. But Oak does not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Any, any plans to build a bytecode interpreter? And oh, yeah. And IR and everything? Yeah, definitely. Um, I've actually experimented with, so uh, Ink, which is the previous language that I built, um, hey. has <laughs> oh <my> come back. <laughs> <laughs> we got it back in the mix. <laughs> it has. I've built a bytecode interpreter it back. for it. <laughs> Ink's coming back. <laughs> coming back. I, I built a bytecode interpreter for it. I used it as the um, the learning project for learning Rust. Just maybe a little bit of a, you know. Hey, that's it was fine. It's coming back. Know, <laughs> see, <laughs> see, now circle. you got to kick two of us out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and but I, you know, design mistakes with a learning project, and I was trying to I think bite off too much at the same time. But I think I'll, it's something I want to bike build writing a bytecode interpreter and a faster interpreter is something I want to do, like, figure out. And so I'll probably try that um, once I feel like Oak is at a good place to try to make it faster. Very cool. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. Nice. So. I think it's about time we wrap up the day. Thanks for joining us here. Thank you for having me. Uh, feel free to hang out while we wrap up the show. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I mean, it's been just uh, a, an amazing day with a bunch of speakers. Oh, one one note I did want to make is uh, CrowdStrike threw out a challenge to ah, yes. the Ooh. whole uh, how terribly can you use generic? At first, I was like side eyeing. I'm like, why are you doing this? Then I was like, okay, that's like, I guess if we if we start identifying all the bad use cases right now, yeah, yeah, we can definitely help out. So, uh, so uh, they've, your they've book. made some promises. <laughs> Whoever has the worst use of generics mm -hmm. gets a free plushie, soaked in sewer, first. and the lifetime promise of never being hired to work at CrowdStrike. <laughs> yeah, so you get a cost benefit. Do you want a plushie <laughs> soaked in sewer water, or <laughs> do you want to drop a CrowdStrike? So that's, that's the trade-off that all our viewers So here's need. the question I want to know. What if it comes from a CrowdStrike employee? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I mean, do uh, they, are they grandfathered into keeping their job, or do they immediately get fired? The edge cases. There you, yeah. 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 There you yeah. go. So that, yeah, this is the, the technicalities. It says never get hired, but they were already hired. So. Yeah, I, I think you just put yourself on the blacklist for a CrowdStrike <laughs> for, for those kind of comments. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, oh, yeah, this is going to be bad. Yeah, yeah. Trash. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, tomorrow morning, we're going to start back at 8 a.m. Pacific. We'll all be here bantering for 10 minutes earlier. Mm -hmm. Take that as you will. Mm -hmm. Please come join us. Mm -hmm. Please come. It's very early. <laughs> we would love to see you. We're going to be cold. We're going to need the company. We're gonna I'll, be, I'll, be thinking, I'll be thinking of San Diego yep. and, and Denver. Oh, yeah. Yep. You know, play all places that are I, warmer I than here. I don't think Denver is warmer. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll bet the Denver I don't know, Convention at this Center point, is. Even the moon might be warmer. <laughs> this place is pretty high. I think they're skiing about this time of year. <laughs> you can get heat at the Convention Center, though. <laughs> you can get heat I'm at the Convention saying, Center. Yeah. Yeah. This is true. <laughs> 
Please, um, peanut gallery, join us tomorrow. <laughs> we would love to see you at 7.50. Warm it up a little. Yeah, warm us up. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I want to take a moment to thank all of our sponsors for making this happen. Again, you know, thanks to um, Salesforce, Capital One, Microsoft for helping us bring this thing online last minute. Thank you to all of our speakers, Linus, um, Mark Bates, and all of the Lightning Talks speakers, which we're going to have plenty more coming up over the next two days. They put a ton of work into that stuff. Thanks so much to the GoTime team and their guests, Linus again. <laughs> I'm just everywhere. Um, thank you, Linus. <laughs> Uh, they're also going to have some co more content coming up tomorrow and Friday. Tomorrow is an AMA with the Go team, and then they're doing the Go for Say Family Feud style. GoTime.fm slash GS. Don't yes. forget. It's time for the troll entry. Stump them. Yeah, yeah. Cargo build. <laughs> <laughs> you got to alias your Go command to cargo. <laughs> that's the ultimate. That's, right that's a good troll. Yeah, right. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, also Peanut Gallery, obviously we've featured many Peanut Gallery commentary <laughs> today that will... If, if you don't know what that us, is, you've joined us through finding us yeah. organically on places yeah. um, on the GopherCon Discord, which you can get to from discord.gophercon.com. Nope. What was that there? We were blocking it. If you join there, there's a channel called Peanut Gallery. All of the hosts were kind of hanging out in there, and that's where some of this commentary yeah. we're picking up. You can heckle us. Heckle us. Give us great Tell ideas. Tell us you know how to do the job better. Yeah. That yep. we're fired. Almost certainly you all do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, we've got, we already have got screenshots of me uh, with like the, my next Halloween costume face. We've got Johnny meditating, so let's round it out. We need the third yeah, MC. There is, there's a screenshot last year somebody got of okay. me popping one of the confetti things in my office, <laughs> wearing like 2020 like <laughs> celebration glasses. I oh trust man. me, it doesn't okay. get worse than that. Uh, Somebody's gonna drop it back in the mine? channel. I'm sure. I bet it can get worse. Have you seen <laughs> mine? Uh, I'm just saying. This is anyway, that should yeah. be your driver's license photo. Yeah, uh, yeah I'll, I'll make sure you never get pulled over. I'm sending photo. it to GSAM here, our global <laughs> security. I want it to be on his badge. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, we'll make that happen. I'll have my badge tomorrow, my new badge. Uh, we, I, I wanted to take a second also to thank the crew. There's a crew of I don't know how many people doing all of the back end stuff, the AV, the scheduling, getting people in and out. Running in here, fixing cameras and mics behind the scenes. Yeah, turning the air conditioning down to, <laughs> to two <laughs> degrees. <laughs> all of them, even you, Keeping whoever turned it down. <laughs> I, really, thank you. I mean, this isn't the last day we're gonna thank you guys. You, 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 yeah, we've got, crew, a lot we've got people editing the videos. There's already a couple of them popping up on YouTube already. So yeah, there's, there's a whole crew helping to make this happen behind the scenes and make us look yeah. good. It's a Herculean yeah. effort and you know, we really appreciate them. We're just the faces that read stuff from the Peanut Gallery channel. Yep. Everyone else does the and, hard and work. Make, and makes silly dad jokes. Uh, yep. <laughs> and then, you yeah. know, also thank you to the entire crew that helps plan GopherCon and this year, year after year had to like replan it. <laughs> so <laughs> planned an in-person conference and then had to replan it all. So, you know, Heather, Jose, Julie, mm -hmm. the whole crew for, for doing all this again. Yeah, yeah. So we planned uh, five conferences in the last two years or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> right. I think that's what it was. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, so when we get back in person, that whole team is owed a lot of hugs. Yes, indeed, hugs. indeed. But yeah, obviously we want to thank you for uh, hanging out with us um, today, watching the talks, you know, jumping into Discord and engaging, meeting new gophers and meeting um, people you didn't even know you had um, common interests. Like there's a mainframe group that just got started. I think, you know, um, Kaylin's about to run a, a meetup group. I'm into that startup. <laughs> <A> mainframe now. <laughs> it's going exactly. places. Who knows? I know, right? Yeah, startups are being created yeah. out of GopherCon. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. It's, it's I, I mean, you think yeah. about it. We're bringing back all of the old all the technologies. Old. We're just, they're getting cool new names. <laughs> so mainframes are coming back, but they just need a new hip name. Right. Go for towers. <laughs> I just came, I don't know. I mean, go for towers. What do you think, Peanut Gallery? Let's see. That's what came to mind. Yeah, it was pretty bad. I, I'll give you that. But yeah. you got to start somewhere. You Mainframes 2.0. <laughs> yeah. Three main, main frame three. Yeah, okay. mainframe three. Yeah, okay. Oh, like yes, indeed. But yes, indeed. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. And we hope you will join us again. What time are they joining us tomorrow? 8 a.m. Pacific. 8 a.m. Pacific. And then also there is Gopher Town. So if you've not been on Gopher Town, 
It's a cool right. little virtual world. You get to wander around. When you bump into people, all your cameras pop up. You can mm -hmm. sit down. You can play games with each other at the little virtual tables. There's sponsors hanging out in there. Uh, so that's a ton of fun if you've not jumped in there. That's another fun way to meet people outside of just looking at the text and the dots while people are typing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I mean, don't don't count out Discord though. This thing is on fire right now. Oh yeah. Now. yeah. I mean, how many channels? Is this fifty plus channels. I mean, channels. people keep asking for channels. Yeah. Not to mention there's a voice channel. I mean, we had requests for like stock trading channels. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there was a high frequency <laughs> trading high or something. Frequency. Futures trading as well. Uh, yeah. They, they yeah. were getting any requests for uh, cryptocurrency channels or something? I don't think, uh, yeah, there, there has not been an NFT channel yet. <laughs> <laughs> but well, now after this statement, after there's, this statement, going, to there's be, going to be an NFT, yeah. channel. NFT yeah. and Web3 channel. Yeah, we should mint your picture. And I, I asked someone, but they said it, they already copied it. It can't be minted or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I, I don't know what You it can't right click on it? <laughs> you can't right click on it, apparently. It's not possible these days in Web3. <laughs> Web3 web has no right click. <laughs> nope. Nope. <laughs> Oh, man. Oh. Uh. All right. Thank you all <laughs> so much. We will see you bright and early tomorrow morning. See you, man.